All right, you're good to go, boys. Are we live, live? Yes. Ah, this is it. This is it. This is the show. It's so nice to have you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah. This is the first time we've done a... No, it's not. Mm. I was going to say it's the first time we've done a video show together. It is not. The Matt Frad Show back in Atlanta <laughs> in that terrible studio you had. Yeah. Nothing but black curtains and sorrow and a lot of coffee and a lot of pee. I think... <laughs> that's right. Do you remember? Halfway through the episode when... <laughs> was it Luke? Is Luke it? is like... Ah! I got to pee. I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> I can't hold this. We all ran. Um, it was good times. But I think that was before COVID lockdowns, mm-hmm. which yeah. propelled online video recordings. Yeah. Don't you think there was yeah. a real... Oh, yeah. And uh, podcast tanked because people listen yeah. to audio podcasts on their commutes more often than not. Oh. And so everyone was like, let's throw all of our money in these audio podcasts, all this stuff. And it's like, nope, just a bunch of people Is get done with right? their Zoom call and they watch uh, YouTube videos. Did did you actually see the numbers or oh, yeah. you just hypothesis? Oh, yeah. No, and also, you know, because I work with Ascension to produce uh, Every Need Shall Bow, that they were like, oh, we can't wait. And then it was like, oh, this did not grow exponentially like we thought. Yeah. Whereas That's their videos did. point. Yeah. Because I still think we get more audio downloads than video downloads. Yep. And that's been that way since like 2006. There's a technology podcast I used to follow. One of the first people doing podcasts. And he was like, yeah, our, we, we spend tens of thousands of dollars to make these videos. And everyone's like, nah, I'll just listen to the audio. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. Which is, I mean, especially for long form. Fair yeah. enough. Who's going to sit down for three hours? And is that your foot or is someone knocking on the door? I don't know. Maybe it was my foot. <laughs> I don't know. This this building is pretty uh, eclectic. Oh, it's terrifying. Everything about this place is fine. I was like so excited <laughs> to see the tin ceiling, and I'm like, oh, this is this is what he's been talking about in all those episodes. I was uh, FaceTiming my mum today, <clears throat> and I put the phone back while I did something. She said, is that a door on your ceiling? No. <laughs> but I guess I can see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, this building is terrifying. <sighs> The bathroom is the most terrifying. I know. I always feel bad when females come on the show and I got to send them there. Yeah. Well, I'm so sorry. Listen, we'll put you on a car. We'll take, <laughs> we'll get an take Uber to the campus. <laughs> well, yeah, it's pretty awful. Pretty awful. So you asked for a, f- a feminine drink. Is that? I did. And, I did. And we, we just got you off. an umbrella. Yeah. I appreciate That's it. That's good. And ice. Yeah. This is good. I like doing podcasts at night. Yeah. For this reason. It's just nice to get to chill. It's a different feeling, you know? But no one knows if it's at night. So you can be doing that at true. six in the morning and still drinking. <laughs> you know? Well, they are live. You know? Oh, yeah. This well played. Is okay. Well, yeah. 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 So. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, good. Cheers. Cheers. I did drink at like 9 30 a.m. during that one live stream. Wow. Is that a brag? <laughs> is that, no, that's no, nice. Just, that's nice. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, this is good. So you're here for a conference. Doing the youth conference thing. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. It's been fun. Have things gotten weirder? Like, I got out of... I stopped... I quit right before COVID lockdowns. Right. I, I, the the youth conferences. Yeah. So it was the perfect time, because I got to seem like better than everyone, because I quit. <laughs> and then they weren't going to hire me back anyway, because everything had to be canceled. But, That's the um, way to do it. I tell you, I, I had to go give a talk at a high school recently on pornography, and I've spoken about this forever, but it just... I don't know. Maybe yeah. I was off my game or maybe it was just a different type of crowd, but I felt like there is a gigantic disconnect between old Matt Fred and these kids. It is incre- I feel like there's an increasing gap between adults and high school students in doing ministry. And I don't care about the age. Like I work with young adults who work with youth and stuff and they'll, <coughs> they'll they everyone is saying the same thing that it is getting Harder and harder to make connections, harder and harder to reach them, harder and harder. If you're not in their friend group, which a youth minister should not be. Uh, <laughs> hey, fellow <laughs> fellow humans, fellow high schoolers. Uh, no, but like it, it's just getting harder and harder to reach them, right? And so uh, what's your approach though? Like how do you feel when you step up in front of these? Yeah, well, I started a Twitch stream. No. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, no, I, what is my – I feel like um, hitting – Areas where um, normal speakers, like a typical, you have to go outside the typical church talk, right? So you have to bring up things that they weren't expecting, right? You have to shock and awe them. It, it's it's like uh, what's her name? Uh, Bishop Baron always quotes it from um, uh, Flannery O'Connor, who yeah, talks yeah, about yeah. like you know, in to a, the ones short, hard of seeing and hearing, you have to draw with big staggering circles and shout. 
That's not what you were going to say. Yeah. But that, that is, a, that is to, something like, from she, her, Why yeah. is her stuff so grotesque? And she's like, in order to get the deaf to hear, you got to use it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So basically what you said, <laughs> we're drawing pictures or shapes. It's very you just get, hey, you kids see my Twitch stream? <laughs> Shock them. Number of, actually, that would be a hilarious video. Yeah. Like a Laura Horn type video where you, you teach other youth speakers how to connect to the youth. <laughs> Dude, Laura Horn. Man. Hilarious. Yeah. She's a gem. She is hysterical, and her episode with you was funny, but her episode making fun of her episode with you was even better. <laughs> it was way better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's hilarious. So I think it was the my comment about stand-up females not being funny, and then someone criticizing me for that yeah. that sparked her podcast career. Oh, said. that's right. That yes. video. Because <laughs> she did a podcast to respond to me or yeah. to, to defend me, but it wasn't very funny, she said, and she didn't like doing it, so she started the skit comedy. Yeah. She's very gifted. Yeah, she's hilarious. Her voice is perfect. How it, I mean, it goes up and down and around and all that stuff. But that episode, uh, so many people were watching the clip where she talks, where she's making fun of you, right? And she's like, uh, which bit? I mean, about there's, there's she's talking about waffles, them. and she's like, well, I don't really talk about waffles ever. How and people good were was like, that? people said like, what? What the heck does that mean? I was like, well, it's called Pints with Aquinas, and he, he, he doesn't really talk about right. Thomas Aquinas that, anymore. That's so, right. Yeah. No. Yeah. She's very good. You know what's really funny about that? No. That whole scenario when it went down, like. A month later, uh, I went to go see Jen Fulweiler in stand-up. Uh, yeah? She came to Houston. A bunch of us went. Was uh, it funny? It was. It was very funny. Okay. It really was. <laughs> I actually thought, you know, going into it, I thought that it was going to be. Would you say it wasn't? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say if it wasn't. Would I, I would. I, <laughs> I'm going to speak my truth. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, it was so funny because I'm watching all this and seeing all this stuff go down. And I was like, well, we do have tickets in a month. And I, that conversation was just living in the back of my head the we whole do time. Have tickets in a month? To go see her live. Uh, we, we, our friends of ours had bought them in, a, in an yeah. event and whatever. But yeah, it was my first time at a comedy club. And it was awesome. It was I, awesome. I've been thinking, not to get too deep too quick, but I've been thinking lately about Catholic infighting. Yeah, because I was just in Lourdes and I bumped into Taylor Marshall. Did you know right, this? you saw the the photo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was lovely. Like it was a lovely interaction. And I thought to myself, Did you tossle his hair or anything? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't get the joke to play along with it, but okay. no. Um, Seemed like a fun thing to do. <laughs> hey there, Tiger! <laughs> Slapped him on the behind. Nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, but I thought, like, if the internet didn't exist and I knew about him because I read a book of his or something, we might go out for coffee or a beer yeah. and we might chat. And he might say a few things. I'd be like, hmm, I don't know if I'd phrase it that way. Like, I don't, yeah. that feels. Right. And he might say the same to me. But we'd both give each other the benefit of the doubt, as you do in human yeah. interaction. But, and likewise, if I was sitting with Jennifer for a while and I said to her, I don't find female stand up comics funny. Like, I think women can be funny. I just, I don't know if it's like their lack of like stage authority presence, maybe that's just me. That's mm. how I feel. I'm open to being wrong. She might be like a little put out, but I don't think she'd be like offended. Mm. And likewise, the times I might find myself offended by people saying things publicly. What is it though, when we're in isolation, saying things into megaphones yeah. that causes this division among us, do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's something about the internet that begs and, and, and an audience that begs you for hot takes. In ways that, I mean, like, so I got off Twitter because I, I honestly felt like I was going to go to hell. I felt like I was mortal sinning against atheists on Twitter because I wanted to be more snarky for my team than I cared about them. And when these things just start compounding, like, I mean, you have uh, an, an audience, you have people that are cheering you on. Right. People love That's that. Right. I mean, who doesn't love a good takedown? Yeah. Right. Like, uh. You know, the, the, the books uh, critiques of atheists and stuff, especially like the new atheists, when, when they just use ad hominem yeah. against them, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, like when Ed Fazer wrote that book against atheists, like it was incredibly snarky. Oh, he said it? that Dawkins wouldn't know the difference between metaphysics and metamucil. <laughs> <laughs> and we were all like, so, yes! <laughs> but there, there's something about it. And the, the internet connectedness, I think, is what causes us. Because like I can watch you almost in in, in real time detract against me, humiliate me, attack me. And then what, what am I going to do Just sit there? No, I'm going to, it's an amplifying effect. Right? So my big thing with, with the internet, right. Is take a breath. I need to take a breath. I, I get criticisms all the time. Well, mostly just on catching foxes, but, uh, we get these criticisms. And I remember the first time I got like a really personal, mean Catholic criticism. 
and I read through it, and it was a guy just blasting us for banter. <laughs> you know, like everything that we do for banter, <laughs> for our, uh, you know, goofy sense of humor, you know, very stupid. And then for uh, the occasional cuss word and just like ripped us a new one. And I, I didn't, I honestly didn't know how to handle it in, at that time. And I just wrote him an email in the kind of imitating the president and CEO of Southwest. And I just said, uh, sorry to lose you as a listener. And that's it. And then he wrote back like a five page email <laughs> cussing me out. And oh, I was like, no, he did not. Oh, he yeah. cussed oh, you out yeah. after complaining oh, yeah. you, that you, you cussed? You POS for not taking my criticism seriously. And I just, and, I, and so then I replied and I just sent him a list of podcasts that are not us. <laughs> and I was like, these, these meet your criteria. I don't need to be what you want. Uh huh. I don't know how to deal. I don't know. It's a parasocial. You've heard the phrase parasocial. Yeah. Heat first introduced me to it. Yeah. Did you did you listen to that uh, podcast from uh, Miss Ruby? Mrs. Ruby. So Mrs. she's a Twitch streamer. Amazing uh-huh. Catholic. Good egg fun. She's incredible. She cooks on on Twitch. Awesome person. We've had her on the show a couple times. Uh, and she um, had a basically a stalker. And so she made a podcast that's kind of like the 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 old serial podcast where it's like uh, a little like crime, you know, okay. whatever you can, true crime style. I yeah. mean, so she did it so well, but it was about this guy and all the stuff that he would do for her, but with a creep level of like 10. Right. And she calls it, you know, talks about a parasocial relationship where it's like, I know you, I've known you for years. Yeah. But. You know, I don't know everyone out there. And so when we when I meet people, it's like they already know me. Yes. But I don't know them. And so they and there's a weirdness there. And, and we usually yeah. laugh about it because my fans are yeah, laughable, funny people. But there can be that element of like, hey, I own a piece of you. Yeah. Because we're friends, you know, and they some people don't know how to turn that off. Yeah. And then there's the pressure on your end yeah. <clears throat> of knowing, OK, this person's going to get he's going to know me in real life for 10 seconds. Yeah. And if I'm off. Then the story he's going to tell everyone is Gormley is like a jerk and Gormley's life. a jerk, yeah. Which is why I, even when I was a young kid, I remember my auntie met a famous cricket player and she said how he was a real jerk. And even as a young kid, I thought yeah. maybe he just was Had having a bad, a bad day, day yeah. or like, or well, maybe you were weird. Yeah. Like, why does it have to be his fault? You, you know? did smell his hair. <laughs> <laughs> you did tussle it a little, a little, a little tussling. Yeah, I, I remember at a uh, when me and you and Luke were at Seek, right? And then you were like, I, I'm such an introvert. I can't stand to be at this table anymore. So you left and we were passing out all your pints of Aquinas <laughs> stickers because we're like, yes, more attention, please. Yeah, y'all You're not here for us. Yeah. I was one of the fans who he walked was. up have a looking photo for of Matt him. and met you guys. Oh, you must have been so disappointed. <laughs> no, it was fun. You remember uh, marching around Seek with a giant flag in Indianapolis? Yes. That was us. Oh, Do blessings. you really remember it? Yeah, that's incredible. We had a flag I and Luke judging your, your uh, intentions. Like, <laughs> what have you really said? It wasn't funny, though. <laughs> Did you really remember? It's it's okay. I, I have that face time. that looks like I'm fake. Yeah, no, Luke I get went it. running down Mission Way with the giant flag. Mm. That was me and my buddies. <laughs> That was you and your buddies running down. That's actually how I got him to work for me. He doesn't actually don't even pay him. He was a stalker, (laughs) right? Nice. It was really. If you really want a piece of Matt, come at my show. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's awesome. No, but I mean, yeah. What what more about like Catholic, you know, infighting? It's because it felt like because you and I are old enough and ugly Mm. enough that we we remember a day when podcast didn't exist. Mm. And Benedict or John Paul II was at the helm. And it yeah. felt like we were all on a team. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Didn't it? Yeah. I mean, when you read uh, read Cardinal McCarrick, a lot of his public writings, a lot of them were toeing the line of JP2ism, right? A lot of it, you know, the communion stuff, the personalism stuff. Not mm-hmm. all of it, obviously. Not the the one, uh, whatever, accords or whatever agreement that he signed, um, Land O'Lakes agreement. But there's a lot of stuff in there that, that like, a lot of people realize, like, oh, this is the new guy. We got to toe the line with the new guy. And uh. we got to present this face. But now it's like, well, we know every minute of every day of what they're doing and thinking. And, you know, uh, over at the pillar, they tracked a the cell phone and all the different places that it went that were untoward. And you could find out all this stuff. It's crazy. Like the level of connection and access. So is the point you're making that the the, uh, the Internet is largely responsible for the fracturing? Among uh, I mean, not uh, well, humans are original sin is largely responsible for it. But I mean, just think about the level of access like we know, like the Pope tweets. OK, I mean, probably not him. But also, we know everything that is going on. We have reporters who are doing around the clock coverage. Yeah. We have a level of access That's that we definitely otherwise part of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like just think if you were a German Catholic in the 1500s, <laughs> mm-hmm. 
I mean, what, what did you know about the Pope's daily life? Yeah. You know, what statues some group brought that came to pray? <laughs> like, you have no idea, and you probably don't care. Mm-hmm. And you probably didn't even know what your bishop was up to or the priest in the parish next door. You knew what your priest was doing. but So without yeah. giving this much thought, I would say we've got th- three reasons for the, for the Catholic, <laughs> Catholic infighting. You're right? so systematic. One, yeah, Thomas. <laughs> Number one. See, I do talk about Thomas, yeah. Laura. One is, as you say, like we know everything yeah. immediately. Unprecedented it's access. so unhelpful. Yeah. Uh, two would be having a very unclear, I'm saying that as charitably as I can, Pope. Mm. Like very unclear. A lot of us feel like, where's the guidance in these yeah. social, moral issues that we don't feel like we have guidance on? And then third, it was like, we all have a megaphone now. Yeah. Like, I'm talking about you and me. I'm talking about, like, little people who spoke, like us. Like, not McCarrick or whatever, but, like, we spoke on platforms at high schools, at these public events. Yeah. But now we all have these gigantic megaphones that are reaching hundreds of thousands of people. So I would say those three things together... Maybe a, either bringing out differences we didn't know that mm. we had, or maybe we realize there's time for a shift in how we evangelize or what we put our emphasis on that's shifting. Yeah. We can, you know, we can stop talking about this if it's not interesting. Well, well no, I was just thinking, like, it, it is funny with the power of this medium, which is why this medium needs to be respected, right? There needs to be more discipline, more discernment in this medium. because, mm-hmm. Or or if there's going to be less <laughs> less deliberation <laughs> before you get on the microphone, your audience needs to be the type that receives it that way. I like, so. oh, this is yeah. just a, a casual yes, conversation. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we didn't prepare anything. No. You, you literally told me not to prepare and not to preach. Yes. Uh, to make it cash, totes cash. <laughs> but, like, think about this. Like, if, if we, because we have audience. Like, so I'm about to do this youth conference with thousands of kids. Every week I produce a podcast. I produce two podcasts that have more download, more listeners in that one week that it's released than three of these conferences. You know, your listeners, how many subscribers you got? Where's your countdown clock? You call yourself a YouTuber? You <laughs> Is need that to have a clock. Oh, yeah. Is it really? 62. How much? 362. Thousand. No, no 300. just 362. <laughs> 362 <laughs> so people. <laughs> oh, man. I. Why am I wasting my time? Uh, <laughs> I gotta go. I need an audience. Uh, yeah. yeah, but like, I mean, just think about that. Like, and then how that affects our brain. Yeah, right. How that affects our self of like, I get to speak into these issues, and it's like you don't have any yeah. maturity, Gormley. What are you doing speaking yeah. into these issues? Yeah. But there also is a reason why certain people bubble to the top. Okay. That they can navigate these things. Right. How many people do you know could sit down in front of a microphone? Because this is performance. <clears throat> as much as we pretend yeah. like it's not, and as much as we're drawing on our friendship and stuff, but this is still performance. How many people do you know could do what you do? I don't know very many. Oh, I think everybody could do this. You say that, but to He's be wrong. funny, to keep it on target. The, I, I remember the I early you, days yeah. of the Matt Frad show where you were like, I kept interrupting. Oh, I, I felt it, that was. <laughs> we can talk about our, our, those moments. Like you just mentioned that, mm-hmm. that email you got, you didn't know how yeah. to handle. We should definitely talk about some of those because yeah. these are real. They and, are. And pretending that nothing affects you yeah. is so unhelpful to everybody else. And yeah. it's a lie. Yeah. But yeah, when I had Christopher West on my show and I interview, I interrupted him, maybe like I'm doing now, I don't know, like every four sentences. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I got torched. And rightly so. Like, I listened back to him. Like, but it is funny because Christopher painful. West, though, as I interrupt you, Christopher, <laughs> and that's now going to be a thing the whole time. Uh, he is, at, you had called me beforehand and you said, what do I need to know? I'm going to interview Christopher West. What do I need to know? And I was like, he'll get into his mode where he just goes into goes. full lecture. Yeah. So you need to make sure you're interrupting him. And, and, yeah, and that, he did. So, yeah. So I think people of his age bracket who maybe we used to speaking on EWTN and Catholic yeah. Answers Live, yeah. they had the perfect answer for the particular question. Yeah. Like, what's your thoughts on, what do you say yeah. when the Protestant says this about contraception? And they've got like their eight and a <laughs> half minute yeah. perfectly worded response, right? Yeah. And then more than that, he does courses where he has honed his craft so well that he can right. speak very convincingly, articulately on a particular topic. But I think- what this has allowed us, this format has allowed us, is just to talk casually. Yeah. But I don't think a lot of people were ready for that, including Christopher, I think, at the time. Yeah. Which is why I, you know, in fairness to me, that is what I was trying to do. I was trying to break him out of yeah. these excellent points he had to just chat. Come on, but man. It, but instead, just be Chris. But I should have just said that <laughs> yeah. instead of trying to derail it in the yeah. moment. So. Well, it's so hard because, you know, here's the other thing that just happened to me this morning. Uh, or was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. I started going back and forth in this conversation with one of my favorite listeners, and uh, she knows who she is. And uh, she was critiquing something that I had said in the previous episode. And one of the things that really sucks about 
casual conversations is you say the thing you're thinking of, but you're not thinking a complete thought, mm-hmm. right? So there, there's a thousand things I wish wish I would have said, and I'm sure like you've talked about that in your mm-hmm. follow up to uh, the Ben Shapiro episode where you didn't look at him on a screen, <laughs> uh, but the <laughs> but like there, right? You run through the things like ah, oh, and then so or you don't even think about it. You're like that was great. I said my truth. I said some controversial thing. I put it out there. I felt like I defended it, and someone's like, but you left out all of this stuff, and now I hate everything about you. <laughs> and that's not what this person said, but they were like, so there's all there's like a. A Discord server <laughs> post, and I'm like, did I really? Did I? I just it, like you say incomplete thoughts, right? And there's no. It's not that there's no because this, this person I'm talking about is awesome, but there, for a lot of people, like that's the a lot of the angry emails is, yeah, well, well, actually, and you're yeah. like, ah, oh, okay. There's no grace given. There's yeah. no quarter given. It's all slaughter all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just had Kim Zemba on the show the other day. Who so is so beautiful. Good. <laughs> I still wish we had a had a football throwing competition because even though she <laughs> thinks she could beat me i'm pretty sure i could beat her <laughs> accuracy or or length like strength or well accuracy? definitely definitely length but strength if i didn't beat her i'd blame it on being australian and then i'd mm. say a kicking competition yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway my point was there was a photo of the two of us say you know holding up the image which we will never talk about uh because we'll t- talk about that after and someone's like i cannot believe she is wearing jeans how immodest that kind of thing and i'm like Forest for the trees. This, for is, the this trees. is to your point yeah. about, but but she, this beautiful woman just had the courage to share how she was in this homosexual lifestyle and and how she loves our Lord and yeah, but her jeans. <laughs> the, you know what? When I find that, like, so on catching foxes, occasionally a cuss word will slip, and that is. What do you mean occasionally? Have you toned it down since I last listened? Uh, I, I'll be honest, I have listened to a couple of episodes lately, and I'm really glad I've gotten back into y'all, because it's an excellent podcast, by the way. Catchingfoxes.fm. Ooh, nailed it. Yeah. Um, we, we, t- I, we toned it down. We've toned it down-ish uh, at times. So I used to bleep out, because I think bleeped out cuss words can be funnier <laughs> than cuss words, right? So, But there's this <clears throat> element of um, that is like... How dare you? And I think for a certain sense, well, number one, scripture obviously condemns in, in the book of Sirach, like abusive language. St. Paul talks about your speech should be edifying. Mm-hmm. Like I get all of that. The problem is when we move that to like, you know, just right under like abortion for mortal sins for, for Christians or Catholics or whatever, like people are super sensitive to certain things and it set, I mean, it really is triggering. It sets them off and it's like, dude, in the grand scheme of things, this is the, one of the least important things. But for certain people, it's like, no, it's the, uh, it's like a canary in the coal mine. You're actually rotten. And this is why you have foul speech out of your mouth comes all sorts of evil. Mm. I'm like, okay, I get that argument and it hurts a little. Yeah. It hurts a little, but, uh, I, I, I find in, it in weird. Fa- in yeah. fairness to you and Luke, what you were trying to do was to say, what if we just had conversations yeah. without trying to impress people without yeah. being overly prepared? What if we just did that? Yeah. And I think that's why your podcast is so refreshing, at least for people like me, where it's like, I don't find it offensive, but if even if someone found it offensive, they can at least appreciate they're talking yeah. the way they would talk. Yeah, the goal of Catching Foxes from the beginning was we're not here to tell people what to think, as in, like, because I love Catholic Answers. I think you were, yeah, you you had left Catholic Answers by this point, but I love that that content. I own many of their books, consumed all the stuff. At the same time, it's a style of show. Right, it's just like you said. Like, wh- I'm a Protestant. Wh- what should I think about Mary? And then they give this beautiful answer that I write down, and then I repeat at church, and everyone thinks I'm a genius. <laughs> but then you have this element where it's like, yeah, but I'm just an ordinary Catholic. Most young adult Catholics do not live anywhere near community of other young adults mm. who care. They go to mass, and they're with 50, 60, 70 year olds, and there, there's a profound experience of alone. The, one of the most common things that we get when we ask our people, like, why do you listen to us? They say, you feel like this is the kind of friends, conversations I have with my friends back home or back when I was in college or before I moved away. And Luke's idea of kind of like how he framed it, and Luke very much is the the origin of it all, is these are the conversations people have that are like the conference speakers when the conference is over. Okay. Like you're just sitting around, you're chit chatting, yes. maybe you got a drink, and we used to have you're drinks. You're trying to work out ideas. Yeah, you're thinking things through. And yeah. so for us, the push was always this is discussion over instruction. <clears throat> yep. Which was Luke's tagline that I think is brilliant. It is. Yeah. And I definitely 
snap into the instruction mode more than Luke does because Luke very much is an intuitive grasper, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, hey, you know, what about this? Or something doesn't sit right there. And meanwhile, I'm the guy who's like, okay, he said that line and I'll quietly pull out a book and I'll be like, yes, I remember that. Okay, Frank Sheet said this. So I'll start doing that. But that yeah. that's the thing is like, and I think podcasts, especially long form stuff like this, gives us the freedom to think things through together. Mm. So, but if your audience is expecting didacticism as opposed to discussion, yeah. they're going to get ticked off. I just uh, made a joke the other day. I did a, re- a review of something Brett Cooper had to say about pornography. I yeah. joked that it's now my responsibility to respond to every Daily yeah. Wire employee <laughs> who misspeaks on pornography to correct them and pontificate. Mm-hmm. But one of the points I made in that video is we. Sh- I don't think it's charitable to pretend that in the context of a long-form discussion, what somebody has to say on a given topic must be their crystallized, finished opinion on that topic. Yeah. But so often we do that, especially in response videos. Oh, she said this. Notice she used this word, mm. not that word. And yeah, yeah. And then, and especially if you have an agenda, or you come with a hurt, and you've been hurt by the content, you can single things out and mm-hmm. disorder. The other thing I, I was thinking about on the plane as I was flying out here, I'm reading this wonderful book by Robert Hugh Benson called The Friendship of Christ. And I'm going through that book, another one of the Anglican converts, uh, going through the book, and the guy has such a systematic way of viewing a personal relationship with Christ in a deeply Catholic way, wrote it 120 years ago, whatever. And as I'm going through that, I thought this guy's mind, obviously he's writing a book. He's not giving a talk, but like, I can't systematize it the way he did. And I started thinking, do I really have a coherent thought? Like, like if someone were to come up to me a year from now and say, Hey, what do you think about this topic that I just talked about on catching foxes? Would it even be remotely the same as what, Mm. like, these are, we're such becoming, right? We are not, we're not done, but even more so, I feel like I just, lately especially, I'm just more scattered. Mm. You know, I don't have coherent frameworks wherein, I'm not Thomas starting from first principles and perfectly working it out or or darn near. Yeah, yeah, our epistemology is less like skyscrapers one thought logically preceding a different one. Yeah. It's more just like scattered rubble, a few bricks over <laughs> here, you know? That's that's how I scattered think. rubble. Mm. Yeah. That describes my backyard. Uh, I mean right that's now. that's <laughs> oh yeah. Well that that that's me anyway. Yeah. I, I don't want to put that on anybody else. Certainly not people like Trent Horn. Oh my god. Jimmy Aiken. Yeah. How do they do it, Jimmy Aiken? What is it? Well, there are two schools of thought. Uh, and you're like what Actually, the? two point five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Aliens. Yeah. Did you see his debate with that Australian fella on Sola Scriptura? I did not. I did not. First of all, I just want to give the Australian fella, I forget his name, the other Paul, I think his name is, complete props. I mean, he was, it's no shame on him, but he brought a spoon to a knife fight. I mean. Oh, really? You can't go up against Jimmy Aiken. (laughs) Where was it? Cameron Batuzzi. Okay, Cameron's thing. Okay. Yeah. But it's just the way Jimmy thinks, he's so... But what's interesting is when you just like he called me the other day and we just we were just chatting for the sake of chatting. Yeah. But he speaks so simply, like mm-hmm. you know, and and almost almost like you wonder if he's dumbing everything down for you. <laughs> maybe, maybe he is. But yeah, yeah. But do you find as you're getting older, is is that are you uh, noticing worse? It's so much worse. Uh, you know, the the funny thing is the lifestyle of sitting in a chair and drinking Dr. Pepper and screwing around on the computer has <laughs> turns out it catches up with you. <laughs> turns out turns out Luke always talks about like when you're in your twenties, you could go out party like you don't leave the house till nine o'clock at night. Totally. You party. We used to shut down <laughs> when we would go out to bars, we would shut down every bar we would ever go to. The mousetrap maybe? You oh that? gosh! Yeah. <laughs> I've never been there, but I want to go. Oh, so bad. Every, there's a place. There's there's a true, true Ohio Valley place called Cross Creek Tavern. Okay, that owned my soul. I remember I had an ancient Greek test. One test in ancient Greek language was going to be uh, a a six credit hour grade because it was a summer immersive class, and. I went out drinking the night before, closed the bar down. I just, you know what? And you woke up and you took the test. Uh, The crazy thing about that is like 20s, early 30s, yeah. And then when you're in your late 30s, something shifts. Like you no longer have a left knee and a right knee or a good knee. You have a good knee and a bad knee, not a left knee and a right knee. And like weird things start happening. And I just, it's like. I'm in too many places with my mind. I'm thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about my wife. I'm thinking about my my three jobs. I'm thinking about the next episode. Who are we going to get to be interviewed on Catching Foxes? What's going to happen? You know, you're thinking about 10 million. But you're 20s. What are you thinking about? 
Where are you going to go drink that night? <laughs> like, that's what you're thinking about. Yeah. What, what do you think about Thursday? I am now that you mentioned Can it. Can you throw me the about, matches while you, you're thinking about what you think about? I am now thinking about if I want to go drink tonight now that you mentioned it. I wasn't <laughs> considering it before, but now I'm thinking it could be nice to go drink tonight. <laughs> is, do you feel morally obliged to drink on Thursdays since your name is Thursday? No, there is a meme in the Discord, though, where every Thursday... Everyone sends me a message that says "Happy Birthday." <laughs> That's awesome. I respect that. With a little little picture of uh, Chesterton's book. No, the boy not, who is that's Thursday. not. They they took. You remember the frog that was? It's Wednesday, my dudes. No. Uh, it's an old Zoomer meme. Anyway, there's a frog, and it was captioned it's an Wednesday. An old my Zoomer dudes. meme. Those are contradictory. That's a contradictory sentence. Um, it said uh, the frog said it's Wednesday, my dude. They photoshopped my face onto it. Nice. And so now I get sent that by like ten people. Like, internet <laughs> humor is the best humor. Me Stuff like that. Memes. Memes are the are best. why the internet it, exists. Yeah. Thank God. Memes are great. Um Yeah, I, I think it was a Babylon B article that said after thirty it's backaches and dieting until death, basically. <laughs> That's me. That's me. The old carnivore diet. Back <laughs> again. Are you? For how long have you been doing it again? So I started in January. January 1st, new year, new me. Really? Me and my wife did it together. It was awesome. Dropped 30 pounds in in uh, three months. Mm -hmm. Then Easter hit, and I said, you know what? We're going to celebrate. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna live it up. We're gonna celebrate the resurrection. Fifty days of drunken no, uh, <laughs> just kidding. But uh, no, I I eased it up a little bit, and then uh, this is the thing. Like you you know how you talk about you can be a moderator or you can be an abstainer, mm. right? You're either yeah, I gotta get rid of it completely. Yeah. I can't just do a little. Moderation is difficult for me. Yeah, uh, I'm either all in in the debauchery camp <laughs> or the fasting. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you can't just do one line of coke. Mm -hmm. uh, but like the idea in your head is, no, I mean, I can I can do this. It's fine. I've been living this very restrictive diet. You know, getting this stuff out, feel great. I can have tonight at the Easter. So the the church I go to, church of the Presentation of the Lord Catholic Church in the Ordinariate, um, after the three and a half hour vigil mass for the Easter vigil, you go out and then you have a four hour long party, mm. right? And all the families stay and I closed down. I was the last one to leave at 530 in the morning. It was awesome. Wow. Best day of my life. But you have this experience it's like, oh, yeah. But, but like with me, obviously, food is is an issue, right? So there's this emotional attachment that I didn't even know. Like I never think about like I'm an emotional eater. Like I am totally. I had no idea I was. And yeah. I, I started gaining it back. And now I'm. I don't know. I see. I, this is going to sound like I'm being patronizing. I don't like that you say that about yourself because you're actually just a big guy. Like, yeah, but the bigness your, is Your fat. weight on me <laughs> yeah. would look terrible. Yeah. But you're, you, it's like the line from Jim Gaffigan. We all have that friend who lost a lot of weight, and you're like, you look better fat. <laughs> I mean, you're thin, but you look exhausted. It's like you're that. Your sunken eyes and your <laughs> yeah, saggy right. skin. Yeah, I, I, no, man, I truly, truly, like, am the levels of self-knowledge, every phase of life, you have to have a new level of self-knowledge, right? We change so much. And I just feel like I'm at this place where I'm like, what? How, how did I get away with this? Like these weird patterns of thought that just existed in the back of my head. And I just took advantage of it, I guess, because youth allows you, you know, you have more energy, you're doing more stuff. But like forever, my job, right? You're sitting at a desk, you're doing this stuff. I come home, I'm with the kids, I'm sitting down at dinner, trying to do the things, family prayer, I'm sitting down. And I look at my step count, and it's like, oh, I hit 4,000 steps today. <laughs> yeah. I've walked a little bit more than a corpse. Uh, so maybe like weekend of Bernie's. But uh, yeah, like it, it's awful. So just trying to be intentional about this so stuff. So you fell off the wagon pretty I hard fell off the at wagon. Easter, and then have you gotten back on oh, it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the last month and a half, I've been rededicating and working out every day. So I work out twice a day, and yeah. I'm terrible. But Dude, me too. You, you, I, you just realize like strength of body equals strength of mind. Right. Like, so it doesn't matter where you are that going from a zero to anything is exponential and you reap the rewards going from a five to a six doesn't feel that big a leap. But going from a one, zero to a one, you feel like, ha, huh. I got a feeling right. Like the young boys like uh, Thursday over there, yeah. like he's got to be watching the 
the like people like Andrew Tate probably talking about working out or whatever else. No, you please work don't. Out. Please don't say I watch Andrew Tate. But this episode, Only on Fridays. this episode, yeah. is going to be so inspiring to all our forty-year-old males <laughs> yeah. out there because we're just going to listen. Anything's better than nothing, you know that. <laughs> but, you know that time when you get out of a chair but you can't, <laughs> like you intend to, but it's just there, and you're doing that thing where your feet are kicking, and you're like a tortoise on a shell. So, but let me <laughs> let, let me kind of share with you what I've been doing lately. There's not at all impressive jazzercise uh, yes in the nude no, no. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. uh, wow um no but it was when, when i wake up that's my best time of the day mm. i'm totally sharp till about 10 45 a.m mm. and then i'm done no so when do you wake up i tend to wake up at about some time just before seven okay naturally naturally okay i wake up i do a few particular prayers put on the sneakers no, yeah, I have a sauna. I'm blessed enough. I have a sauna in the backyard. Turn the sauna on, and then I go and I run, but it's nothing. It's three It's three laps of a block. That's okay. it. It's nothing at all, but it's something. It's something. And it's, it's not nothing, <laughs> right? And so I come back. I'll, yeah. I'll have a little prayer in the sauna, have a shower. and then What do you pray in a sauna? I pray the Jesus prayer. Okay. Yeah. You're so Eastern. Yeah. You are so, you're reading an Orthodox prayer. <laughs> like, what is going on? But that's that's it. I mean, we can yeah. wrap that up. But just like it's, it's small things are yeah. uh, better than no things. Well, the small things add up, right? I mean, our Lord said that, right? You can be faithful in small things. You'll be faithful in great things, right? We always think, and this is a line that you get from the military. You always think you'll rise to the occasion, but you don't. You fall to the level of your training, right? That's the phrase they say. That's why you got to train so hard. And when you think about it from that perspective, in the terms of your bodily health that you've neglected, right? If you neglect your body bodily health, we all think, okay, I'm walking down the street in Steubenville, nothing but violence. You're terrified all the time. So <laughs> and you, then all of a sudden you see people you building a, a timber structure. You can speak like that because you used to live here. <laughs> Other people can't speak like that, but oh we'll let gosh, you do it. Oh my so yeah. terrifying. <laughs> I dated a girl who on one side of the house was one of the biggest drug mules <laughs> <laughs> biggest drug mules in like the tri-state area. Used to go up to Chicago, fill his minivan with drugs and drive to New York. And then on the other side, violent home. That, and then two doors down from that was another drug dealer. And wow. you're like, oh, and then three doors down from that, Scott Hahn's house. Right? <laughs> like they're all, it's all just there. But anyway, the, uh, like you think you're walking down the street, someone's going to come and assault you. Like, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? You're like, well, I'm going to beat him up. And it's like, no, you're not. An 18 year old boy is going to make a fool out of you. Right? So, the dedication of, of physical exercise. There's a Catholic father, can't remember his name, wrote a book called The Intellectual Life. And part of it, yeah. uh, almost the entire career of... Uh, it's excellent. Oh, it's do you remember his name? It, it's it, phenomenal. Uh, Thursday, look it up. I've read yeah. it a couple times. A little red book. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, he talks about the use of... He has these letters <laughs> that he writes back to some people. And part of it is like, yeah, you need to have physical, physical health, physical exercise. You need to do that for the life of the mind. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm so I wake up in the morning. First thing, if I don't do it first thing in the morning, it becomes yeah, what, very difficult. What do you do? What are you I, I, I get into zone two walking. Okay, zone what's, what's two that? cardio. It's like, so there's like four zones. And if you go too fast, <laughs> right, your heart's like pounding. You can't speak. What is it? Sartain Lodge. That's it. Yeah, I can't say his name. Frenchie McFrencherson. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, but like the idea is like just a little bit more than regular pace. You got to elevate your heart rate. You got to be sweating, but not so that you can't finish a conversation. If someone walked up and said, how you doing? You could say a couple sentences without like huffing and puffing, right? Yeah. That's zone two. And that's actually a super efficient for your life and your cardio health. And if you stay doing stuff like that, you're like, I've already seen it in my Apple watch, right? The, the keeper of all data. Uh, it's, it's like, Hey, you're improving the last six weeks in your peak resting heart health and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, okay, let's do that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's 115 degrees in Houston right now. Wow. And me and my wife, we go for a walk right before noon and afternoon. And That's I'm like, nice. I just want the heat. I just, I want it. I want the difficult thing. Yeah. So I do the, you, you, you said one time in your podcast, uh, wake up in the morning, fall on your knees and say, grab a crucifix. Something. Say Jesus Christ. What is the phrase? Jesus Christ, son of God. Have mercy on me. A have sinner, mercy on me. A sinner. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, I think there's going the to be some initial yeah. giving of the day to the Lord. Yeah. You wake up, you've got all these murky thoughts clamoring for your attention. Right? <laughs> what that, that did I just nothing. dream? <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> exactly. But then as soon as you grasp onto reality, mm -hmm. you just got to do something. So like yep. get on your knees, 
put your head to the ground, say something. And it's you've never felt less holy or pious at a time like that because you're exhausted and yeah. you're in your pajamas or maybe you <laughs> sleep in the nude or whatever. No, I wear this really cute onesie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, which also is what I wear when I do jazzercise. <laughs> That's the last part of my fitness thing. A lot of jazzercise. Gonna get into weight training. You ever heard of rucking? You ever gone no. rucking? You know what rucking is? You what I love about you is when you get into something, I kind of obsess. You over end up it. knowing more about it than the guy who wrote the book on it. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, it's it's funny. <laughs> that is funny. Uh, but the rucking, the idea of like putting a rucksack on your back and going, you know, military marching with okay. your heavy weighted bag. Well, they actually found out that, especially for people trying to lose weight, if you weight down a bag and then go for a walk the weight that you're carrying elevates your heart rate does all this stuff <laughs> causes so, spine damage yeah. we didn't know that till now. <laughs> we did scientists <laughs> had no clue uh in the 50s they said it was good for your spine um no no but i actually am interested yeah. in what you said so you weigh down the backpack yeah you put they, they come up with little plates and you put the plates in your backpack you strap it on you gotta have a good rucksack because Otherwise, like you're wearing a jam sport, it's like yeah, my sciatica, <laughs> which is a thing you have to worry about when you're in your forties. But yeah, you just you you just go and you do the walk, and they have different metrics and stuff like that, which I don't really know about. But uh, have go. You been, have you been doing this? Uh, I, I no, but I've bought one on Amazon. <laughs> It'll be at my house on Monday. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I just I love walking. I love being out and just gone as long as I can. You know, when I wake up at, I usually get up around five forty-five. I go down. I say my mm. Jesus prayer. I go downstairs. Uh, typically, my wife, she'll get up at six, so I get the coffee going. Perfect day, right? I sit down, and I open up the Gospels, and I read the Gospels. Right now, I'm obsessed with um, trying to understand, trying to observe. Right? We always want to interpret. We always want to like get to the not, but it, it, Scott on said this mm. when I was in Doctor Scott on. I call him Scott. Um, he <laughs> said Scotty in bum. <laughs> he said in class one time. Uh, mm. We always want to skip the middle step and go right to interpretation, but the f uh, the the step that we skip is observation. And Ooh. Frank Sheed mm -hmm. is a master in his book to know Christ Jesus and what difference does Jesus make? The two books, uh, master of observation. Like Jesus invited this disciple at this time, and then these three feasts were mentioned, and now it's this time. So that's about six months later, and you're like, huh. The time frame that he's drawing from that probably if you were living as a Jew in the first century or a Gentile in the first century, you would have picked up on that like, oh, yeah, I, I'm aware of the time frame. But he draws these things out so much more in depth. And so I have a, a, a journal. I read the Gospels and I just write what I observe. Right. It's my prayer. It's my morning focus on the on the word of the uh, word of the Lord and mm. just the Gospels. Nothing else. And nobody got time for that. Just because I want to know Jesus. Right. And so I just sit there and I write. And the funniest thing is it used to be one day, I would, you know, chapter one of Luke, I'm, I write stuff. But then I would be lost in the Magnificat or the Canticle of Zechariah. And I'm just writing and writing. And I look at my watch and it's an hour and a half. I'm like, I, I've only did I've only done like 14 verses or 10 verses. And so that's what it's become now for me. My morning prayer. I actually have to set a timer to stop meditating on the scriptures and observing the scriptures because I just get lost. And I'm like, oh, what? Oh, look, like, like Luke chapter four. He starts off, the report of him went throughout town, and he went through all the synagogues preaching and teaching in their synagogue. Then it's the rejection at the synagogue at Nazareth. Then it's the miracle with Simon Peter, like uh, with his mother-in-law, and then healing. But when you sit back and you start observing it, you're like, he goes to Simon's mother-in-law's house, or Simon's house, and, and heals his mother-in-law. She starts working. Then the town is coming to him because the report spread. Mm. They show up at night, and he heals. He lays hands on every sick person. And every demonically possessed person. And then the next verse is, and at dawn, when the sun rose, Jesus went off into a lonely place. And you're like, this guy healed Simon's mother-in-law, preached at the synagogue, goes to the, his mother-in-law's, uh, Simon's house. I keep saying mother-in-law. Uh, goes, to, goes to Simon's house, does this, and then it's just do, all day long, and then doesn't go to bed, goes to prayer. And then, then he leaves to go and preach in the uh, Judean synagogues. And it's like... I never noticed that. I never noticed all the times that the report of him went throughout the country or in the surrounding region or whatever. And you realize like, oh, well, that's why there were literally thousands of people in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 12, where he had to get on a little boat and push out from the sea in order to talk to all the people. Because he'd been doing this for weeks and weeks, and everyone knew, right? And he's staying there. He's doing this hands-on, literally hands-on ministry um, so long. And it's, 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 these details I totally miss, right? Because I'm looking for the proof text. I'm like, ha ha, take that Protestants, you know, ha ha, take that, you know, whatever. And I, 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 we're losing Christ. You know what I mean? 
We're losing when we're not paying attention to all these details. Mm. So every morning, my wife listens to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not jealous, but a little jealous, Father Mike Schmidt's Catechism in a Year. She sits there with the catechism open. She does woman. the full thing. And then I sit there with the Bible, and then we wrap up. One of us goes for a walk. One of us deals with the kids, mm. have our cup of coffee, talk about the day. Yeah. What, what What about when you read the Bible and you find that you're looking for that nice little cutesy verse that makes you feel a certain way? Because I mm-hmm. think that's also sometimes yeah. what we do. I don't mean to kind of diminish that sentimentality or yeah. meeting God on the on the heart level at all. But so on one side, you've got looking for that particular proof text, as you say. But is it what you're talking about with observation? Is that also different to like finding that inspirational verse that you try to connect to your life too quickly? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally different because okay. I'm I'm hunting for <clears throat> connections, right? I'm trying to see things like, oh, why why do you say this here? You know, and it's not study. I don't want to bring in other books. I, I can mm. study at a different time. In the morning, I'm just there to observe Christ because I want to get in my head, like me and you. Okay, so I've known you before you were married. I know I've known your wife for years when she was a youth minister and and hanging out at St. Simon and Jude and all that stuff. I have a certain image of you and I have a certain image of her and I have a certain image of you too mm-hmm. because of our interactions mm-hmm. that no one who only knows you online has, right? That's right. And you know, the fact that I took over y'all's apartment, we, your newlywed I, apartment. I want to talk about that at some point because <laughs> I, I need this documented in a video. We'll get to that. So yeah. funny. So funny. But like I have a certain image of you, right? And this is what Frank Sheet talks about in To Know Christ Jesus is like too often we have an image of great preachers and great teachers, their image of Christ. Yeah. And we aren't sitting down doing the wrestling with the text at all. Yeah. So we, it's like, like you can have these friends and if you only know a person through other people, you have only their image of it. Oof. Right. And so I want that image of Christ for me. And that's been, that's been a thing I've talked about forever. Like it, uh, every time I form Protestants who want to become Catholic at this program at St. Anthony's called uh, inclusion, it was RCIA, but just for well-formed Protestants who wanted to become Catholics. It was largely apologetics, the issues that we disagreed when disagreed with, and I focused all of that within the context of the Paschal Mystery. We all d- agree that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important thing. Here's why the it, it feeds into the papacy, the sacraments, Mary, all that stuff. But the thing I tell them to do is, okay, it's day one. If you don't have a consistent prayer life, open the Gospel of Mark, chapter one, and read. And then when you finish Mark, read two chapters a day. When you finish it, go back and start it all over again. And it's like you're reading a new book, even though you just started two weeks ago. It's a new book. Like the gospels are so rich. There's so much there. And so getting people mm. in, getting people back into like, who is Jesus? Why? <laughs> like, well, the a great line. We think of Jesus uh, gentle and meek of heart, right? Not a single Pharisee would say that about Jesus. Mm. Not a single Tax collector, maybe the tax collectors, maybe the prostitutes, but the majority of people, Pontius Pilate, he wouldn't say that, right? Simon Peter, he probably wouldn't say that, right? <laughs> Judas wouldn't say that. Gentle, meek, and humble of heart, but we get that from the music and the hymns and the the, the Renaissance painters, who you know, the call of Levi, like, yeah. hey, Levi, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't bother to put my finger all the way out and point at you, right? So uh, that's the image. That's what I do with the Gospels. That's all I want is I just want to get a sense of the man. Right, because he's my savior. Mm. Right. <laughs> and he loves Cubans. Sometimes the people. <clears throat> sometimes I will pick up the Gospels and I'll think to myself, you, "What you are now reading, Matt, is a lost Gospel that was just found today, and it's world-breaking news. And it turns out it was written by the Apostle Andrew, whoever." And then I try to read it as if it's brand new. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, I have the these, Chesterton like, approach, right? I don't know. Go is to it? your kingdom, you know, visit the country as if it's your first time, right? Okay. The Englishman yeah. who sets yeah. sail yes, and comes right. back. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. You but, are the man who was Thursday. That's but, fine. Th- but thank you for saying that. I think we, we, did, we yeah. desperately need to hear that. And I like, so what advice would you have for someone who wants to get back into Bible reading or just wants to start reading the Gospels but is so afraid? Yeah. That what's going to happen is they're going to pick it up and be so bored, yeah, and then just feel bad about feeling bored, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. people don't like feeling bad, and so and shamed, <laughs> so we stop doing those things that make us feel like that. Yeah, it's like exercising when you keep failing. Yeah, You're like I just don't like that experience, so I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I think that's how many people feel about the Bible. What advice do you have for people to get back into reading the Gospels? So I, I will say this: it's different for me 
because I have a theology degree, I fell in love with my faith because of first apologetics, but then because of Scott Hahn's lectures. I mean, my parents used to buy his audio cassette tapes when I was a kid, and I would listen to them. All, I would they would get a uh, an eight hour series, and I'd listen to it twice before the day would end. Yeah. And so I come to it with some sort of knowledge, kind of already mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. So when I start to see these connections, I'm like, oh, because in the first century, blah blah blah, in in mosaic auth, you know, blah blah. So that's the difficulty for me because my heart beats quicker when I read these things. So I would say for a noob, right, is number one, you gotta be okay with looking ridiculous. It's like right? jujitsu. <laughs> yes, it's anytime you do something new that's meaningful, yeah. you're gonna look like a jackass. Yeah, right. Uh, me jogging. <laughs> There's a reason why I jog when I do the jogging part at six o'clock in the morning before the sun rises. I'm like, oh, so many things are jiggling, and I don't want any of my neighbors being like, well, there he goes. <laughs> We got a new pothole on the street. These are the things I tell myself. But and this is a, this is a point of of anyone who wants to be virtuous or do something worth time, worth your time is you have to be willing to look silly because you're a noob, you're a rookie, mm. you're gonna be stupid, you're gonna be silly. It's gonna be difficult, and the difficulty might be the difficulty might actually be it's boring, right? That's a difficulty. Just think of boring as a difficulty. I like. That. Okay, so here's the obstacle. Now I'm going to go full uh, full stoic on you, right? The obstacle is the way, right? Maybe it's boring because 500 things in your life are all competing for your attention, and they're all fun, right? Every time you go to the bathroom, you're playing Angry Birds, right? Even pooping now is an exciting <laughs> competitive sport. Like, it's exciting, right? Uh, <laughs> so when you think it, and you're like, okay, well, now I'm going to get quiet, and I'm going to sit here with a 2,000-year-old text, <laughs> And a journal as a dude, and I'm gonna write, right? Like yeah, as a dude. As a dude. I do not I've tried to journal. Everyone tells you journaling is great. Uh I even tried to do one sentence journaling. Could not. Could not do that. So be patient with yourself. So don't be afraid to look silly. Be patient with yourself, right? And if you find well, really it's it's the attitude of like, come Holy Spirit, these are your words. I need you to set them on fire in my heart. Mm. Um, th- there are too many people who have conversion experiences for me to negate this, and myself included. But when they fell in love with Christ and received his love in return, uh, Scripture was that thing that fed them. It, it's not for everyone. right? I mean, scripture is for everyone, but that experience is not for every, every convert. But it's like all of a sudden the Bible came alive. right? My buddy, Father Paul Koska, I remember high school student, huge conversion on a retreat. And then like, maybe a year or two later, we heard someone read, it was a second reading of from Philippians, right? God did not deem equality with God as something we grasp, rather he emptied himself. When we got to life night, we were in life teen, when we got to life night, he had that whole thing memorized. And he said, I don't, this is just happening to me. I just, these words stick in my head and I can't get rid of them. Mm. Right, so the Lord can work on this. These are anointed words though. Like mm. we all know the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's not just clever writing about God. And so the the most important thing, and this is the stoic thing that infuriates everyone, but isn't that show me one thing in life worth doing that, that doesn't mm-hmm. have this. If my desires are not in union with this thing, but I can acknowledge mentally that this thing is good for me, then I just have to shut up and do it. And eventually my desires will come along. Mm. The other kind of hack, I'm going to be lame, is if you want to make it more prayerful, shorten the time. Mm. And, and by shorten, I mean maybe 15 minutes at the least. Say... How do these words, how do these deeds tell me about the love of the Father through through Christ of me, for me, mm. right? And then all of a sudden, every time he's reproaching a Pharisee, you're like, okay, well, how does this show the love for me? Well, it shows the love for me because this Pharisee is distorting the truth or whatever it is. And you're like, oh, okay, because he calls falsehood, falsehood and he does that for me, right? So constantly going back to the text, that's mm. a, 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 constantly. So you can get your image of Jesus. I love it. Yeah. I think it was Jose Maria Escriva who said something to the effect of, let people say of you, here is a man who is familiar with the Gospels. Like, Or mm. he said that's what he wants people in Opus Dei to be thought of, men yeah. who know the Gospels. How long have you been getting up at what time? 5.45. What? Every morning. Listen, brother. Ice bath. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, brother. I wake up at 4.30, took a picture of my watch, and I, no. Uh, what were you going to say? 
What? Take a picture of your watch. What a you picture say? of my watch. Yeah. That's what Jocko Willink does. Oh, the, what does he do? I don't oh, know. I've oh, never he's a to former guy. Navy SEAL, and yeah, every morning, yeah, it, if you Pusha follow his him. Instagram, it's nothing but. He doesn't well, hate him. He loves it. It's because he's a militant. No, he but loves him. Yeah. It's nothing or but. He, does, uh, he doesn't. Whatever. I'm not going to speak to you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you can it, make a comment we later. We can talk about it if you want. It's nothing around but his like 4:30 wake up times, right? Like he send that to a friend or something. No, he puts it on Instagram. Like go wake up, get after it. You know, I think he wakes up at four because he takes a picture of his watch at four thirty with, and the mm-hmm. caption always always aftermath with his workout. What does that mean? Aftermath with his yeah, workout? like like he's like takes a picture after he's worked out and he always just captions it aftermath. <laughs> so I think he wakes up at four and oh, works out and there takes a picture of his watch. He oh. calls it aftermath. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but okay. the uh, so I've been I'm a night person. Are you? My I'm 100% a nice person. I yeah. am, I'm not at all. A lot of new youth ministers get into the groove of like, well, you know, we have this event, a football game till 10. Like our lives get into the rhythm of it's more evenings than it is mornings. And so I'm, that was definitely my thing. Um, when I was living with Brian and Jonathan, other youth ministers, I was dating my now wife. She was a youth minister. Uh, we all were night owls, right? I was, my whole marriage never went to bed, very rarely went to bed with my wife. She had to take progesterone, knocks you out, um, and so she'd be going to bed at like eight, and I'm like, that ain't happening for me. I got some YouTube to watch, but uh, so uh, one Lent, there was a Lent thing, Mm -hmm. and it just, it was like, okay, let's try to wake up early for Lent. That'll be my penance, and that was a penance, and about two weeks into it, I got really pissed off one morning. Because there wasn't any coffee, and I became a coffee drinker at that time. Mm. Wasn't any coffee in the house, and I was wide awake, and I was pissed because I realized I'm actually a morning person. I just never, I'm lazy. I just never wanted to wake <laughs> up early. My whole life pushed me into the late at you know one o'clock. I get my second wind and blah blah blah. So I started doing this, and honestly, I love it. I feel weird when I sleep in. I feel like oh crap, the day's gone. But do you still go to bed late? No. What when do you go to bed? Uh, well, 10, 11. Yeah, that's, that's, not, still that's not late. No. <laughs> when do you go to bed? I end up going to bed around 10 or 11 as well, but it's really out of a uh, sacrifice because my wife is a night owl. Yeah. You know, and when well, I say night owl, but I mean, she'd go to bed around that time as well. I find it really difficult to go to bed without Cammy. you know, like I, I like to, I, I like chatting with her. Like I, I like that yeah. time laying in bed, chatting and hanging you out. You are both, you're, you're an introvert. Mm-hmm. Is she an introvert? Not at N- not all. Not at all. Shannon's an introvert okay. and I'm an extrovert, but we are both, this is the way I, I armchair uh, psychologize us. We're both external processors. Like mm. we love talking yes, through things. I do too. And, My wife's like that. Yeah. And so I think it's the best thing for like, people are like, you need to learn about spousal communication. We're like, we got it. <laughs> we talk about everything all the time. The difference between my wife and I is I know what's going. I sense what's going on within me the yeah. millisecond it happens. <laughs> like emotions in my heart. I'm like, what the hell was that? You know, fear. Oh, 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 constantly. It's exhausting being yeah. me. My wife, in order for her to understand what's taking place in her heart, she needs to talk. Yeah. Sometimes she'll be talking and then she'll start suddenly realize she's sad or she's excited. She doesn't know that. She gets in go doer mode, you know, she gets stuff done. And- yeah. But we're both, I love to process things with her. Yeah. yeah. My thing, because I'm so ADHD and I drop the ball all the time on things, she's super organized. So one day I was teaching this class, a 98-year-old or 89-year-old man goes, hey, Mike, can I ask you a question? And I was like, yeah, sure. And he goes, uh, is your wife very organized? And I go, oh, yeah, man, my wife. Oh, I can tell you stories about my wife. My wife <laughs> literally makes lists about lists <laughs> she's going to make in the future. And he starts laughing, you know, whatever. And I go, why do you ask? And he goes, because I've sent you the same damn email three times, and you just asked me for the fourth time. And I figured this guy would be dead if it wasn't for some <laughs> woman keeping him alive. And I was like, It's well. funny you say that, because my wife and I are both terribly disorganized. <laughs> no. Oh, met, I know. <laughs> if you met my wife and chatted with her, you'd assume she's got everything. She's, she's okay. She's got things together. Yeah. She, neither of us do. <laughs> what do you mean, I know? Well, I know that you both are like that. Yeah, how right? do you, but how do you know that? Well, number one, you've said it a million times mm. uh, where you talk about how you, <laughs> you get like, what, what was the phrase? If if she had married anyone oh, else, that. she would be the free spirit. But yeah. because she's married to me, she has to be the nerd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but fails at being the nerd. Yeah. yeah. And I see that with you too. And yeah. I think that's awesome. 
Right. I think that's awesome. And it takes all kinds, right? And this is a funny thing that you realize, especially like with your family, if you really care about your family, you really care about this stuff, is you you with your decisions, whether it's implicit or explicit, reshape your life. You mold your life to accommodate that stuff. Right? Like you do. Like you you figure out like for us we homeschool. My wife does the homeschooling. I'm the heavy. Right, she sits there and she does the heavy, she, the, heavy the, the 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 disciplinary. Okay, right? yeah, yeah. She goes through and she organizes. I mean, man, she, she's got grades, she's got lists, she's got curricula out the wazoo, all mapped and planned. I would never do that. I would yeah. never in a million years do that. But when I come in, I get lost in the subject with my kids. All my kids hate being with daddy as the teacher because it, Shannon does the we're going to hit the curriculum we're going to do what it says and I'm like you know what's interesting about this and then they'll be like stop dad stop dad or if oh. they they get, like there was like a math problem that one of my daughters was struggling with and so I went on Khan Academy set up an account I'm like you're going to watch this and we watch it and I said you know what no 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 this isn't enough we're going to back it up three lessons and we're going to watch the next three as uh-huh. well as the one lesson in the middle like that's the stuff that I do uh, I I love getting lost in concepts you're a good and dead to do that with your kids yeah, they hate it, but yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it's all about me at the end of the day. I, I want to. You said something about your wife that made yeah. me realize my wife's definitely more organized than me. Mm. Definitely, but that's not saying much. Does she do the doom piles like you do? Do you do doom piles? What is you that? Know what mean? It, it's an ADHD term where you like your way of organizing is stacking things vertically, right? Like you got like eight books over here stacked yeah. up high. You got a bunch of paper. You know roughly what's in those papers in those stacks. Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is 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 organized. <laughs> you, you know, I'm not joking. My wife has. I'm not my joking. Wa- okay, I don't so know my what wife, the of, like, what would it be? Like those pull out drawers. <laughs> yes, with the... yeah. My wife was so excited to get an IKEA drawer <laughs> that has a filing cabinet. You go That's to my awesome, fi- Saint Anthony's. I was the well, director. You know what? My, my filing years. cabinet. What? You might be. be oh, you might be go. saying this. The metal filing cabinet with a key. Uh-huh. You open mine up. It's stuff stacked on top of each other. That's funny you say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They call them doom piles. Okay. Doom piles. Yeah, and it's funny because at, at St. Anthony's, they had this thing until you interrupted me. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. But they had this. Uh, I, I had this wonderful desk, wonderful furniture. I'm a director. I have 13 people reporting to me. I have employees. Um, it had and. Uh, <laughs> I had nothing in my in my filing cabinet drawers. I had like oh. crap that I just threw in there. I had all the uh, s- like days off things that the director had to sign. I had all those stacked. And then it was like, here's a thing on how to use Microsoft Office. And I was like, I guess wow. I'll put that here. I have such respect Never. for people like that. I, I can't. So when I I'm, can't. when I started working at Catholic Answers, Jason Everett was still working at Catholic Answers, but he had what moved. a brain. Who he Jason? Has. Unreal. Unreal. And I'm about to give you an example of that. He just moved to Arizona, I think, or no, Denver. And so I move into his office. He actually bought me that uh, photo of Mary McKillop and he put it on the wall for me as a gift, which was so kind of him. But he had a big filing cabinet and I opened it up and it's all alphabetized. Things like, you know, abortion, contraception, all of these topics that he would talk about and um, photocopied articles from magazines and newspapers, yeah. all systematized. Yeah. He's terrific. Let me tell you a funny story about Jason Everett. Do it. Okay. So I used to crap on him, right? Not because I thought anything he ever said was bad or I disagree with it. I'm like, he's a canned speaker, blah, blah, blah. One day I was talking to someone and I was like, you know, I just, I I try to speak from the, you know, extemporaneously and yeah, I do my research and I map out my talks, but I just don't want to give a canned talk like, like someone like Jason Everett. And I said that to Sarah Swafford and she's like, you do know that we are like best friends with the Everett family. And I was like, oh, uh-huh. what? No, what I was saying when I was like backpedaling <laughs> as fast as possible. But I have been following him. I mean, I've always loved him. And yeah. he came to my, but I, I used to, I have an allergy against can talks. Always have. Yeah. But when you realize that his talks, every one of them is surgically precise. Yes. Like that's a level of giftedness I will never have. That's right. And the fact that if you like that, that drawer that you're describing you see it when you actually listen to the Q and A's that people have for him. Yeah, you realize like he has a comprehensive knowledge, and I think it was one he was on your show or uh, uh, John DeRosa's um, Classical Theism podcast, which is awesome. Uh, he was talking about the transgenderism, and he was talking about like, well, so I started reading these books, and then I kind of got an understanding. Then I read twenty more, mm-hmm. and now I felt like, and you're just sitting there like, oh, and yeah. you. 
You probably have notes where it's system. I like that's the, awesome. The effort he put into his one chastity talk took mm-hmm. way more effort than the eight hundred extemporaneous talks I've given. Yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. he is, and that's uh, the thing that I think people like me who are like ah skipping through the woods. You know, I speak from the heart. You know, that's the thing that it's like. No, he speaks from the heart, a heart that is cultivated. Yeah, a heart that is trained. Right. Yeah. This is a, this is a well trained man. But um, how? I mean, like, as you get older, too, I think I'm starting to realize that there are certain things about my personality Mm -hmm. that I just have to come to peace with. Do you know? Like, maybe in my 20s, I may have been under the illusion that I could be like Trent Horn or Jason Everett. And you try. and, And sometimes I don't know if it is because of a lack of willpower. Or if it is, it's because you've been made differently, yeah. and you've got to come to kind of come to peace with who you are and just be that as well as you can. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, Doctor. That doesn't uh, mean no longer being challenged by people right, like that. But. Right. You know, Doctor Abigail Favalli. Yeah, right? love, love her. her. She's incredible. <laughs> she really is. She is. Yeah. Everything she writes, a genesis of gender. She has this wonderful chapter where she talks about. Um, a bunch of women who were segregated in swimming in the Dead Sea or swimming in the Sea of Galilee because it was an Orthodox Jewish thing. And it's like, no, women and children are over here, men are over there. And at first she said a lot of her college students were ticked off. But then after a while they were like, actually, we don't need to care about men Mm. looking at our bodies and thinking about like, you know, whatever, we could just be. Mm. And she she had this line where she was talking about Maybe it was like the YMCA. It was all, I think it was on the, the same chapter. But you see the old woman who's trying to keep her body together and everything's all saggy and whatever. And these young women who come in and they love, they're doing three classes a day. And she said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but like life, a, a big project of our lives is coming to grips and acceptance with our bodies, with ourselves. And that's very true. Like I, I read these people. And I want to be disciplined like that guy is disciplined. Ah. And I want to be smart like that guy is smart. And I want to have knowledge of scripture like that guy has knowledge. And I want my memory. Like, I don't know if you feel this way, but my buddy Brian has this recall ability that just shocks me. Scott Hahn is like that. He's a human bibliography. He just, I remember one time he was going to a talk at Franciscan. I was a student, I was attending. I go, hey, do you have any books that I could read that contradict the documentary theory? Do you know what that is? The documentary theory? The JEDP, uh, the different authors of Genesis, uh, 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 Pentateuch. And he's like, well, yes, uh, there is the blah, blah, blah from blah, blah. That was a little Regis Martin. But uh, (laughs) he so he goes through these things. And I mean, he's naming publishers and dates. Yeah. And I remember writing it down and I kind of just stopped writing. And I was like, this is a mind. That is no way to perform like mine, but his mind is nothing like mine, which he's probably benefited from. But I wonder who needs my kind of mind, mm. who needs your mind. And uh, Casey Neistat is a big YouTuber. He had this whole ADHD thing where he talked about it's it's not really don't think of it just as a deficit because it can be a superpower. It, it can actually benefit, right? It can actually be a bonus, and it, we can bring it into different... It, it leads us into different modes of approaching the world. And no one will ever think the way Matt Frad does, mm. right? The, your your experience with, uh, number one, Australia, and uh, your conversion story, and mm-hmm. you know, World Youth Day and all that, coming to America, which is also an Eddie Murphy movie, uh, <laughs> doing net <laughs> in Ireland. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know when you left the United States and I took over your apartment with my buddy. Let's yeah. do it. <laughs> AD, see, that's an ADHD superpower. <laughs> you thought it was a callback. It was just that I remembered. <laughs> All right, so this is great. I'm trying to remember when's the first time we met. First time we met, you were. I don't know if you were engaged. You were at a, a, a parish as a youth minister. Okay. And I think it was any Hickman. Had invited a handful of us because we're all in the same household at Franciscan households, AMDG, and uh, invited us down. And we like met you. And I've known Cameron, a lot of the St. Thomas More families Mm -hmm. down in Houston. In in Houston, there's this, there's a handful of churches that are just legendary in the life team world, in the Franciscan world. And St. Anthony's Mild Parish was, and and St. Thomas More was the, the original gangster. So I think I met you there. I think my first memory of you is. trying to think of that shopping mall you were sitting outside with a couple of guys and me and cameron came and spoke to you because we were moving to ireland and we desperately needed somebody to take over our apartment so we didn't have to yeah it was with john and john and brian yeah Yeah. jonathan and brian all right yeah but no we had known each other before that we were just we weren't like we had known of each other let me put it that way all right yeah 
Yeah, that was fun. So that's amazing. This is yeah. amazing. I love this. See, this part of the conversation is for nobody else but us. <laughs> nobody Para else cares social. about this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but yeah, that's great. You took over our apartment, right? Yeah, so you had this shady apartment. It was very shady. The best part was the apartment complex right next door had a pic. <laughs> its logo was a <laughs> mafia looking guy with a baseball bat. No. Yes, it was a guy. Where it was like a silhouette of a dude that looked like he walked out of uh, Reservoir dogs and he had a baseball bat it was like the blah 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 apartments like th that logo has nothing to do with that name i think it's just to intimidate the residents but yeah we're in a jewish part of houston that's right in a uh, uh, hispanic part of, of the jewish part of houston and the best part about your apartment do you remember what the best part was oh can you give me a hint uh air conditioning that's the hint. I don't I don't know. You did not pay for utilities. Oh. It was included in the rent. So when I found that out, so you were leaving and you needed someone to come on board. So I came on board. I, I so <laughs> so there's like a week where I technically lived with you at least on paper, you and uh, your newlywed. Right. Yep. And then you moved off off the lease and, and then my you buddies get moved all of on. Our stuff like a couch. You or? left 90% of your of your life. Did you want that? No. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what I didn't want. All your newlywed presents. Like, all the stuff you got as gifts for wedding. I was like, why do they have curved cups? I just yes. want a regular cup. But I walked up to that thermostat. I'll never forget. This is the greatest day of my life. Walked up to that thermostat, and I turned it all the way to the coldest setting, and then I turned the thing all the way to the hottest, and it never turned off. Took my pants off and <laughs> laid on the couch. Houston, man, you need it. Oh. We That's froze amazing. the coils so many times that summer. <laughs> I remember, you remember um, Courtney Barter? Yes. And, and, Jer we were, and yeah, Jer Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah, we were very good friends with them. Oh my gosh, I love them so much. They came over to our house one night <laughs> and we hung out till about four in the morning. Speaking about when you're in your 20s, you know, we're yeah. just hanging out, playing board games. And my wife was bragging about how I make really good coffees. So I'm like, I'll, I'll make us one, you know? So I made us go in. This is when frothing milk was like a new thing. Mm. Like now everyone can froth mm. milk with whatever machine they have. But back then it took some work. So I made this beautiful coffee with froth milk. And then I put what I thought was cinnamon over the top. <laughs> Turned out it was chili powder. <laughs> the, the literal worst thing. But I yeah. didn't, I didn't oh, know that. Fine. So I had given it to her and she had drunk it and just was trying to be nice <laughs> until she was like, I'm so sorry. I think maybe... This is a chili <laughs> powder, so that was good. Oh, that's awesome. Froth milk is a game changer. Yeah. So I never I never liked coffee. My dad was a coffee drinker. I never liked the smell, never liked any of it. My wife loves coffee. One day she said to <laughs> Just me- Just so you know, real quick. Yeah. The guy who's going to pull who has to timestamp this video- is going to hate us. No. We just went from newlywed apartment, yeah. thermostat, yeah. Hey, Paul, chili coffee to, to, froth, to, to froth coffee. <laughs> okay, let, let, froth I'll coffee is a game changer. Hold, hold, cross your fingers so you remember what it is. That's a trick. Um, Paul, for this segment, That's the just trick. title it, Paul Hates Matt and Comer. <laughs> for this like Love five it, minutes. Yeah. Love it, Paul. But no, uh, uh, froth coffee uh, potentially saved a soul. Saved a soul. So I never liked coffee. My wife loves coffee. She said to me one morning, this is what started my early morning wake up. She said, you know, I just always imagined us waking up and having a cup of coffee together and talking about our day before you went off to work. You're like, what's wrong with me with my Zevia? <laughs> <laughs> so many things. Uh, so, uh, no. So I, I was like, okay, I will. It was like 50% creamer at that time. Well, uh, a, about a year ago, my wife bought a frother. Mm. And I thought, this is the most frou-frou, I don't need this, I'm a man. Turns out I need it. Turns out I need it <laughs> desperately. So I go, so now I only have froth milk in my coffee. It's, it's, it's a little awesome. But uh, I'm at an event in Peoria. Wonderful church, wonderful people. I'm doing a parish mission. And I'm at this hotel. And I walk up to this lady and I said, how long is this open? She said, oh, a few more minutes. I said, I need a coffee. I need to sit down and go through this stuff. Um, I just want a tall coffee. I go, do you by any chance froth the milk? And she looked at me and she, she's staring at the screen. She goes, I don't even see it on here. I don't know. And a guy hears me and he goes, no, no, no. I got I'll froth the milk for you. So he froths the milk, pours it in my coffee. I'm drinking it, having a good time, chit-chatting with them very lightly. I leave. I come back later that afternoon. Guy runs up to me. He goes, hey, hey do you want me to open up the store for you? And I was like, what? And he said, yeah, you want me to open up the store for you? And I was like, uh, I mean, I guess I'll have a coffee. And he goes, yeah, 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 don't worry. We all learned how to froth coffee for you. I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, man, you're just... 
you're just such a good guest that we're all that we all learned how to froth coffee. If, if that, and I'm sitting there, and I, I'm, I'm, it was the most surreal experience of my life. And he's like, so he goes, he makes me this large coffee, he sets it down, froths it perfectly, right? And and I'm just trying to figure out the narrative of what's going on. I have no clue. I'm about to go to the evening session. I'm there. The woman shows up from the morning, and she's telling me that her mother has cancer. She had to move her mother into a hotel room so she could take care of her round the clock and all this stuff, even while she's on shift. One of the most heartrending stories. And so I was like, okay, well, thank you so much. And so I go and I get the, the the parish to pray for this woman and her mother. And I was like, before we begin, I had the craziest. <laughs> then I show up that night and the night shift is like, do you want a coffee? We, we can froth the <laughs> Like over the top. And I'm like, what? Am I being pranked? What is that? It felt so surreal. It felt like I was being, like there's a camera somewhere. When I was leaving in the morning, I had to leave at 5 a.m., you know, go to the airport. And the the the, the guy at the counter was like, hey, we're going to miss you, Mr. Gormley. Have a good day. I To this day, I have no idea what I said or did. My interactions were pretty minimal. There was one part that kind of sucked, and I was nice to the guy because he obviously needed a break. And that was it. But the, the whole time, all I could think of was I have prayed for this parish in, in Peoria Heights more than any other parish mission. And the men that invited me out, I was at That Man Is You group, they invited me out. They were praying a lot. Mm-hmm. And there was this weird, like, when I got to the hotel, I felt like there was just a blanket of peace. I, had, I did nothing to earn their respect to that level but mm. it was weird like it was all characterized by frothed milk as like a sign of their thanksgiving to me and i'm like i mean i'll take it because i can't drink coffee regardless but what is happening it was this this is how i know like it's things like that that's like god just gives you a little confirmation like you wow. know i'm here the spirit's moving let's go you know it's- that weird. It's a, that That's is weird. very weird. It's yeah. cool though. I didn't have a conversation with someone where I'm like, share your heart. Yeah. yeah there was none of that. Yeah. It, it's amazing how some, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I'm in a good mood and I want to, hey, like yeah. I actually say hi. Yeah. And I actually see the person and I mean it. Yeah. And that really does mean the world. Yeah. But when I'm like looking down at the floor and I'm just kind of irritated and then I wonder why everybody's so distant. <laughs> why don't people like me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So is yeah. that when you liked coffee with when you yeah. realized you liked coffee? Yeah, this is just like four months ago. This whole froth milk thing. The story with the people? Yeah. Four months ago. Yeah, it was when I decided to leave. I don't know. It was probably a topic you want to talk about, but it was when I decided to leave my church job. I was discerning, you know, 17 years I've been in parish ministry. Done all the traveling, speaking stuff as a side thing. Yeah, and I was discerning leaving, and when I was there with the with, in Peoria Heights, Peoria area, um, this guy's like, "I think you need to leave. If you're thinking about leaving, I think you need to leave uh, because I think the church wider needs your needs your message." And I'm like, "Okay, yeah, maybe." And who said this? This is the guy, the the good old George that brought me out from the parish. That man is you group, all this stuff. I had done some videos for that man is you in 2020 when when the plague hit. It's funny. Dr. Scott Hahn, Dr. Mark Miravalli, Dr. John Bergsma, and a fat homeless guy we found walking with a rucksack. <laughs> One day on Amazon. No. And so I get these like, <laughs> That's a callback again. Power of ADHD. No. Uh, and so we just said, I, I did these talks. They asked me back. They asked me back. So I've done it three years in a row. And these guys were like, we love your talks. Will you come and do a parish mission? I was like, sure, okay, whatever. And he, well, I mean, like, I was happy to do whatever, it. Whatever, psycho. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> no, and so it was just this, it was just a weird anointed thing. So I'm just trying to discern the date of when to leave. And they're like, do you understand what Peoria is known for? I was like, uh, no. It's like Fulton Sheen. Froth and I was milk. like, yeah, froth the milk. <laughs> PBR and Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. I went to his high school. I spoke at his old high school. Is that... Yeah, have you been there? No, I went to yes the 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 named after the cardinal. Yeah, they yeah. took me Spelman. and showed me his photos to yeah. prove to me they weren't lying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, look, he's playing basketball. He dunked on that <laughs> fool. Uh, no, so I went there and his birthday was May eighth, and I was like, I'm gonna quit in May eighth. Huh? Yeah, because I love Sheen. I love Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He and was a big part of my life. And yeah. how long from that time till May 8th? Was oh, it was it? Uh, end of March, mid-March. Okay. And I was like, no, nope, this is when I'm going to do it. Okay. And uh, you, uh, your assistant had emailed me <laughs> around this time. My uh, assistant? Yeah, to do this. Oh, good. And then I just had like things just line up. 
magically wow. line up. And I was well, like, no, okay. I, I can see it being funny. You kind of walking into your boss's office to give two weeks notice that would end on May 8th. He'd be like, you know what? I'd like you just to leave now. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. can't. Yeah. I'll volunteer, but I can't. Yeah, I have I have obligations to Fulton. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you were working as adult faith formation. Mm-hmm. At, was it St. Anthony of Padua? Yeah. Or for yeah. H- how many years? So I did that particular job uh, for seven years. Okay. Yeah, so I went to Franciscan. St. Anthony's was my home parish in high school in the Woodlands. And then I went to Franciscan, did undergrad in three and a half, started grad. And, and just so people know, my wife was a youth minister there at one point, wasn't she? Yeah, she was at St. Simon and Jude. She was over at St. Anthony's a ton, oh, working okay. under Barb and stuff, my youth minister. And it was just amazing where I finished grad school. I went, I did youth ministry there for three and a half years. And then I, I did a bunch of stuff, but I was done with youth ministry. And she called me up and she's like, would you do adult faith formation? Yes. I need to get out of this, right? (laughs) So youth ministry is awesome. I love youth ministry, but I needed to get out. I needed to have conversations where you don't have to say dude every like 37 (laughs) seconds. So I go and I do, dude, that's how old I am. And uh, Yeah, do you say dude? People say dude, your generation? Not really. I say bruh a lot. Bruh, yeah, bruh. (laughs) B-R-U-H, bruh. What's up, bruh? I picked up the British bruv. Bruv. Oh, yeah. I yeah, think it's, sounds, not it's more satisfying in the yeah. mouth. Hey, what's up, Rub? <laughs> Rub. Yeah. So, anyway, right. I, I loved it. I love doing adult faith formation. Love uh, RCIA. And then I built inclusion off of that. So, um, was it yeah. a difficult thing? Did you and your wife to kind of discern? Did you bring this up to her and say, I- I'm thinking of quitting? And did you kind of have to so, pray about the future? <laughs> St. Anthony's pays you well. Okay. And I was stepping into. Please, sir. Please, sir. <laughs> Please hire me. Right. So it, it was a big shift. And okay. so before I got joined up with that man is you, the conversation with my wife was like, I feel like I need to do this. And she said, okay, end of August at the earliest. And then one day she came home from a, a retreat and she said, I think May 1st. That was her. And she's the worry wart when it comes to money and finances. I'm the anxiety prone sociopath whenever money hits the wall kind of thing, mm. you know? But before she's like the, I mean, she's a planner. She sees the future. I only see the present. Yeah. Me and too. she was like, no, I think May 1st. Mm. So You're then like, I went. May 8th? No. <laughs> no. No. May 1st. May you 1st. will be disobedient to your wife. <laughs> Who do you love more, Sheen or me? And I was like, uh, Sheen doesn't look that hot in a dress. Uh, <laughs> turns out he does um, in a cape. But uh, no, she. she <laughs> what? The, it's fine. It's fine. It's a good thing you chose not to drink that alcohol. <laughs> By now, God love you. Um, no, so I that gave me the freedom to start <laughs> thinking about when 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 was I going to walk away? Yeah. When was I going to change? When was the new thing going to happen? And that also. Uh, was a swift kick in the butt to, okay, I need to line up the next thing. I already had the conferences lined up. I had everything basically until December more or less lined up mm-hmm. that financially we'd be okay. But it was like, but there's in my heart, this, this is my thing. And this is what we've talked about before, but I hate being just a speaker and any was the one that said this to me years ago. Cause he's like, what do you want to do ultimately? And I was like, oh, I want to be like Scott Hahn without all the studying and degrees. <laughs> and he said, yeah, it's nice being a speaker, right? You give the talks, the three talks that you're really good at. Everyone shakes your hand at the bottom of the stage. People are crying. It's so good. It's so great. You get on a plane, you fly out. He said, but you're not discipling any of those people. You're not there after the conference with their youth ministers and all that stuff. He's like, you're not. And it's great. It's very affirming, but the real work is what happens after or before. And I really took that to heart because I do believe like the lives that I've seen change the most are the lives I've poured into individually the most. Mm. So then the question becomes, what do I do if I do feel cold? Like I, I, I can't step away from something like, I don't like meetings, right? Like that's not why I'm leaving parish life. It's I have to step into something that I know the Lord is going to keep that discipleship momentum going. And Paradisius Day, which is like the umbrella organization for that man is you. I felt called to that man as you, which is national, international men's ministry, English and Spanish, good stuff. But I felt called to like, to do what I do on the side for them. And so, you know, basically parish missions, men's conference. And I was already doing a bunch of this stuff. And like the guys in Peoria, they're all like, actually, we're going to watch your video next week and all this stuff. So it's, there was like a lot of synergies there, if I could use that douche speak. And, uh, and so I was like, I I really do think this is the next step because I'm still doing ministry. And then the thing that really helped me was I started going to this ordinary parish because I just need a break. Like I would tell, we got to get to that. That's going to be a big thing. So don't, don't just. Give yeah. us the gold yet. I want to yeah. get into that. All right, fair enough, fair enough. But there was this sense of, 
I need breathing room from getting in arguments with clergy, getting in arguments with lay leaders, sure. getting in arguments with myself, and then going to mass on Sunday. <laughs> it became hard to detach from all those conversations and stuff. And so going to a church where no one knew me or few people knew me was just like, I got to go to mass. Cause I would have people that would interrupt me right after I'd received Holy communion. And they'd be like, Hey, real quick, dude, I know you're praying. I'm sorry. Do you need that form today? Oh, my all goodness. the time, all the, Hey Mike, real quick. I know you're with your family, but, and they would state the very reason why they should shut up. <laughs> they would lead with it. And I'm like, no, go to that first thing. Um, <laughs> like, there's no more, ba- the, the true story, no more <clears throat> toilet paper in the women's restroom. And I was like, I don't know where additional toilet paper for the women's restroom is. Uh, I can text this. And then I'm like texting facilities and they're, they're super responsive and stuff. But I just felt like, why am I doing that? Yeah. Mm. So then you go to a different church, sure. any church, right? Sure, sure. And you're like, no one cares about you. No one's asking you. Even if people know you, <sighs> they're not getting their, you know, liability form turned in on time, you know? So that enabled me to be like, oh, there's this element where I'm doing ministry here at this other parish. And I'm doing ministry for this. I had permission. Like, that's what my brain took, my heart, really, to leave full-time parish ministry. And I'm terrified, but it's awesome. Thatmanisyou.com? How, I mean, yeah, Paradisius a day. Latin. Links in the description. That's, Dot org. Links in the description. That was a bad choice. Yeah. No, Whenever you put Latin in a URL. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a Paradisius. Wait, what? <laughs> How yeah. do I spell? D-A-Y. No, de he. De he. Mm. Yeah, no, they're great. That man is you. Just type in that man is you, um, and you'll get it. But um, there's this thing called Google. It'll find it. Uh, so is your yeah. job now kind of itinerant preaching? Yeah, mission so, evangelist. So how could people book you to speak at their parish? I'm so happy to, you asked. You're All you got to do is go to the website and email someone, <laughs> right? So I, I mean, Michael dot Gormley at Paradisiusday dot org. Could you find that? And Ooh. Please, he's put, gonna put it in the show notes. Yeah, put it in the show. Is it? Sh- is it- the Every Man Is You website? Every Man Is You. You're combining my podcast. No, That Man Is You. I'm wearing Not the Not Every Man Is You. It's just that schizophrenic. It's, yeah. <laughs> every, you that are everybody. That one and that one that and that one, one and that yeah. one. But no, what's your specific URL? Michael. Oh, uh, my email is michael.gormley. Oh, do you want to do that? Okay, here we go. You're not. At Paradisius Day. Yeah. No, no, no. I want people right. to email me. All right. Good. Because the, the whole idea, you go to the website, you'll, you'll figure it out. But the whole <laughs> idea is... Um, there's so much of couples, like they're, they're focused on healing families of marriages and a big component of that, that kind of accidentally providentially fell into the, the, the founder C Bowman's lap was working in men's groups. There's a Presbyterian church had 600 men coming every week mm-hmm. and uh, like 200 of them were Catholics. And they're like, there's just nothing for us. Yeah. So he went to St. Cecilia's great parish and said, Hey, we're going to, I want to do this men's ministry. They're like, ah, a handful of people are going to come. And a hundred and something men show up mm. and you realize, so I start watching the video. So I originally belonged when I was a youth minister in 2005 or six or seven, whenever it was, I went through it and I'm like, I'm unmarried. I don't have kids. This isn't for me. And I bailed. And, uh, I, when they hired me, I started watching the videos and I'm sitting there in light of, uh, what's his name? Andrew Tate. Mm-hmm. Jordan Peterson's comment, all these things, the manosphere, if you're mm-hmm. aware of the manosphere, Lila Rose, you talked about mm-hmm. that. Um, this is the antidote to all the BS for men. Mm-hmm. Like he doesn't sit there and be like, well, men are like this and women are like this. He's just like, this is what it means. This is what, this is what leadership looks like. These are the four areas of leadership, you know, personal morality and military leadership, political leadership mm-hmm. and building for the future and economic leadership and all this stuff. And at the center of it all is sacrifice. And he just lays it out in a way that's not like, well, what about women? What about men? What percentage are women allowed to? He's like, doesn't matter. None of that bothers anything. He's talking to men and he's like, this is what you need to do. This is who we are. This is what Christ called us to be. I right? love it. And yeah. the, the amazing thing is part of their, their core views were born out over the failures of men in the Bible. Right. So that man is you, Nathan, the prophet Nathan to David after the whole Bathsheba thing. Um, you know, thou art the man. Right. And it's like these ah. failures, these profound That's failures. That's where that comes from. Yeah. Like these profound failures from Adam to, yeah. to King David and Solomon, all the rest, where they fail is where Christ succeeds. Mm. And it's like, okay, that's the man you're called to be, right? You're not called to be Andrew Tate at all. You're not <laughs> called to be all of these, like, even if you love them, they're still, they're still, even at their very best, they're a slice fallen of who man. Christ is. He's fallen men. Yeah. 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 And so th- this is the, the the tender heart of our Savior, right, is I think what that man is you executes so well. 
And when I'm sitting there and I'm on my standing desk on my walking treadmill, powering through videos in double speed, I, I pause my walking treadmill at my standing desk as trendy as I can be. And I, I just I'm like, I'm haunted by what he just said. Mm. I'm haunted by how he how he dialed in like the foundation for the future. Every man is geared towards this foundation for the future for their wives, for their kids, for community. It's not individualistic. Right? It's always oriented towards how can I be the best for others? How can I be a man for others? Mm. And you lay these things out in the, in the way that Steve Bowman does and the whole organization does. They just embody it. And here's the funny thing. Now, for anyone who's ever worked at a parish, you know this. You worked at a parish, right? <laughs> <laughs> Insert spiked eyebrows here. Uh, <laughs> there are people who are on the parish because they're Catholic and they love being Catholic and they like the parish and whatever. But they're not devoted to the mission. Right. To They'd be surprised that their parish even had a, had mission. a mission. Right. No, we're Catholics. We do the Catholic thing. We have some classes. We have some sacraments. We have some masses. We have some other stuff. When I walked into my first meeting, right, and this is not to make my bosses happy, right? <laughs> when I walked into that first meeting and they started, they do this morning prayer and check in and all this stuff. It's like, here's an entire group of people yeah. who not only are good Catholics, they are devout, yeah. clearly intentional Roman yeah, Catholics. Yeah, yeah. And, so good to hear that. and they're devoted singularly mm. to the mission. And that was like, I keep coming back to that. I'm like, oh, this is, this is what gets me going in the morning. Like, I love this. I, I'm so glad to hear that. My friend yeah. Derek just took a job with Exodus 90 and he said the same thing. So yeah. like, yeah, he started working for them, and he said, they're the real deal. Like, isn't that wonderful to be yeah. pleasantly shocked at their, <laughs> at their These are Catholics fidelity. who are Catholic. They're praying. They're, yeah. like, they're yeah. asking how we can pray for you. They they take cold showers to be in solidarity with everyone doing yeah. Exodus 90 right now. And yeah. I love it. I love it. And I love Good the, things are happening, huh? And they have, per, like, an apostolate. The thing that's so powerful and, and like, attractive <laughs> about an apostolate is they're not a parish in, in these ways of, like, they're devoted to a mission. The mission is clear. It's singular. This is what we do, mm. right? And this is what we do. And if you like this or are benefited from this, get on board and let's do this, right? And I love the fact that it just permeates. Like every person that I have, even in their complaining, they're complaining for the glory of God. Like we should be doing more of this and we got to do more of this. If only we could hire this type of thing. And I'm like, this is exciting. Like yeah. I, I've never been a part of it. So I love what you said there too about being focused on here's what you do. Don't yeah. worry about you know, it's kind of like yeah. a sibling who's like, well, why did she get to do well, that? Yeah. Or why did, yeah. I, I like that. I, I, I've thought lately about the masculine genius, sum, summing it up as simply like strength on behalf of others. Mm. Like, I think that's, that's just men at their best are men where their strength is offered for others, their family, yeah. their community, their whoever, their friends. Now this is. Do you um, watch a lot of the Manosphere type red pill no, matrixy stuff? No, in fact, the red pill is a new thing for me. I, I heard about it only when Lila was on the show. Yeah, it's interesting. I hate ninety percent of it. This is the part of my <laughs> my recent Catching Foxes episode that I was like, oh, I didn't do a good enough job explaining the whole. But like, I can't stand so much of it. But at the same time, it's like a reaction to feminism. It's a reaction to man hating feminism because there is different types of feminism. Um, Camilla Paglia in her probably butchering her last name, but in her conversation with Jordan Peterson had this great thing where she's like, I can't stand feminism that hates men. She's like, when the world falls apart and it's going too soon, the first thing all these feminists are going to do is try to find the strongest man they can find. Yeah. So for That's obviously true, if a street is safe, <laughs> yeah. it's because of men. Yeah. If a town is safe, it's because of men. If a nation is state is safe, it's the men. And you, and you think about this, from the perspective of, and, and I don't think it's hard to, okay, let me, let me try to flesh it out. I don't think women today realize the extent to which the anti man narrative is in our children's faces often. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you're like a good normal Catholic or a, not even a Catholic, like a normal human, a centrist, and you don't, you're not particularly political, but you see this, you, and you're a woman, you're like, I'm a feminist, of course. I think women should be able to work and wear pants and, you know, pay their bills. That's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about people who think that men are literally evil and they're weaving that content into curriculum to the point where boys hate the fact that they're men. Right and to the point where secular psychologists are writing books like The War Against Boys and mm -hmm. um, Raising Men and all these different things because they realize that there's this anti-man narrative. 
And so the question then becomes what that is essentially masculine needs to be defended. Right. And, uh, you know, um, when I, when I was talking about the, the Andrew Tate stuff, he's like, Mr. Like he's overcorrecting. Right. And he's very sexual and he's very pornographic, but there's this line from Cardinal Ratzinger years ago, and I cannot find the speech, but Dr. Hahn referenced it. <laughs> he's on it. Scotty. Yeah. So try to find it. But he said the crisis of today is a crisis of fatherhood or is an attack on fatherhood. And he goes through this list of like contraception is a denial of fatherhood, homosexuality is, a, you know, and he goes through all of these things that are in vogue and popular in the night, I believe it was in the nineties. And I think about that's the antidote to all the matrix red pill menosphere stuff is they want to be men who have, you know, strong bodies, strong minds, the stoic philosophers, but they don't want to be dads. Mm. Matt uh, Matt That's Walsh right. talked about when he was celebrating the birth of his last kid. These he's like, and not to be outdone by the left is the the alt right manosphere who called my child an F trophy. Like that's how they demean children, right? And they demean marriage and all this stuff. And it's like, no, this fatherhood. Fatherhood is the perf- as as ma- as manhood is the perfection of boyhood. Fatherhood is the perfection of masculinity, right? So to be a boy means to have all these potencies. Right. To be a man is to actualize him. I'm mature to be masculine is fully realized and perfected in fatherhood, whether it's spiritual or physical. Right. Because all of those things that I love about, you know, about about my life and all these things, I have to subordinate them to my wife and my kids. And I have to love it. And that's the thing that they don't get because it's all about me going to the gym and me getting my time in and not simping for the, for the women. And you know, not, not, you know, that's good. Not looking at pornography, not paying, you know, $80,000 to only fans girls and all these like craziness. But at the same time, there's a denial of their fatherhood. And I don't know about you, but like for me, I would be a far worse man without my kids. You know, I love my wife, obviously. <laughs> obviously I love my wife. I got it. Stop oh, it. he's got it. Let's hear it. Uh, it's from a March 2000 speech in Paul Palermo, Italy. March 2000 in Palermo, Italy. You know what Palermo, Italy is famous for? Nope. Founding of La Cosa Nostra, the predecessor of the mafia. Go on. The crisis of fatherhood we are experiencing today is an element, perhaps the most important element, threatening man is humanity. Oh, just think about that. Say that one more time. I think I butchered it the first time, so that's good. <laughs> You had it with a German accent. It's understandable. It's Ratzinger. The crisis of father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry. That was yeah, hilarious. No. Well done. Well done. <laughs> you know it. I know it. It was brilliant. <laughs> the crisis of fatherhood we are experiencing today is an element, perhaps the most important element, threatening man in his humanity. Crisis so the, the of crisis fatherhood. of fatherhood is the most important element yeah. threatening yeah. man in his humanity. I mean, when my, okay, so my whole life I thought I was called to be a priest. My mom told me I had priest hands <laughs> when I was a kid. All right. I had priest hands. I told uh, Father Mike Schmitz that, and he goes, what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> and I go, I think it means I've never done an honest day's work in my life. He got so he's pissed so off. He's so jacked. He got so, yeah, oh man, man. He God. did not get pissed off. Oh, he did, because he's like, what does that even mean, priest hands? And I was like, I work every day. And I was like, I think you only work on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> but um, He's so jacked. Dude. Yeah, but in my head, <clears throat> I was called to be a priest. So I never, I never imagined myself as a husband. Never even remote. I mean, like imagine girls, but I never imagined remotely being a dad. Mm. Even when I was married and my wife was pregnant, like I did all the things with the belly and the cooing and I bought a thing to try to listen to the heartbeat yeah. from Walmart didn't yeah. work. Um, did all of those things. And I loved the idea. But holding. So my wife, when she went into labor with Kateri in labor for days. When we were at Saturday evening vigil mass, and she had a she went in, she had a contraction, and she stood up for holy communion, and there was a grandmother behind her. She goes, oh 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 oh, <laughs> and it's like she's fine, she's fine. It's been going for a day and a half. I was texting Luke and drove by the exit to the hospital. <laughs> Whoopsie, uh, but <laughs> Kateri, no, that's not true, is it? Hundred percent fact. Hundred percent fact. <laughs> your first child? Yeah, Kateri. My my. You, uh, what were you texting him about? I, I, what I, I, if we start a hospital? podcast? <laughs> What's that? You'll yeah. learn. Yeah. One day. One. Day. No, I was texting that we're on the way to the hospital. I'm so excited. But holding Katiri, so we almost like uh, every time my wife had a contraction, her heart would stop beating. And all these things. And the doctor's like, now I know you want to have a natural. And Shannon goes, I don't care. Get this child out of me if it's going to save her life. And he's like, oh, let's go now. And then they forgot about me. And so I'm like suiting up with all the booties and the hairnet. <laughs> Just alone. <laughs> Just alone. <Hello? laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> they shut the lights off. There's that one flickering like a zombie movie. <laughs> Guys! You got a hair net? <laughs> Do you want me to start serving the french fries now? And the beard <laughs> and net. And the beard net. But no, my wife goes... My, so I walk in, right? You walk in as you're... If you've never seen what a C-section is, mm. they're cruciform. And there's a sheet that they pin up that yep. goes right underneath their I neck. I remember that, man. Yeah. Wow. And she is there and she just looks at me and... All the things that you go to all the classes, the prenatal class things, it's like... Ain't none of that stuff. <laughs> ain't none of that, right? We rub their back and feed them ice chips and tell them they're so brave, right? I did none of that. Like, I'm like, well, I can't feed you anything. And I just held her head like this. And I was like, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. So then... Good man. The baby, uh, Kateri comes out. She's delivered. And I had it I had it recorded. And we go, 808, 808 p.m., it's a girl. And I'll never forget the the doctor saying that and my daughter crying and my wife going, oh, and then I get to hold her. Mm. And, you know, as a youth, as a teen in, in, in youth ministry, you always hear those speakers who talk about their kids all the time. And I remember that was one thing like, all they ever do is talk about their kids. The moment I held her, all I ever did was talk about my kids. I love my kid. Like, I remember just holding her and being like, I got to learn so much about life right now. Like, I don't know what a school board is. I don't know what any of this crap is. Everything Janet Smith says in her famous contraception, why not talk? Like, that was racing through my head. Like, I need to do all this stuff because this kid is now mine and I am going to screw this up big time. And uh, I've never loved... Do you, do you remember being shocked that the hospital at some point went, all right, there you go. You can You can go now. What really? You're not gonna trust me with this thing. <laughs> Is there a like a manual? Yeah, it was it was crazy. And you walk out of there. My wife my wife hates hospitals. She can't wait to get out. So we get out of there, we go out and I have to raise this kid. The the biochemical oxytocin, blah blah blah. Like all that stuff is so real. Cause when I looked at her, everything was different. Mm. Everything was different to be a man to understand the principles of personal finance and Dave Ramsey and get out of debt and do all this stuff to be a husband learning how to give yourself accommodate someone else in your life in your space using your stuff mm. being in your bathroom when you just want to poop and read a book right like all of these things that are so important to dudes being dudes all of that you suborn to this child and then I had another one. And then I had another one <laughs> and then I had another one <laughs> and you realize uh, and, and, and Pope John Paul talks about this like when you commit yourself in love you hem yourself and you give up in, in the name of your freedom you give up freedom mm. for this one person but then through that love first of marriage mm. then of kids mm. your world gets larger your world your horizon is infinitely expanded so Katiri my oldest is not Cecilia is not Noah right. is not Thomas and the fact that I have these four kids who are not each other, but are the fruit of my loins <laughs> and my wife's like you, they, they all. And it's funny. It's like either or like every other one is like, oh, this is Shannon's side of the family. This is my side of the family. It's perfect. It's I cannot imagine life any other way. Right. I mean, you feel it's like, oh, which kid am I going to get rid of in order to have a better life and a more retirement and a fancier vacation and another hat? Right. Like Justin has is like, oh, you, you can't afford more hats. So you, which kid's head are you going to lop off? Like I just desperately like these kids have changed me fundamentally and even in their pain that they cause me. Right. Like, like you know, you, you got to deal with issues, whatever those issues might be in dealing with them. I have to become better in order to serve them more. Right. Like, so, you know, so-and-so kid who's struggling with X, mm -hmm. I now have to find out all about X in order to help my kid struggle better with it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I talk a lot. I'm sorry. No, it's, 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 it's spot on. I mean, I know for me, the times that I've really screwed up as a dad, you know, like I've lost my patience. I've yelled, I've said poisonous things to my kids in a fit of rage. Yeah. Not frequently, but you know, the yeah. times that you do that and you just feel such like shame of how you've screwed this thing up and then yeah. having to apologize and grow in and having other people see the worst things about you. You know, the people that you love so much, yeah. it's like that with your wife, right? You yeah. marry this woman, you put on your best front and then you get married and you can't keep that up for too long. And then it yeah. all spills out and you see each other and then you love each other in that. And then you have these kids and ah, it's beautiful. And I, Jason Everett was talking about how oil comes to the surface, you know, um, 
like marriage does that and so does fatherhood it brings all those defects that you perhaps never would have known you had yeah you know marriage does that but then kids come along and you thought you were a basically patient good person and then you haven't slept in two days or something and then all of that wickedness yeah. and selfishness like real evil yeah. uh comes to the surface and then you either have to abandon everybody or deal with it i mean i can remember being so mad at my kids <laughs> when they were like two me too. Right? And you're just like, why won't you just do the one thing? Yeah. I And I remember it like, go, and just losing it, crying in my room, being like, what the hell is wrong with it? It's a two-year-old. But I'm just yelling. Or, But there's also so much pressure on, on new dads because you've been, you have this idea that if I don't correct this thing in them mm -hmm. now, they are obviously going to be a drug dealer. <laughs> you know? As a, but once you've had, once it's If your, you don't pick up this toy, you will be an addict. <laughs> for the rest of your life. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, now I've got my fourth kid, mm -hmm. uh, Peter, who I love dearly. And you see these like little disrespectful attitudes come out and- and you realize it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And that's why I think sometimes older kids will say to their parents, you treated the younger ones a lot differently yeah. to us. Yeah. And it's not just because the parents are too exhausted to care. <laughs> it's that they've learned what's worth caring about. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that? I've, I've learned that. <sighs> I, I don't. So, okay. So this is, I think, the difference in our personality. Okay. My parents are from Philadelphia. <laughs> My parents are from inner city. If I don't get a solid one minute monologue of your mother's <laughs> accent, I'm going to be disappointed. Michael, I used to wake up, Michael, Michael, and I would like, oh my gosh, right? The way that she said it. But um, no, my parents are from Philadelphia, and the, the running joke is we should buy them a t shirt that says to people in the South, right? We live in Texas. I'm not mad. I'm just from Philly. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not mad. I remember when my parents met, uh, not when they first met my in laws, but it was like a new kind of experience. They had come down. We were renting a house. I was barbecuing. Me and my mom got in an argument about Iran and militarism, <laughs> as one does, <laughs> as one does. <laughs> and my mom and we're exchanging. To my sweet Midwestern uh, in-laws, it seemed like we were yelling. Yeah. To me and my mom, we were talking passionately. Yeah. And if my mother-in-law stepped in between it, she goes, Hail Mary, full of grace. Okay, peace. And I thought my mom was going to shiv her in the back with a knife. <laughs> like, psst, psst, psst. You know, like, And again, done. I'm not mad. I'm just... <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like growing up in Kensington in a row home. <laughs> right, like... <that. laughs> it's the fentanyl capital of America. You're done. No, uh... <laughs> it was so... It was so funny, but I remember... It, that was the moment that I realized, like, oh, our personalities are radically different. So, when I parent i tend towards loud and louder like the only two volumes i have and one of the things i've cultivated is apologizing that i am not good at when i have to do that to my kids mm -hmm. um there is a book called not my father's son written by an actor you'll figure it out uh i read <laughs> chapter one and two on a plane and cried the whole way mm -hmm. it's a fa he's a famous actor uh and <clears throat> he talked about how his how violent his father was and mm -hmm. you know one day walked in you need a haircut he was pissed drunk and just back uh, from the factory and took a pair of rusty shavers that weren't oiled and was ripping out his hair as uh, he was shaving and you know this guy if we you got it? Yeah. You, you Alan know him. Cumming. Who? Alan Cumming. Alan Cumming. Anywho, you probably, if you saw his picture, you'd recognize him. But um, I remember seeing that, reading that villain book. villain in Spy Kids. That's what I know I'm from. <laughs> cool. And, and, and weeping for yeah. this man's yeah. childhood and realizing in myself, <sighs> my loudness for a child can sound like hate yeah. and hurt and you know violence or whatever you know not hit my kid or anything like that but the going back to my kids repeatedly right even now 13 year old that's hard you ever apologize to a 13 year old that's I, hard I, I think what makes it so difficult is that the fear is that in apologizing they won't realize the thing that they were wrong in and it becomes mm -hmm. about dad mm -hmm. i think it was bill burr who talked about this with his wife favorite comedian is he? Yeah. <clears throat> he said that she'll do something, right? And then I'll lose my sh whatever. <laughs> and then it becomes all about me yeah. losing my thing instead of that thing that's yeah. actually like, whereas if I had just handled it well, we could have then dealt with this problem here. Yeah. I think that's the fear with kids. Yeah. It's like they do something legitimately wrong. You might lose it and then it becomes all about you. And then yeah. if you apologize, that's the pride thing, I think. Yeah. But kids are smart enough to realize, no, I, I messed up and yeah. I apologize for that. Please forgive me. I was wrong to do that. 
when you did, and then you can address the yeah. issue. But it is hard. Yeah. The Amish have this thing of like you never correct while you're angry. Well, right, so you usually wait be, the next day. Yeah, good, right? good human yeah. advice. Right, and I, 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 I do think that. Like, you gotta, you gotta walk away. You gotta walk away. You gotta take a breath. And I'm not good at that no. because I think, oh, in the in the moment, that's when they're really gonna learn. And I go, and honestly, I struggle with the guilt of it all. Even though I do apologize whenever I, and I don't do it all that time. Often, I say to myself, lying in front of a camera. Um, but there is a, a thing on Instagram. Beautiful Instagram that has saved my soul. No, he, he saved my self-esteem. He just said, if you're a dad who's constantly asking yourself, am I a good dad? The answer is you are because mm. bad dads don't wonder. Mm. Right. People who are bad. That's the same thing with people. Yeah. Like if you wonder, like people who say, I'm yeah. a good person, probably are. <laughs> you're selling yourself something. <laughs> yeah. 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 But no, I like that. Keep, keep going with that. Yeah. So no. What? And so that, that for me, um, I, like I'm a very dramatic person. I am. Yeah. I don't know why. My dad is not. I'm he's glad a very, you are. yeah, he's a very, uh, he's a very, my dad is a very calming person, even from being from Philly. When he gets pissed, he gets pissed. But the experience of my kids and masculine, like they know, they know what and why we're about what we're about. Like we don't do that. Other people do that. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? Well, I'll tell you why. Boom, boom, boom. I'm very honest with my kids. I talk to them like they're kids, but as if I expect them to be adults. So I give them reasons and yeah. answers and, and do the good. deep plunge. Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. I, yeah. I I really like my kids, mm -hmm. but I didn't always. Mm. When I had children in the beginning, I really thought I'd be a good dad. Yeah. And I thought I'd be a good dad because, you know, I had read bits of the theology of the body and <laughs> I, I had heard talks on marriage and nodded sagely as I listened to yeah. them. And and yeah. so that when children came and made demands upon my selfishness that I was not prepared for. Yeah. And I saw my immaturity and my whatever, narcissism, I know that's the buzzword these days. I was shocked and terrified and disheartened and and uh and I, yeah, I just I remember going up to other dads and being like, "It's hard, right?" And they're like, "Yeah, but it's great." I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> when need... do I get to the great part?" Yeah, <laughs> it was like I was so I was so afraid that yeah. no one could relate to me. Yeah. I just felt so alone. Like all these new dads, I'm like, I, "Of course it's great, sure," but but for me it was the the emphasis wasn't, "But it's great." For me it was, "It's great," but. I'm drowning. That yeah. was my that was my reality. <laughs> and here's another time. baby. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. But I'm glad to say, thank you, Lord, that I just love my kids. They're so good. And I don't know if I think kids in the eighties and nineties were probably the worst kids in the history of humanity. Really? Yeah. We have the X Men cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Even with those inspirational yeah, messages That's from Mr. T and Sonic, it didn't matter. I mean, <laughs> kids today my kids are so much better. Better than I oh was. my gosh, my kids are incredible. Absolutely. But Hands that, down. in comparison to you? Yes. Right, because yes. you were probably a shit. I was a shit. So shit. was I. But my point is, <laughs> yeah. all of us were. I didn't want to admit we it. We were raised with porn and all sorts of crap. And of course, kids are today. But if you're in any way clued in, right. you don't give your kids devices. Right. You don't send them to schools I, without I, asking I, questions. I did a theology of the body talk where I said, if your kid is younger than younger than 16 and you've given them a phone, you're a bad parent. Yeah. And Stop a couple there. of my friends were just sitting there like, and they roll their eyes at me and like, here Gormley goes again. Yeah, but I'm babe, like, no, but you and I can bang on the same drum. Uh, people do you not understand. You start with the, yeah, exactly. But, but so my kids don't grow up with that stuff and yeah. they don't grow up with MTV and we, you know, I don't know. I just think my kids are terrific kids. My, uh, so my daughter, my oldest Katiri goes to a sleepover with some of her friends from the church that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And uh, the mom texts, says, the girls on their own in my daughter's room, it was like four or five of them, have decided to pray the rosary together. God. And I was like, if, me and my buddy were busy trying to watch the scrambled spice channel <laughs> on cable to see what we could see, what what glimpse of a, you know, not, not, not good, not great. I will see your parenting win and i'll up, up uh oh it. last they yeah. did the entire What's that? matches please oh yeah let me just light this and i'll give it to you yeah. no my daughter i won't say which one came in last night with one of those poppers what are those things that kids have those little rubber popper things oh yeah yeah i think they're and poppers. she asked if she should throw it out because it's rainbow colored 
But and, Father, it's and the and month I of June. I literally counted the colours <laughs> on the rainbow, and it was good just to talk about that. I'm like, no, there's uh, seven. You're good. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Roy G. Biv, baby. But you're I just good. love that she's thinking about that, and I love yeah. that we would have went absolutely if we thought it was actually pushing yeah. some kind of LGBTQ That's so agenda. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah, can and I, then my and one more. Yeah, my son please. Liam, who's the coolest kid in the world, he plays D and D with a few friends, a few doors down. Oh, so he's going to hell. Exactly. Yeah, but in the meantime, <laughs> he's really cool. <laughs> and 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 they were all. I went over there, and their dad is this awesome deacon, Mike Walker, great guy. And uh, is he all, one of the deacons that play D and D with yeah. like? Oh uh, yeah, Deacon Bob. super nerd. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Deacon Bob. And uh, he's like, hey, boys, let's pray a Divine Mercy Chaplet before we begin. And they all just, yep, they all just. Yeah, okay. That's what you do. Yeah, it's just awesome. And they wanted to and they pray. And yeah. if anything, I've got, to, I've got to remind my kids to pray for sinners and to realize that they are sinners too. It's not. My son, one, uh, one of my sons, he <laughs> wakes up every morning at about 630. Wakes up before he, before he gets out of bed, puts on his clothes for the day. Goes ah, in. Oh, it. what a failure. What a failure there. Now, uh, he wakes up, brushes his hair. That's always his key thing. My son, Noah, yeah. eldest, eldest boy, comes downstairs, greets us, you know, sweet kid. He has two books, two, the Bible day by day, little, you know, like your rosary yeah. um, devotional book that he reads every day. How old and is I, he? Uh, yeah, he's nine. And he That's sits amazing. there and, and he does. Your old can barely read. <laughs> Homeschooling. Whoa, we homeschool, but we classical, and I'm a psychopath. So, mm. yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Great quote. <laughs> hey, Paul, also, if you could make a list of all of Gomer's insane one liners we homeschool, but we classical, and I'm a psychopath. <laughs> You're welcome, America. Yeah. But he, he just sits there. And so, every so often, when I catch him doing that, like when I'm like downstairs at that time or whatever, like, so what'd you learn? Like, you know, I don't really know. And I was like, well, come over here and he'll immediately open it up and we'll read it together. And I go, oh, this is this is part of the sheep and the goat separation mm -hmm. where he says, this is why it says, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I go and I'll explain to him the whole thing. He goes, oh, that makes much more sense. OK, 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 I get it. So how can I help the those who are ill? Beautiful. You know, because that's what the meditation was on. And I'm just like, who, 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 I never did this. Yeah. Like my family, we prayed the daily rosary. That's my dad, beautiful. my mom, daily rosary, scriptural rosary. So my dad has Black Knights of Columbus rosary, mm -hmm. would pass it. it you know, like you knew you've arrived when you got the rosary first and you had to pray the Apostles' Creed, the big prayer, mm -hmm. right? But we read and largely memorized the scriptural rosary, right? Mm -hmm. The little the little hardback book. Yeah. Crushed it. Loved it. Yeah. Have that for my kids. I'll never forget the I day. I don't like that at all. Huh? I don't like the scriptural rosary. Uh, you're a bad person. My dad gave me, uh, when I got married, we had our, I think it was our second kid. He said, I think you need this now. Who said that? My you're, dad. How cool And is I that? open up the scriptural rosary book and it said, Father Maurice, 1965. Mm. Right? It was his original that I grew up praying. And now I pray with my kids. That's beautiful. Right? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Even though it's... No, I'm just joking. What? What? Yeah, no, it's a terrible translation. No, I'll no, tell you that much. No, 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 oh, no. That's not what I'm saying. It's one step away I, from the new living. It is one step away. No, no, no. No, I feel like now that I've said How such a... How many steps from the message? <laughs> that's right. A thousand. <laughs> but remember when the message was in yeah. and we all went and got a copy? Uh, not went, me. No, not me because me of the advertising because it said is the Bible plus sign Tabasco sauce equals the message. And I was like, whip, I'm done. <laughs> I can't follow that. I can't follow that. Was that what they did? Yeah, I never that saw was that. literally yeah. an advertisement. <laughs> no, the thing I don't enjoy about the scriptural rosary isn't, I see the value in meditating on scripture, obviously, and it's beautiful. But one of the reasons I love the Jesus prayer, hmm. and one of the reasons I love the rosary, but like struggle to love it in the same way, is this, this intense focus that's already required in the rosary. You know, like, so if I'm going to pray the rosary, I need to be like, all right, what am I going to do? I guess I'll sit over there or I'll go for a walk and I'll do this yeah. thing. Uh, or I will, you know, whereas mm -hmm. the Jesus prayer, I'm just like, I'm on a plane. I'm like, whatever. I'm Can the I coffee offer you shop. a criticism of the Jesus prayer? And I want your feedback, well, let me honestly. Yeah, you, I, I'm happy do, to respond do. to it. Let me offer a, yeah. So love, love the rosary, love praying the rosary with the family. Um, my fear is that just the, just the inserting a line of scripture in between I, I can see that as a great way to kickstart your devotion to the rosary. Like it reminds you why you meditate on these things and what you should be thinking about as you kind of pray. But to me personally, and this is not a criticism of the book as much as it is just to say this is how I experience it. Um, it kind of it takes me out of that kind of rhythmic, mm. yeah, mm -hmm. me meditative way of reflecting mentally yeah. upon the images. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, criticism of the Jesus. Here's, well, number one, here's where you're wrong. 
about the mm-hmm. scriptural rosary. No, uh, for me, as a uh, growing up doing it, that's the rhythm. The rhythm is Hail Mary. There was a uh, it was a virgin betray a betrothed to Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. Hail Mary, full. like there's mm. the rhythm becomes with scripture. And think of oh, a yeah. Catholic yeah. who has memorized the principal events in the life of Christ in scripture, right? Or is deeply familiar with it. So I'm okay, I am the Rose I'm okay of Sharon. with that, but to yeah. me it's almost like a different prayer at that point. What, I, what I don't Fair like enough. about a lot of prayers is what yeah. I call piety sprawl. Oh, absolutely. So <laughs> absolutely. I'm, I'm not even a huge fan of the introductory prayers to yeah. the rosary. The, even the creed, the Alpha, the Three, I, I just like... First mystery, boom. Mm. And then, all right, I'll pray the Fatima prayer because, you know, bless the mother Fatima. asked for it. But I just, and then when you know, people say, now let's sing Ave. No, no, no. Someone has to put a stop <laughs> to the many prayers. Yeah, yeah. The length of a rosary within. So I agreed. 100% right. agreed with that. 100% agreed with that. But just think about Catholics who, an aid in meditation, keeping your brain on track yeah. with the rosary, by incorporating scripture, that it then doesn't become monotonous; it becomes no, familiar. No, I can I can totally see what you're saying with mm. the, with the rhythmic thing. Yeah. As, but yeah. but that takes time. Now the Akathis, or not the Akathis, the Jesus prayer. Jesus prayer. Uh, do you ever feel, and especially when you're saying it ten thousand times or whatever the, the they talk about uh-huh. doing, there's a little form of, and I, this is not literally what I'm saying, no, but. I know, yeah. Self hypnosis, you know what I mean? Like you're just saying one thing over and over again. I understand structuring, ordering yeah. your brain, your thoughts, putting to death the monkey brain, all that stuff. Do you ever feel like you know what I mean by self hypnosis? Like you're repeating a mantra to the point where it it like dilutes your thought. Like the first encounter I ever had with the Jesus prayer, the guy said, "I end up praying it in my sleep. I end up praying it in my waking moments." To try to say it ten thousand times, you're saying it all the time. Yeah, let me let me try to respond Please. to that in a way that I haven't thought through. So again, kind of what you just said, like, discussion. Yeah, over instruction. <laughs> so, for example, I think that if you chose to say "I am one with the force" and the force is one with me over yeah. and over again, you you might have the same physiological response. Okay. So um, that was a good throwback to Rogue One. Thank you. Uh, so I don't think that. So if what you're going for in the Jesus prayer is just like this to breathe a certain way and to yeah. feel the certain calmness, then I think that's not the point of the Jesus prayer. Okay. Um, but to repeat these words that encapsulate the gospel, this is who he is, this is who I am in relation to him, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Um, and to not even have the pressure to have to intentionally think on these words as I say them necessarily yeah, uh, that's there, true. There's something f- I don't know. You don't don't agree with me too quickly, but I th- I think there's something in that that is really freeing. Like uh, it's not that you don't tr- you don't intend to just put yourself before the Lord as you pray these things, but the idea that I don't have to feel guilty when I've already prayed like twenty, fifty Jesus prayers and I was thinking about something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is just I don't know, just something uh, very human and beautiful about forcing these words to kind of adapt to the way you naturally breathe such that you find yeah. yourself saying this beautiful prayer even unintentionally. Mm. But your, your it may not even be a criticism, but your thought was, what do you, what do you mean by, am I afraid that it's just self-hypnosis? Like, like, like when I started to try to do it. Mm-hmm. So I said it probably on a retreat, silent retreat, about two, 3,000 times. I felt like words became... A, a nebulous blob. Yeah. And I'm sure if I endured. Yeah. Mm. And I was like, am I trying to trick my brain into, into doing what, something? Though? Into, you know what? That's a good point. Into what? Into into thinking about <laughs> Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the world? Right. Mm. I don't know. It just felt like I was like uh, hitting a mantra where I was getting to nothingness. Yeah. You know, like a mindfulness meditation. Totally. And I think that if you listen to people who know what they're talking about, maybe an Orthodox priest or an Eastern Catholic priest address the Jesus prayer, I think the things that they often address right away is like, this is, these are not magical words yeah, yeah. and the breath doesn't really even matter. It's, yeah. It just like, if you didn't have a rope, then you would use your breath as a way of counting them. Nor mm. does the number of times you pray matter. It's, That's you awesome. know, you're getting lost in the prayer. Yeah. But, I, can, ever, but I think, I think mm. as humans, we love mechanical things. Yeah. Because it, it removes the much more difficult thing of relationship out of it. Mm. So that's why we like the idea of Buddhism and like this special formula. You sit under this tree and you say these things. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. Um, and so maybe people are tempted to think of the Jesus prayer in the way that 
People you know think what I, of Buddhist prayer. You know what I like about what you said? This is what you ever do. You ever listen to audiobooks or podcasts? While <clears throat> yes, you like but remote? I cannot do it. My brain won't let me do it. Oh, that is so sad. I listen to audiobooks on double speed. I know that is you my do. life. So that is, my wife too. Yeah, my so wife loves audio. I love it when I mow. Right, yeah. I'm mowing. I'm not thinking about other than is this straight? It's mm-hmm. kind of straight. Keep going, right? But whenever I'm mowing around the tree, I'm thinking of this one scene that happened in a you know fiction audiobook. I listen to a lot of science fiction, mm-hmm. and it's funny. Like the following week when I mow, that scene will come up. Mm. Right when I get around the tree, and it's like, how cool is it? Just think about this. How cool is it that when I breathe? I'm thinking of Jesus Christ, my savior. Yeah. Or like, or, yeah. Or at least words are coming out and, yeah. then, and then you become attentive to what's happening that you're not even intending. Yeah. I think you've probably heard the story of the time my wife uh, was in, un- uh, she had surgery. I don't know if it was a C-section. I don't think so. But she came out of anesthesia praying the Jesus prayer before she was cognizant of it. Wow. That's, that's kind awesome. of beautiful. There's something yeah. beautiful to me. I'm literally scared of anesthesia because of what I'll say. I'm like, what, <laughs> is that, does that tap into my id? What is happening? My son Noah, when he came out of anesthesia after he had his tonsillectomy, he woke up, he looked around, he looked at the nurse, and he goes, Mom. Hey. <laughs> no, like, he's like, hey. <laughs> and she goes, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's beautiful. I love that. Okay, but I, but you think, won me over. But you I think, won me but over. I think the important thing is, um, I got, I got this theory. I don't know if it's, if it has any weight at all. Sometimes I wonder if that's what podcasts are for. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> sometimes if lay people treat private devotions like liturgy, because. Some bad priests have treated liturgy as if it were their private devotion. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> and it's kind of, oh, it's all kind sorts of, like, of emotions all right, are happening yeah, right you're now. You're going to mess up our liturgy. You're going to take away our altar rails. You're going to you're going to do all this stuff, right? Here's how you're going to freaking well pray the rosary, and we're yeah. going to be very dogmatic about it. You know, what? Uh, you know? we are adding 15 <laughs> different devotions that we should have had at mass. I wonder some. Maybe yeah. that isn't the genesis of it, but I I do, I, I am. That's something that's always yeah. bothered me a little bit when people treat private devotions as if they're kind of things the church says you must do. That's always been a thing oh, that's yeah. bothered me. And I love so that I'm, about I'm, you. I, I, but I'm, so I'm always okay when someone doesn't like a particular devotion because it gives me a chance to be like, cool, yeah. don't like it then. Yeah. Yeah, the thing that always pissed me off, working for the parish, everyone thinks that the thing that saved them is the thing that's going to save you. Yeah. Right? And I remember one guy's like, you have to go on this particular retreat. Yeah. And I said to him, no, I don't. Yeah. And he stopped me and he goes, what do you mean? And I said, I already believe in Jesus. I'm, I've given my entire life to him. I have Christian community. Like, I, I pray daily. Like, I don't, what else am I going to get? Yeah. And he just looked at me and he was like, I, I don't know, but you need to go. I was like, no, you needed to go. And that's beautiful. And I'm glad it was there. Yeah. But I don't, I don't need to go. And that that's true for so many different devotions. I remember when I talked to a priest, he's like, I can't stand the rosary. And I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, give me scripture to meditate on. I go, what about the scriptural rosary? Then I handed him my dad's book full circle. <laughs> that's not true. But yeah, it's, it's all true. So he went I, back in time and became father so-and-so from 1965. Yeah. <laughs> it was 1985, back into the future. Oh, Father Maurice, 1965. Yeah, I yeah, full circle. Well done. I think it was, uh, who who wrote, I think it was Alphonsus de Liguori, who wrote Uniformity with God's Will? Was it conformity him? to God's will? Uniformity with God's will, I believe it is. Uh, probably a Protestant. It, it, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was either that or as Francis de Sales the introduction to, yeah. to devout life, but I think it's the former. And, and he makes the very point you're making, that some people will find great mm. use in a particular devotion, and then they insist that yeah. everybody... That's de Sales, yeah. Is it de Sales? Yeah. Okay. You gotta yeah. leave it. You gotta leave it if it's where's, not beneficial. Whereas the one thing that we can be sure that we are all meant to do, and that is to sort of submit to the will of God, fiat voluntas tua, no matter what happens kind of thing, you know. And liturgy. And liturgy. Liturgy. Yeah. And this is where we go on to the major topic. How did you, this yeah. is, is we, we joked earlier. Do you because, guys want to do the break here? I have you, the mid-roll. Let's do the mid-roll. I need to pee. Yeah, I got to pee too. so bad. My tonsils to are floating. I love it when you say that. Go. Hey, Matt. Yeah. I hear that uh, that June's coming up. What's going on there? Okay, so you might not know this, but June is the month in which Catholics dedicate to venerating the sacred heart of Jesus. And that's it. That's all you're allowed to do in June. You're not allowed to celebrate anything else. You might be looking around and thinking, gee, everybody's celebrating God's covenant with Noah. 
That's not what they're doing. And so we want to take back this month for the Sacred Heart, which is why we've put together this really beautiful t-shirt. It says Reclaim the Month. It's a way to show that we stand in opposition against the sexual debauchery that's being pushed on us and promoted in our society. And instead, we want to turn to Jesus Christ. And it's a great conversation starter. So please click the link in the description below and pick up a t-shirt today. Hey, so I also want to say thank you to Hallo. Hallo is an excellent app that will help you pray and meditate. It's got excellent sleep stories and uh, audio books. If you go to hallo.com slash Matt right now, again, we'll put the link in the description below. Just by signing up over there, you can try the entire app for free for three months. Free. Uh, so after those three months, if you don't like it, you can cancel it. You won't be charged a cent. But I use it and many people I know use it as well. And I think you'll really like it. Hallo.com slash Matt. Now we're back. Now hey. we're back. G'day, 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 g'day. So, <sighs> Matt, we I would just... like us to finish this. Gosh, how amazing tonight. would that be? You want me to start start going now that we're after the... We don't need that cork anymore. <laughs> we don't. We're finishing. Longest podcast. I don't know, dude. It's up to you. I have a high tolerance for whiskey, so you can go if you think you'll be fine, but don't be... Sh don't shoot it! Don't... Don't... You don't shoot that much whiskey. He's in his 20s. He's fine. He's not fine. You and I are old men. We can do this all night. You don't shoot it. Oh, I regret that immediately. That was not a shot size. That was not a shot size. Would that you, was like a triple would shot. Would you promise me that if you actually start to feel it, we end the stream? Because I'm other... fine. All right. Mute, mute your microphone. Don't say Seriously, anything else. Did you just ruin the show? The show? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Yes, so sir. We laughed earlier because you came in here and I, and I made fun of your little Catholic Anglican prayer book. Dude, this book is And I awesome. had the audacity to do that while my little Orthodox prayer book was on the table. And Ugh. I thought, is there a large swath of Catholics who would never come out and <clears throat> criticize the Novus Ordo, but have pretty much given up on it? I think the... I, Cheers. I, yeah. <laughs> I honestly believe for faithful Catholics who are sick and tired of the rad trad dichotomy and all this stuff. I really do think the Eastern churches are going to grow. I think they are yeah. crazy, crazy amounts because of Western Catholics who were like, I, I have a friend in college. The first person I ever met that was Byzantine was an Irish girl 
Irish family who lived in Seattle that said, I can't take this anymore. Uh, crazy masses, silly. This is the death and resurrection of Christ that we are celebrating and nothing matters. Mm. And those are parents. And so they became Byzantine. Everything matters. <laughs> Everything matters. Everything's intentional. Everything's rooted. Yeah. Everything's a thousand years old. The, and the, the continuity, <clears throat> the continuity, that's the thing that bothers me is we think because we've studied something and maybe, you know, in the, in the liturgical movement, we've studied something, we figured, oh, this is when it happened, this is why it happened, this is the reaction of what happened, that then we can say, okay, quarantine it, quantify it, get rid of it. And it's like, no, 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 maybe the Lord used these moments, much like the creed and, and the, the heresy with Arianism and, uh, you know, uh, monophysitism and all this stuff, that that's why we have the creed that we have today. Maybe that's why we have the mass that we have today. Maybe these aren't uh, accretions that have accumulated over time, but things that have narrowed and perfected what we have over time. Mm. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe there are some corrections, a Easter vigil that doesn't start at 10 a.m., but rather at 8.30 p.m. Um, but maybe, maybe we've gone too far. And uh, that going too far lingers in my mind as if tradition is not sacred. Just a quick anecdote about, well, we have a new Melkite mission in town. A priest, I heard, yeah. Yeah, he's doing a marriage and family counseling here for three years. And so the one Melkite bishop of the United States, let's say, let's start a mission. And so every Monday morning, we pray on the third story of what's going to be the coolest brewery you've ever seen. It should mm. be open next year, right? And so we all show Who up. Is this you? No, no, no. I'm not it's saying them. it. Uh, uh, Dave Matthews, not the singer. Jacob Imam, a few other folks. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. It's going It's going to be terrific. In fact, if you're around, I'll, I'll take you through it. It's gorgeous. Anyway, so every Monday morning, 8 a.m., the priest comes. We have the icons set up, the incense, and we're chanting, right? But what just nearly brought me to tears was at the end, all the men line up, and we all walk, and we put our hands out. The priest blesses us, and we kiss his hand. And it's like the humility yeah. of a priest who allows himself to be who he is yeah. now, who doesn't say, call me Jeff. Yeah. And, and that's the hyperbole. That's the yeah. extreme of priests. But it's there's something so remarkable about it. Okay, yeah. so how did you join the Anglican Ordinariate? Well, you or shouldn't call you... it the Anglican Ordinariate. Just oh, call it the Ordinary. See, this shows that you're you're okay. Yeah. Is so, it not called the Anglican Ordinariate? Huh? Is no, that not what it's called? Just call the Ordinary. Okay. Yeah. In in the in, in North America, it's called the Ordinary to the Chair of St. Peter. Okay. Thank you. Redoubling its effort to be founded on Rome. Throw the matches. <laughs> Bam. So, so okay. So, the Ordinary is run out of the, the Cathedral Church. Our Lady of Walsingham is in Houston. And it was the only Houston church. There's Our Lady of the Atonement, which is one of the other early churches. Now, I, I don't have all the history. That's in San Antonio. It's a bunch of churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um Churches all over North America. JP2 started like, hey, when so the idea of it is this Protestantism is a heresy, apostasy, whatever, but also in its flourishing has identified certain principles that are wholly Catholic, but developed maybe in a, in a different way in their different denominations. So you can just think of love of scripture, right? You always talk about that with my Protestant brothers and sisters. That's my invitation of you. It's good. Damn, it's, it's, very uh, good. it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> but the idea is they have gifts mm -hmm. that when they become Catholic, they bring their gifts, mm -hmm. right? Like think of Scott Hahn. Mm -hmm. Scotty, I call him Scotty. Uh, think Scott, when he came into the church, the the revolution that he brought to ordinary Catholics who all of a sudden was like, wow. oh, these six covenants with the seventh being revelation, I now understand the flow of the Bible. And now I understand typology and, mm -hmm. you know, like all this stuff. It's so fascinating. But the, the, this is the thing that the church, that JP2 in his ecumenism was trying to grab hold of, which is like Protestants come into the Catholic church and bring with <laughs> you the great treasures that are in conformity with Catholicism. So he gave limited approval, Benedict gave more approval, and then <laughs> you can kind of call it the Mass of Pope Francis, uh, which is the divine liturgy, what is it called, divine worship, um, the, the liturgy that borrows from three different, three or four different sources. So source number one is the serum, the old serum liturgy. So before the Council of Trent, a lot of local cultures had their own liturgical expression. In England, it was called mm -hmm. the Serum Liturgy. And I'm not an expert on this. I'm just learning this stuff as I go. But the Serum Liturgy was what was happening at the time of the Reformation. 
So think about number one, the predates the Latin Mass. Number two, the Latin Mass of the Roman Rite. Number three, the lectionary of the Novus Ordo. And number four, the treasury of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer mm. that's in conformity with the um, theology of the Catholic Church. Mm. So those elements, Cramner, who's a, a bizarre man, uh, a heretic, burned by Protestants, uh, bounced <coughs> back and forth, ping-ponged from Catholicism to Protestantism, Catholicism and back and forth. He wrote three prayers that are in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer that made it into the ordinary at Mass, the approved Mass of the Ordinary. When I went to my first, it was it was Christmas Eve. It was midnight Mass. It was in a barn. There was no floor. It was dirt. The front had an altar rail and an and a or ad orientum altar and uh, and a cr beautiful crèche, a little nativity scene. And then the choir began the Roman chants began the 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 anglican prayers or not the anglican but the english prayers and hymns and i felt like i felt like that's what the christmas liturgy was for then a girl died oh, God, it kills me kills me talking about this juanita uh she died she went to my church she went to this ordinary parish parents went to the ordinary parish she died tragically. She was riding her bicycle across the street, got hit mm -hmm. by a car. Her pastor, Father Father Fletcher, was was there on the scene till like two, three in the morning. They had the mass at St. Anthony's at my parish, which holds fourteen hundred because their barn holds like one hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. And it was the second largest mass in the history of the ordinary. The first being the ordination of uh, Bishop Lopes at the cathedral mm -hmm. in Houston, and. To know that, the, so I've watched it. It was at our church. We recorded it. We <clears> did it. I have like the <laughs> I wept over this girl's mass because of how beautiful it was. So I interviewed Father Fletcher on Catching Foxes, and I said, "When I saw that, I told my wife, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever become this thing. My Irish grandparents would never want me to, but that's how I want to be buried. That's how I want. I want my funeral mass. I do. If a priest says it's a celebration of life, I don't. <laughs> Damn it, I missed gotcha. it. I missed oh. it. Oh, How did you on your solo? <laughs> All you, over your Orthodox prayer you were being so meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> you were being so meaningful. And I was like, gotta stick on Gomer. Gotta stick on Gomer. No, gotta stick on don't. Gomer. And then that sprays. <laughs> okay, hold on. Time oh, out. Crisis, Nobody crisis else knows here. what happens. We're just yelling. Yeah. It was something about your wild eyes as you said that. I just spat my entire drink across the table. He really did. It was Matt beautiful. just sprayed the entire set with Zevia Ruby. You know what? This is anointed. This is anointed. What did you say? You uh, say it again. We're just going to celebrate their life. We're just going to celebrate their life. Right. And this guy's worried about me having alcohol. <laughs> no, this wasn't alcohol. That's all Zevia. That's Zevia. Zevia. Stevia does that to a man. Oh. <laughs> did you just hold your pinky up? <laughs> I did. I did. Because I'm because I'm a gentleman. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So if a priest ever says, <laughs> right, it's gonna be a celebration of life. It's a, it's <laughs> wild <laughs> eyes. It's, we're gonna celebrate their life. Now here's the deal. Here's the deal with that. I've uh, heard thousands of priests say that when it comes to funeral masses. Um and. So when I brought this up in, in that episode of Catching Foxes of Father Fletcher, I, I told him this, and he goes, I, I want to get back to that. He said, but why do we wear black at a Requiem Mass? Why do Catholics... Why well, should we, yeah. Why do we wear black? And he looked at my buddy Brian, and he said, Brian, you don't know everything about your friend Michael here. Call me Michael. It's weird. Gomer, right? And I said, and, and I was like, I don't know. I send him my dream journal every morning, like whatever. And he said, no, like we all have hidden lives. Right, we all have things that we don't mm -hmm. disclose, even to the people that we love the most. And he said, "That's why we wear black, because we all have secret sins. Yeah, even the sins that we keep secret from ourselves, mm. that we lie to ourselves about. I'm not really that angry. I, I had patience. I didn't really yell at my kid. I was correcting them. You know, yeah, like whatever." Yeah. And he said, "We wear black because no one is perfect, because everyone needs a sacrifice for their sins. Yeah, and the requiem mass is meant to be just that." And I told him, I said, I told my wife, I want to, if I die, I want to be buried that way. He said, Juanita's funeral funeral was the second largest mass in the ordinary history. 
He said, and when I got done with that, a man walked up to me and said to me, we all want to die now so that we can be buried and meet our Lord this way. He said, and six months later, we buried him mm. in St. Anthony's, at St. Anthony's, according to the rites of the ordinariat. Mm. I just met his wife the other day. Mm. Um, I met her for coffee, and we had a long conversation about a bunch of different stuff. And I told her that story, and she said, because I didn't, I didn't know her like that much. And I, and but when she was telling me about herself and her life, and you know, my husband died about you know, blah blah blah. I was like, oh my goodness, this is the man mm -hmm. that father. And I said, can I tell you this story? And I shared it, and she started getting choked up. And she said, there is nothing more beautiful than a requiem mass celebrated well. And you think about all the ways that we tried to make the liturgy personal by making it creative and unique and original and custom mm -hmm. to you and banal, right? <clears throat> and we think that that's speaking to their heart. But the, the reality is when you go to a funeral mass, there's 20 or 50 or 100 or 500 or 1400 hearts there. Mm -hmm. How do you speak to all of them? You do it by not speaking to any one of them, not trying to be folksy and original and cute and like, ah, you know, uh, we better get busy living or we're going to get busy dying, right? Like you don't do crap like that. You do the liturgy. And what the liturgy does, it's, it's, it's abstracted enough that, and it's symbolic enough that people who have no clue why they're there, the atheists who left the church years ago, all of a sudden what is unfolding before them it's true and it's good and it's beautiful. So this is the problem with masses that try to go custom and personal and be folksy and less rigid to deviate from the rubrics is you emphasize your preferences, your interpretation of the rubrics, your style or, or what you think other people need. Not everyone in that room, if you go to a typical Sunday Mass, not everyone is at the same place. But the Sunday Mass, with its words in black and its words in red, actually detach you from that personalism, which actually makes it more personal. See, this is the thing that people don't realize. It becomes more personal, not because the priest is like, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Let me make jokes with the choir director and let me bring my dog up on here in the altar because you, you all know who I am. I got this dog. It was a long story. But... Um, you have these things that we try to make personal, but what we do is we're not hitting every heart. And the liturgy is supposed to hit every heart. That's why it's communal. My personal devotion ought to be, if the rosary isn't my thing, the scriptural rosary, the sung rosary, the whatever, the, your, your pocket guide to the rosary, th it might hit some people's hearts and not others. Good. Then uh, St. Teresa of Avila says, then put it away. Go do something else. When it comes to our devotional life, yeah, that makes sense. It needs to be custom to you. Mm. But our liturgical life is the worship of the church qua church. So if you say to me, well, I don't really like organ music, I'll go, okay, I don't like guitar music. Now that we've canceled out our preferences, where do we go from here? I don't really like your old, old people singing your old hymns. Okay, I don't like your new hymns. Where do we go from here? I don't like praise and worship in the liturgy. Where do we go from here? Or I do like praise and worship and I don't like the hymns. What do we do when we argue over our passions and our preferences? doesn't matter. Screw them. <laughs> right? What matters is what does the church say? What does tradition lay out for us? And that's the thing is like we can advance the tradition when we incorporate it. But then cutting ourselves mm -hmm. off from it, bracketing it, and then saying, well, we're going to do a new thing. That's where I think we get into a whole host of trouble. Mm. That's what I think young people are trying to discover. It's like, oh, for 1,500 years or for 1,900 yeah. years or for 1,965 years, we did this. And now we're doing that. And has it borne fruit? I don't know. So in my heart, the ordinary was like uh, a beautiful middle ground for Protestants who are becoming Catholic. And a thing that never compromised its Catholicity. Mm. It was a thing that for traditionalists... They could have access to without ever compromising. I'm still laughing. Sorry, That's, this is going to happen. <laughs> no, it's you beautiful. Get serious. Yeah, no, I got gotcha. celebration of life. <laughs> <laughs> but think about all of those tropes. Like, for instance, yeah. okay, when people say, "Here's a," so it's, it's a meme. A meme originally means a mental virus, right? When people who don't read the same things you read say the same things, you know, there's a mental virus. So mm. when you you can talk to a thousand different priests from a thousand different backgrounds, and they'll say, "Well, I wear white because it's a celebration of life. It's resurrection." You say, yeah, but the church has always worn black because it's a celebration of penance and forgiveness and mercy in Christ Jesus. So we wear black. The black is a sign of penance, 
right? Yeah. So then you say, well, why are you wearing white? Well, the church permits us to. Okay. I, I have no problem with you wearing white. But the tradition is to wear black because in the Western church that we belong to, black symbolizes mourning, but mm-hmm. it also symbolizes penance. Principally, it's penance. <clears throat> so the problem becomes like you hear these people say, saying, well, I don't like that kind of music. Why don't you like it? Well, it's not vibrant. It's not life giving. So what you mean is it's not emotionally satisfying to my desires. And because it's not emotionally satisfying to my desires, it's therefore illegitimate. And the question becomes, is that the point of the liturgy? Right, the liturgy should not, now your personal devotional prayer life should be that thing. It should be like clicking with you. But the liturgy is something different. You should be clicking with it. And that's the fundamental problem that I don't think, that I don't think a lot of Catholics understand because they haven't been exposed to enough really solid traditional liturgy. Mm -hmm. And by traditional, I don't just mean Latin, right? I mean chanted liturgy, Mm -hmm. right? So uh, when I went to the ordinary and they chanted everything and they, they sang the old hymns and they, they wove chant and they wove the Latin and they wove the English, I just sat there two and a half hours or uh, two hours for a Sunday mass. And I looked at my kids and my kids did not freak out. Yeah. Every so often I'll send them to a bathroom break. The youngest yeah. he's, he's a squirrely bastard, but uh, I'll be like, go, go take a bathroom break. It's too much incense. Like you can't even see the priest. There's so much incense. <laughs> so you know they're doing it right. Yeah. So yeah. your family's taken to it. Yeah, so we now belong to the ordinary of the church. So you have to request, you have to send in all the stuff to the chancery. You have to send in your confirmation certificates, me and my wife. We, I did the same thing. That's why I'm Ukrainian Catholic now. Are you yeah. Ukrainian? Nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It was one this, day, one day, yeah. you'll be Ukrainian Catholic, not Ukrainian Greek Catholic, right? Is it's, that the hope? What? It's Ukrainian Greek Catholic, yes, isn't it? Yes, that's true. Yes, I see because what you it's, mean. Yeah. But this, how many is there? Thirty-two Eastern churches. There are twenty-two Eastern churches, 22. and there's one Western, and the Western has several <laughs> rights. Twenty-two, yeah. right? So, it, but it's it's, I don't know. I mean, whether I was to be Ruthenian or Melchiah to, yeah. it didn't matter to me. Yeah, we went to a Ruthenian in Atlanta, and I got to know Father Jason very well here, and so we went through the whole. Father process. Jason is awesome. He's terrific. Uh. Uh, I just went to Ukraine with him. Yeah. And that man is wild. Well, I love the episode where the war started and you guys go to the orphanage and that was cool. trying to get the old yeah. orphans. Yeah. We were in um, Hagia Sophia that's been uh, turned into a mosque into by a the museum. Mohammedans. Yeah. And we were very close to celebrating divine liturgy in secret within there. And I'm happy to say that it was Father Jason who chose not to, not me. I'm very proud of myself about that. He's like, he's like, we've got all this money and stuff to bring to Ukraine. Can we? I don't want to get arrested. Fair enough. Prudence. But wouldn't Prudence. that have been cool? <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure people have done that. Don't you think people have done that? I hope so. Yeah. The the last example of, we have of someone celebrating divine liturgy in secret in Hagia Sophia, I think, was around the Second World War. Don't quote me, but but uh, and he got away with it. But it was a big thing. Yeah. So I don't know, but um, the ordinary, it's, it's a peculiar thing. I, I, I remember sitting there and my biggest struggle <clears throat> with it was not its liturgy. It's not Cramner writing the three principal prayers um, that are said in mass, right? Cramner, right? He's a heretic. He's an apostate. He's a bastard. But uh, it was, in fact, I actually have those three prayers printed in my mm. and hanging framed in my office. Beautiful. And I had no clue about their origin until I had that conversation. I just thought, this prayer of humble access. This so, is well, beautiful. Let me, let, let, yeah. This is such a podcast question. Let me ask you this. <laughs> wow. Well, well, let, let me ask you this. Um, yeah. What is the future of the Novus Ordo in the Roman Rite if, in, oh, a, in America? Yeah. No, if, I, if I can you, tell you that right okay. now. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I don't know because, um, have you ever read... And I wonder how insulting a question like that must be to a faithful priest who celebrates. I don't mean to be offensive. I don't think it's offensive. Yeah. I think this is the question that we're all asking okay. since Traditionis Custodi, since yeah. Pope Benedict allowed the extraordinary and ordinary form. The 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 Latin rite was never, the Roman rite was never, um, was never told to stop being performed, right? And so... People who flock to the Latin Mass were flocking to some that's our inheritance. The fact that it's like 11 to 13 percent of the original prayers of the Latin Mass were preserved into the Novus Ordo. The Novus Ordo wasn't finished when it was proclaimed. Now I'm not a part of I'm not a rad trad. I'm not a part of some radical Latin community or anything. I don't go to Latin Mass. I haven't been to it in years. 
So I, mean, I, got, I don't have a dog in that hunt in particular, but the reality is Eucharistic prayer number two was written in haste, right? It was written, half of it was composed in uh, a, an Italian restaurant right before it was approved. There was a lot of duplicity involved in it, but the biggest shock of it, right, was the actual address of St. Paul the Sixth on uh, in, in 1969 to the Italian bishops, the Italian faithful, right before Advent. And it was this famous address that he gave where he said, okay, it's happening. And he goes through, and it's it's not a very long letter. And he goes through and he explains the things that are going to happen because of it. You're not going to like the fact that Latin is going away. And you know, blah, blah, blah. And he lists a whole bunch of stuff. And the first maybe, I'm going to say it's like, you know, a four paragraph intro and then a six paragraph. Here's all the horrible things that are going to happen. And then it's like somewhere around paragraph 11, 12, 13, where he's like, but this is the reason why the evangelization of the nations. Now, let me ask you, have the nations been evangelized by the Novus Ordo? Hmm. That's a big question. It, I, I mean, is it really a, statistically? I, I, well, it's a big question because I grew up in Australia and now I live here. Yeah. I don't, I don't see. You see more or less people going to mass than you did in the 50s, 60s, 70s. No, I, I'm with you. I, I'm just trying to give, like, if I just base it on my account and not mm -hmm. anything I've heard or read. Yeah, I live in a different epoch, don't I? I mean, I grew up in a a, a kind of lazy, fair, uh, yeah. nervous auto community that was. But is that a feature or a bug? Right. See, this is the thing: is when you go to those Novus Ordo communities that take the tradition seriously, yeah. they they do what I think I want to say. It's general instruction on the Roman Missal, paragraph forty two. I think that's what it is. Where basically says the the key to interpreting all this stuff is the Roman <clears throat> Rite. So if you don't know what's going on, grab the Roman Rite and do that. Right. How many places yeah. do that? How many churches have communion patents when you receive Holy Communion? Right. You know, how many places do the, the you know, all, all the different things that happened during the Latin Mass? And you realize, well, that's a, a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Mm -hmm. This is the question is, is the weeks, uh, how did you phrase, like the, the happy-go-lucky Novus Ordo yeah, experience? Yeah, the laissez-faire. Laissez-faire, yeah. right. Any, anything goes. Um, is that the standard? Or is that the exception? No, that's the standard. That's the standard. Yeah. And then the question is, why? Right? See, that's the thing that kills me. I'm not saying uh, in please. Okay, this is the part of the disclaimer of the podcast where I say, just like Scott Hahn said in, in your interview with him, I do not believe that Nova Order is evil or wrong or demonic or not the sacrifice of Christ on the cross or any of that stuff. Okay, I believe it's a worthy and a good mass and when celebrated correctly. At the same time, what we lost in the transition. Right. There was a, a, a middle ground in 1967 of a missile that took into account uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium from Vatican II mm -hmm. and tried to preserve the very best of the Roman Rite. Because they didn't think they were getting rid of the Roman ritual from the, the Tridentine mm -hmm. Mass. They didn't think they were doing that at all. By 69, they did. And they said, What's going to happen? Men are going to leave the church. Have men left the church? Mm -hmm. They laughed when they said that. Wow. Yeah. Latin's going to disappear. Latin's going to disappear. Latin's never going to disappear. Latin disappeared. Reverence for the Eucharist is going to go away. Has reverence for the Eucharist gone away compared to a, a, a Latin mass? So for me, joining the ordinary is not joining a reactionary group anti Novus Ordo. We have the Novus Ordo lectionary. We have you know all sorts of stuff. It is seeing the best of the English tradition, which is incredible, mm -hmm. that as an Irishman I don't want to give credit for. <laughs> Crap. I do not at all want to give credit for. But in seeing it and, and actually starting to study it, the Newmans and before, you realize like there is a cultural heritage here that is worth preserving. So what's the future of the Novus Ordo in America, do you think? Uh, I think, uh, well, not one, I think the people who are most serious are going to join Latin communities mm -hmm. or they're going to join the Ordinariate or they're going to join Eastern communities. That's what I think, I too. think I think people are exhausted over, I, I, the people who are listening to me who are like, well, but, uh, I think we're all exhausted from the liturgy war, but we're not getting help, right? Our experience at the universal church is the local priest. And if his experience and training, right, we, we fall to the level of our training, we don't rise to the occasion. If his training in seminary was everything before 1967 or 65 was evil or inadequate, then, then he has a hostility to tradition. So what's the hope in building that up? You know, there's a famous story of, of these um, 
Cyril Malabar, Indian nuns. There was a, a, a rite that was, they were buried according to the Novus Ordo. And these Cyril Malabar nuns who were serving, they're by ritual and they're serving at this church. They're burying this man and a lot of people were there in the parish and they, they felt deeply saddened. And the nuns began a chant in the Cyril Malabar tradition. And every person in the room just, or in, at, at the gravesite just froze. And no one moved. No one left. Because they realized something holy is happening here. And this is what sacred music is. Mm -hmm. Sacred music is things that come from the liturgy and are for the liturgy. Religious music is things that come from our religious experience and is to foster our religion, but not necessarily the liturgy. And so chant and all these things, they're all meant mm -hmm. to be something that, that builds up and aggrandizes the glory to God, not like building a bridge for me and all that stuff. Well, then, in order for dioceses to exist and to remain are they going to have to either get serious what, what are they going to have to do like if you're a bishop right now and yeah. you're overseeing a particular diocese is there a future for the novus order as it is i think there is a future but not as it is not a, not as it is in the lackadaisical hey come one come all let's do this like no no there's no future in that because yeah. okay so this is what we did so here's the secular world and most of our people are there Right, and here's the church. Here's heaven. Here's yeah. the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So the church is is we're gonna build a bridge. And that, that was the intention of Vatican II. We got to meet modern man mm. where modern man is in order to bring him to where the kingdom of God is. But this is what we did. We then moved the church to the bridge. Right. I mean, think about Matt Marr. I love Matt Marr personally, physically. No, <laughs> I love Matt. Matt had this line where he talked about why did he write mass parts that have a little bit of Latin? <laughs> I hope that becomes the clip. The, that's a clip. That's a clip. Thank sure. you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I asked him before the show to say one ridiculous thing for a short. Oh, that's that's he's, barely it. That's yeah. barely it. Buckle up. But he said, like, I use Latin and, and English, right? When he does, on you stay, you take away, mm -hmm. you know. He said, uh, because the goal, the, the highest ideal of the church is chant in Latin, which is unaccompanied by music. So when I do the Agnus Dei, I do it a little bit of Latin, a little bit of English, and my band, we drop out. So you sing it in, in, the, in the Latin, you're unaccompanied singing. To me, that's a bridge. That's saying, hey, here's the contemporary music that you like, because Matt Marr's a badass. Here's chant that you've never heard, and so it's difficult. So let me build a bridge. Okay. But what for most churches, they move the church to the bridge and they just live there. There is no bridge. It's it. It's done. We're, we're going to do rock and roll Jesus and that's all we're ever going to do. Mm. Good luck. You know? And so the problem is when we ape the culture, why are we shocked that most of our people leave the church for the culture? Why are we shocked at that? We are hemorrhaging people. So would you like to see the current Novus Ordo... I mean, have you been to a Novus Ordo Mass at Orientum, Old oh, Rails, so many. celebrated in Latin? Yeah. They're beautiful. Is yeah. that what you would want to see happen? Yeah. Is that what but, you but think? But is that the standard? See, that's the problem is what would take to get at the standard? Half of the people, uh, almost all the people in almost all the churches in America would leave. Mm -hmm. Would leave the church if it went to Latin Novus. Uh, you do <laughs> at Orientum, I, I guarantee you a, a fifth of the people will leave the church. And we had a guy who was so angry that kind of sort of the back of the chair of the priest blocked some people out. How dare you? I thought this was an inclusive church. And it's like, it's, a, it's a kind of a church in the round. So, some but people are going to be blocked. Is no. there a point in which, though, we just have to, bishops and priests are going to have to bite that bullet yep. for the sake of good liturgy? Yeah. I think two things yeah. would enhance reverence to the Eucharist in the current Novus Order. Ad Orientum and Altar Rails. You do this, and a third is communion patents. Not sure. one crumb should touch the floor. No, of course. Yeah. I mean, think about think about that catechetically. Yeah. Not one crumb should touch the floor because this is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Altar rails. You and I should receive on our <coughs> knees before our Unless Lord. Unless you're in the east, but totally. <laughs> you should receive with a spoon. Right? What do they call That's the spoon? True. What do they call it? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you're so Ukrainian. You got to come up with a Ukrainian or a, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, but, but what's the idea behind that? 
is the priest's hands are consecrated specifically to give you the Eucharist in, in a certain mode, mm -hmm. right? We offer the holy sacrifice of the mass and then we give you holy communion. You are coming forward to the altar. You're coming forward to the sanctuary. You're mm -hmm. coming forward to heaven. This is a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. So in, in the West, you fall on your knees, which is a sign of not just penance, which it is in the East that we share in the East, but also a sign of adoration. Yeah. I'm on my knees before the Lamb of God. So I surrender everything and I receive, so not I, I take. Yeah, I think at this point there would be people who would attend the Latin Mass and go, okay, this is, I, I appreciate the fact that you're trying to increase the reverence, but you're not going nearly far enough. What you have to agree to is that all of the modern uh, variations that have crept into the liturgy have to be killed. We have to admit that this was all one big mistake and just go back. So here's what I actually think. Okay, so if, if, if I'm viewing this whole so thing. So the idea is you're not enlightened enough. You're not yeah. yet. Yeah, you're, Red -pilled all enough. modern, all yeah. modernism, all the turns are, are wrong turns. A lot of people who were alive in the 50s and 60s and talk about the church at the time say, I never heard about a loving God. <clears throat> you and I have never not heard about a loving God, right? <laughs> Too much. Too much. Like, God, <laughs> <get> okay. It. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. God is love. But is he? Uh, yes, he is. But the, the, the idea of it is, what if we went through this to recover the essential nature of God? The God is for us, not against us. That God the Father actually desires that all should be saved. That Jesus Christ died and poured his blood out for you and for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. So what if this time of, you could say, softening of the church's justice and, 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 and strict um, rubricization and all that stuff. What if it was a time to say, hey... Like, like the letter to the church in Ephesians and book of Revelation, you've forgotten your first love. You got all these things that are wonderful, but you've forgotten your first love and you're going to go to hell for all eternity because you've forgotten that. That's my paraphrase. Uh, what if you have everything perfect? Th this is the thing. What if your Latin mass is 100% perfect, but you don't love people and you don't love God? You're going to go to hell forever. So what if God is willing to pull back? Mm. And now this is just me sheer conjecture so that if we return you know uh dr kwasniewski's uh the once and future mass right what if we return mm. to the latin mass but we don't abandon the love that we have that we recovered right because so many people i mean my parents were like you know you never heard of the love of god it was all judgment 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 so what if we had the love of god in the latin mass then all of a sudden the things that are actually in the Latin Mass. And this is the thing you find about Latin Mass communities. They go out of their way. Like you look at the the Mass for the Ages uh, mm -hmm. videos. Yeah. Like they're going out of their way to point out these things. Look at the love of God in every verse, and every paragraph. You repent because God loves you and he's merciful. You don't repent because I'm a judge. Right? Like you repent because he's merciful and he loves you. Mm -hmm. Right? So if, if that recovers with the Latin Mass, don't you think the church would be amazing? Yes. And that's what the ordinary it is to me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. You know, uh, Reverend, uh, what's his name? Calvin? Who? What, what's his name? Robinson. Robinson. Yeah, Calvin Robinson. I loved the Oxford thing. Mm -hmm. Broke my heart when he made that comment about the ordinary in, in London. Yeah, yeah. And you called him a coward. It's fine. Uh, no, but the, I called him. A yeah, coward. no, he was like, oh, was cowardly because he uh. he said like two days before. So I don't know anything about that. I can't speak to any of that except for the fact that he made some oh, political. Oh, right. No, the priest. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. the bishop said that he can't go into his yes. church to do that Christmas thing. But he, I don't know. <laughs> I've been, I thought about this in the shower today. Uh, if, if this conversation came. <laughs> I think about you a lot in the shower. <laughs> you and Matt Mar. You you Mar Thursday. Uh, no, but <laughs> but the idea is he, he or they're not the idea is he said right before he prefaced that with he wrote an article defending so and so as not being the racist everyone thinks he is and I'm like mm. well that's probably <laughs> can you imagine being like well actually the head of the Ku Klux Klan is not as racist as he, I'm not saying that's what he did but like be like oh. I'm going to distance myself from you. <clears throat> however, however, um, the ordinary it has for me recovered. My kids, they go to liturgy. My, We go to other masses and all these different churches because I travel, try to take them with me. And they'll say, why did they do that? Why mm. did they do what? Well, why did they play that song? That's a silly song. That's mm. not that's not appropriate for the church. Right? They'll say these things all the time. I never, I never talk about liturgy with my kids. And Pope Benedict was right. Good liturgical catechesis is liturgy done well. When Father Fletcher or Father McCain celebrate liturgy at Church of the Presentation, Presentation of the Lord Catholic Church, when they celebrate it, no one thinks it's all about them. Not, not for an instant. 
Mm -hmm. When you when you go to your Ukrainian whatever it is this thing <laughs> sacred liturgy weird Muslim Orthodox <laughs> thing you do yeah when you go there do people sit there and think wow Father nailed it today mm -hmm. or do you just think oh that was the divine liturgy yeah he just did what he was supposed to do yeah the more original we are as pr the more original priests are the, the less they are, are yeah. well, the more alienating because we're appealing to preferences but also think about this the priest in the person of Christ this is from for Father Robert Hugh Benson. Am I becoming preachy? You warned no, me about I, this. No, but I'm enjoying. You warned me about this. <laughs> <laughs> you got. <coughs> that was right in my mouth. Um, <laughs> this microphone. Um, you, <laughs> Father Robert Hugh Benson says uh, that the priest is an ambassador for Christ. So think about when you need to go to a priest. Mm -hmm. If you uh, have you ever needed to go to yes. a priest, what do you Frequently. go to him for? Jesus, mercy. Right, right there, done. <clears throat> you go to him. Precisely where he is imitati or where he's a persona Christian. I'm not going for Ralph. Or, you know. <laughs> now you might be friends with Ralph, yeah. but you're not. But I don't need to see Ralph. <laughs> I don't need Ralph. <laughs> Ralph's just there. <laughs> right? But you're going for Christ, and this is his whole point: is if he's an ambassador of reconciliation. Think about this: if he's an ambassador, an ambassador for the king shares the message of the king to the people. Now imagine if he decided to share his own message. Yeah. Right, you don't have any right to use that right, language. Right. You share the original message, the original gospel, the original proclamation. You don't have any right to make it your own or to do something original or creative or whatever. Now, within the message, be creative, be original, be whatever. But you occupy this space. Mm -hmm. So when we create something or we allow, so the Novus Ordo, I don't think is evil, intrinsically evil, it's just stupid crap like that. I don't think that at all. But if bishops attack traditionalists or conservatives more than they do whack jobs doing crazy wackadoodle things with the liturgy to me it says i favor ra uh creativity originality and i favor a pot uh not a posse what, what's the word i'm looking for banality or whatever more than i fa preferentialism mm -hmm. what i call the iron law of vague sentimentality if it makes a grandmother go oh that was nice you can never remove it from the liturgy again <laughs> right versus rubricism Versus obedience to what the church asks for you. So right? how are you going to endure the masses that will be celebrated here at the Franciscan Subville conferences? Oh, man. Can I tell you how? Yes. Okay, number one, I know everyone's heart's in the right place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful people who love the Lord. Number two, I go to mass. No matter when mass will be, I kneel down. Or I sit there, and I open up this prayer book. Now, this is a St. Gregory prayer book. Anyone can buy it. I got it on Kindle as well. <laughs> it's not mine. Yeah. Uh, it's the ordinary prayer book. Um, I read the prayers before Mass, and I read the prayers before Communion. And as I go, I go to this little red piece, which is where the Divine Liturgy is, mm -hmm. and I open it up, Divine Worship, and I read the unique parts. Mm -hmm. And as I sit there, and I take in every word from the homily that the bishop is going to preach... There's a I, lot of them usually. Yeah, I take it all in, and I love it. Because here's the deal. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to work through his instruments. And I'm not afraid of even where our fig leaves and our humanity and our need to be loved and need to be creative and need to be, oh, whiz bang, you know. Of course, we all have that. Okay. I have <laughs> I have no problem with any of that. Mm. <clears throat> in this, I, I, go to, I don't belong to a traditional Latin mass community, right? I can feel that, but when I am most at home mm -hmm. is when the priest is most disappeared. So then wouldn't that be something that you would encourage people at, at this conference or some other conference to, I mean, it's not really your place to do it. It's not really their If it's place in my talk, I always to do it. To. I always do it. I always do it. I talk about this ad nauseum, right? Ladies and gentlemen, you are here for the liturgy. The liturgy is here, is not here for you. In in the sense of it's here to cowtail to what your needs, desires, so then, and, and yet you're going, you're going, and and this isn't me criticizing Franciscan. These Why are you criticizing Franciscan? These, these conferences have brought more people to Christ than we could ever hope to, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet uh, they're going to be playing praise and worship music. Yeah. So, what's your opinion on that? And have you thought yeah. about bringing this up to people to maybe change? Because I think one thing that Augustine Institute does really well is they try to play sacred music at the yeah. divine liturgy at the holy mass yeah you know one of the things i wish they would do is across the board integrate the antiphons pre-mass you know the beginning of mass communion antiphon um josh blakesley does that really well when i was at um i'm trying to think it was in Sumville, mid-america he did 
because he was used to be at my parish mm-hmm. and he would do these antiphons and his and he has such a beautiful voice mm-hmm. and he would sing these antiphons and the funny thing was so I'm you know as the speakers we always sit near the priests in these stadium seatings and I see the priests and all the younger priests just they literally just see their shoulders go ah as the antiphon is being sung mm-hmm. when was the last time you went to a Novus Ordo Mass and the antiphon was sung I think every uh, gosh are you trying to get me fired from the sumo conferences I think every every Mass should have the antiphons. We should be diving deep into that. When praise and worship starts. Or just guitars. Yeah. Guitars. Drums. Yeah. I, I don't like any of it. Right. I don't. And increasingly, I don't think, I think most people are like you. I think most people I think are most like younger people are, not all, yeah. not all. It's really, it, it, the, the kind of divide is like really, really good Matt Marr praise and worship or the older stuff, the chant and the, and the hymnody. Um, but what we keep getting is 1970s <laughs> you know, shenanigans, you know, and I can't take that anymore. No, but that's not what's happening at these masses. At the sumo, no, but the sumo masses are, are, are largely, the youth conference yeah. masses are largely the Matt Marr style yeah. stuff. And I, I mean, I'm fine with that because I know he's faithful and then the lyrics are going to be faithful. The moment mm. they're not is the moment that I say something. I've, I've said something every, every year. So you're willing to take a certain amount. Yeah. Because oh, absolutely. Because I can't is, control the mass. Right. I'm not in charge of it. Right. Yeah, that's right. But when I see things happening that are good, I immediately affirm it. When I see things that happen that are contrary to the faith, I'll, mm. I'll deny it. But I also know, like, I'm, I'm in, I'm, a, I am a charismatic. I'm a tradismatic. You mm-hmm. could say that. I do see myself as someone who is in line with the vision of of the youth conference. Like, I love them mm-hmm. because I've seen how they work. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, those kids being in that arena, and all of a sudden. You know, like a spare Jace May having a priest going and, and sprinkling holy water. You know, I, I don't know how that would fit and I don't know how ready they would be for it. But I will tell you this. When we've had at, at different parishes experiences of old school tradition, people, because it, it ignites their senses. It takes them yeah. to be as they are human persons. No, I think they would love it. I really I do. I Thank you for saying that. A, yes, that's exactly. A Latin mass with 800 teens, I think they would find it absolutely overwhelmingly beautiful. I think they would, would find elements beautiful. I think they would find elements un- alienating. See, this is the thing about us, right? We've um, Music educates our, you know what St. Paul said, uh, their God is their stomach. The thumos mm-hmm. in Greek is mm-hmm. like your loins, your guts, your stomach, our, our most base desires. So if I've educated your most base desires and you buried your father to on Eagle's wings Mm -hmm. and I, and I'm a priest and I say on Eagle's wings is a joke of a song. Well, you're going to hate me for the rest of your life because your, your desires have been educated. Your the fact that you buried your father to that, like we Mm -hmm. need to have to be pastorally sensitive that the last 60 years we've exposed people to hymns that even the USCCB's congregation for the doctrine of the faith said is immoral, says is, is, is heresy. Right, Catholic hymnals with the Neil Absat imprimatur. The are you familiar with this? The the CDC, the CDF, excuse me, of the USCCB has said, here's eight principles. You need to judge every song, but there are a lot of songs that are heresy in Catholic hymnals. Mm-hmm. There's a, a wonderful article called uh, "All Our Welcome Is No Longer Welcome in Catholic Parishes," right? Because it's heresy. The things that they are saying right before we receive communion, we say wine. Come on, it's not wine. It's the blood of Christ. Anywho. Mm-hmm. So I would say that I'll, we've educated people and we've educated their desires to have a visceral reaction against tradition. Let us build a house <laughs> where go. love can dwell. That's a different set of glasses. What about those glasses? Well, I tell you what, here's what happened. <laughs> so whenever I go to places, I usually forget my glasses. And so I'll buy whatever cheap glasses happen to be on the rack, whether mm. that be at a drugstore or a used bookstore and so one day these are all that i had so i put these on this morning for my locals morning coffee podcast and someone <laughs> said you look like you're about to play canasta <laughs> isn't that brilliant oh that is Did awesome I say that right is it canasta yeah yeah canasta can i you- can i tell you a joke i saw in the chat uh yeah. on two days ago uh-huh. that i thought was hilarious so i put these on so i get made fun of less <laughs> go for it somebody said so you look like rand paul now uh-huh Somebody said that it was interesting that Rand Paul was interviewing Ann Coulter on Pints with Aquinas. <laughs> That's good. Oh, <laughs> come on. That's, she looked nothing like Ann Coulter. I mean, but I will tell you that hair. when you put those other glasses on, right. do they work the same as those? Yeah. Okay. You know who you look like? Who? The man with the horned rim glasses. My grandma. 
<laughs> no, from from Heroes. You remember I, season one and two no, of Heroes? No, what do I happen to see it? You're, you're the monster. man. Is that what? Well, yeah, the man with the horn rim glasses horn from Heroes. Horn rim. God, it's the worst. Can't uh, believe you don't know. That. Oh, that fella. Heroes season one and two were the best. Season three, four, five, and etc. were terrible. It was the writer's strike. Is that right? I don't give a care if it was your mom's strike. <laughs> it was the worst ever okay. after that. No more bourbon for you. Uh, How are you doing Zivia. over there? I feel, I feel great. Don't okay. tech. Then you can have more if you need it, but <laughs> You can have more if you need it. <laughs> I need it. I all right, let's it. read these lyrics. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children's tell how hearts learn to forgive. Do you understand the heresy that's already mentioned? What, uh, look, well, and I, what I, you've already read. Okay, let me see. Let us build a house. So much of it's like, it's poetry, so it's difficult to nail it down. It's not Who talk. does the building? Us. Yeah. Bastards. Right. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 16? I, I will build my church. Yeah. Right? Keep going. All right. This is good. You can put out all the heresies to this. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, saints and children tell. Children are savages. We should they be are. listening yeah. to them. You're a terrible person. I, my, what did my son say to me one time? He's like, built uh, of hopes uh, and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here, the love of Christ shall end divisions. Didn't he say? It? Oh, he came not well. Well. Okay. <laughs> think not. I have come to bring peace, but rather I have come to bring the sword of division. I will let us Father build Higgins. a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek. To dream God's reign anew. Hmm. Here the cross shall stand as witness and a symbol of God's grace. Here is one we claim the faith of Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. I'm going to play it. I'm that's a good song, though. Uh, I mean, that, that last verse, that's good. Does it? No. We can't. Dude, if we you. get banned because of the USCCB, or uh, we whoever, have done this for three USCCB, hours. We better. <laughs> does the USCCB have the copyright? Oh, no. Welcome. No. Who has the copyright? I have no idea. Gaia? Guy is what I call. Do you know what the original name of GIA was? The house where love can dwell. Marty Hogan conquers all. A place where saints and children tell our hearts learn to. I know the death penalty is supposed to be inadmissible. <laughs> <laughs> Only in the new catechism. Oh, no. No, but Hogan and Haas, right? David Haas has already been canceled. He's out of there. Uh, Marty Hogan is a Lutheran. And when you go to his Lutheran bio on his Lutheran website for his Lutheran <laughs> hymnals, it says this music is only played in liberal Lutheran and Catholic churches. Right. So when you start to think about this stuff, um, I think it's Hogan. Um, you start to think about what comes from the liturgy and returns to the liturgy, not just what has biblical themes. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when you go to the sanctuary of God, what should be there is the scenes of the crucifixion or scenes of heaven. Right. Why? Scenes of the crucifixion and scenes of heaven. Because Why? this is what's taking place in the liturgy. Exactly. It's the re it's a sacrifice of Christ. Oh, you weren't kidding. It's Gaia Publications. Huh? You were not G -I -A. kidding. G-I-A. It's, it's Gaia Publications. Gaia Publications is my derogatory pronunciation. G-I-A is the name. And do you know what it originally stands for? Gregorian Institute of America in response to the Pope's call that every parish... This is still the acronym? Four, yeah, yeah. Gregorian Institute of America... The 19 teens, 20s, that every parish have a Gregorian chant choir, basically a scholar. Oh. And so they formed to do this. And then the 60s happened. Oh. And then they became Gaia, right? <laughs> and so wh what happens? Th this is what I'm saying. So, so many people argue, but the bishops allow it. It, it must be allowed. Yeah. It, it must be a part of the church. Like, why would so many bishops and priests and whatever do it? And it's like, because this is the zeitgeist. This is the spirit of the age. If the USCCB is saying, in Catholic hymnals with Catholic Neil Absats right. have non or anti Catholic hymnody, then maybe we should say, whoa, then what kind of hymnody ought we to have? Mm -hmm. Chant is important for a couple reasons. One, it's ancient. Two, it belongs to the, its ancientness means it belongs to the patrimony of the church. Three, it's non metered, it's not based on beats. Which means it doesn't emotionally manipulate you. Beats, right? You remember the old the old slave ships like Ben Hur mm -hmm. rowing, boom, 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 and then you go faster, boom, 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 ramming speed, right? We do this. The beat, the drum sets the tone, and it causes an emotional response within us. The idea of unmetered means 
it's detached from a rhythm and it's attached to the importance of the words. Mm. So in Catholic liturgy, chant follows the word, the word proclaimed. So the most important words get an emphasis, whether it's an uptick or a downtick or, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about music, but it's that notion of those words that are like, that speak of the most, the most important word in the sentence gets emphasized. Mm -hmm. The least important or whatever gets monotonized. And so when we say like, um, you know, whatever, like when we're doing Gregorian chant, the purpose is also it's sung at a level that everyone in the room can sing. Right? How many times have you been a part of the song where it's only the people in the band mm -hmm. that can sing? My big thing is when we determine liturgy via vibrance and vibrance via how the music makes me feel, mm -hmm. we are alienated completely from the gospel because what we're doing is we're leading with emotions and we're asking the church to conform rather than leading with the word of God proclaimed and then letting our music and thus our participation be informed from that. Great thoughts, really, really. I mean, think about the thing about your Eastern liturgy. Yeah, thinking about it. Right, they Men go behind the, the <laughs> iconostasis. Right. You don't see them, but you hear them. Mm -hmm. In the Latin church, you don't hear them, or you don't, uh, you see them, them, but you don't hear them. Mm -hmm. Because largely the, the, the Eucharistic prayer is silent in the Latin mass. So you split the difference. One is yeah. seen, but not heard. The other one's heard, but not seen. This is the, the idea of like, I can participate Without saying like every word yeah. in the mass. Pope Benedict said the problem with the Novus Ordo is it's too didactic. It's all about yeah. teaching and interaction. Yeah. What if I don't feel like it? Am I no longer fully consciously and actively participating? There's so many problems. So many problems. But I do know this. That people who have conversions because of it mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're not authentic conversions. People who fall in love with Christ because of a praise and worship song. Beautiful. Even if it's sung at mass, they listen to it at home. I don't care. Beautiful. Jesus Christ can save anyone at any time because he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. I am not. If I was, it would be a horrible place <laughs> if I was God. So don't fret that you love some praise and worship song, unless it's by Bethel, then you should be nervous. Uh, you need to research that shit. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, the idea is like Christ can work with anything. The, the Holy Spirit can work with anything. But the Holy Spirit preserves the liturgy for a reason and your devotional life for a reason. And that's why I love the ordinary. <laughs> this book, you can see this book, touch this book. I've Just got touch the it. book at home. Yes. Just touch I'm it. Touch, I'm touching it. You know why it. you're touching? You know what you're touching? What? You're touching almost every sacred site in Jerusalem. Really? And in Israel. Oh, Besides the sites that I missed because I was pooping in the uh, <laughs> in the hotel because I got a horrible disease in Jordan. Oh, I went to the Holy Land. Have you ever been? Not yet. You oh, dude. Everybody says that. No, 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 no. It's like when I say I haven't watched Casablanca yet. Oh, come on. Frankly, my dear, I just don't give a damn. Me, can we go together? I mean, <laughs> me, you, your wife, my wife, and probably Jeff Cavins because he goes to everything. I'm open to dude. it. I and <laughs> he's upset. Thursday, no. <laughs> Oh, you no, know, right. you're 20 something. You don't count. <laughs> but when I was on the deck of a boat on the Sea of Galilee, uh -huh. and Magdala was here, <laughs> Capernaum was here, and all of the three synoptics, info, I just wept like a child. There's a lot uh. of crying in my narrative. <laughs> this touched everything the Mount of Beatitudes. All right, everything. listen, we need to change subjects because I asked my local supporters if oh. they would give us example for 10 minute topics. I love your locals. Did you know that? I love them. They're such good people. Thank you. I agree. I think locals. They're they won't cancel you because you're against the trans agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them have, but most of them have stuck around. All right. So we get this. Let's not make ten minute topics. Let's, okay. We'll let's... do ten second topics. Hey Thursday, <laughs> you see this? I'm moving the microphone. I know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's make this. Uh, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with a timer. Online timer. Oh, don't do that. Do you want me to do it? Do you don't know when the time is, and <gasps> I can just call it? Yeah. But keep it quick. I think these should be two like minutes. Two, minute, two, minute, two, two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. We're going to stick to it. Do you Ready? want to talk about the ordinary again? <laughs> <laughs> Set. Luke W says, Cur this is not part of it. The question can't be part of it. Curious if Goma is still obsessed with self-defense videos. Remember the episode where he talked about getting a Glock 19. I really enjoyed the episode where he talked about the importance of protecting your family and being aware of the dangers that people can sometimes face. Go! I have a Glock 19 Gen 5. Um, I, I am obsessed with... I'm not obsessed with it like I was. My my uh, my neighbor, who's a woman who has two kids, her estranged husband came to her house and was smashing her head against several of the walls, and then dragged her and their dog out to the driveway. I intervened like an idiot. Um, I walked down and go, "Hey, 
hey, what's going on? And, I re- and then he threatened my life and threatened to murder my family. The next day, he uh, so I took my family out. The guy goes to jail. Um, three days later, he was supposed to be no bail. He made bail immediately. Um, the woman came to my house, said to me, God, this is why I love my wife so much. She said That's to me great. and my You're wife. You're to love her, but you've got about 30 seconds. Yeah. She said to my, me and my wife, my, hus- my ex-husband has friends. And please, the next time this happens, just let him kill me. And then my wife said, and I'll never forget this. She said, I could never be married to a man who would not lay down his wife for an innocent person. His life. Is that and, what you meant? Yeah. Lay down his life. Lay down his life. You said for wife. An, keep going. Lay down his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Please take my wife. She's fragile. Uh, no, take my life. Mm-hmm. No, she said, I would never be married to a man who wouldn't give his life. And then she looked at her. And for honestly, I felt like it was at the Sermon on the Mount. She was like, do you understand what worth you have? That you are worth dying for. Do you know that Jesus Christ died for you? Your wife said this to her? To her. Yeah. To this woman who was almost in a, a, a out of body. Like, she was just like, Bless her. please don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. And the white truck that they had parking the driver, she goes, you don't understand what that truck is. That's his brother who murdered his wife and kids and then himself at a party. And I took the truck. And I was like, oh my gosh, and after that, I threw holy water on the truck every time I saw it. But yeah, so I still care deeply about my defense. Okay, next I'm, question. Uh, probably too late, but why do folks hate The Chosen? I've only been able to watch a few episodes, but it seems to be a great way to bring people to our Lord and Savior. The Chosen is great. Um, I think Try some to answer people, in a minute so I can have a word. Yeah. Why don't you go first then? <laughs> Well, the only thing I'm I running saw, the time. The only thing I saw recently was that a uh, pride flag. Yeah, but to on me, that, one camera that wasn't system. a bigger deal at no. all to me in the way that people made it out to be. And I'm clearly against this stuff. And the reason it wasn't a big deal to me is that he hires all sorts of secular yeah. actors. He also contracts people to do work. Yeah. This wasn't something that was officially being flown by Chosen Inc. This was by a contractor, and it happened to be picked up in a behind-the-scenes photo. I think what was more troubling was some of the awful things that the actors actors said on Twitter about people being homophobic and they can go away and stop watching the show. Uh, I thought that was really immature and unfortunate, but even that doesn't bother me. I'm not watching the show because I believe in the personal holiness of these particular actors. But I'm not big into The Chosen. I I really like Jonathan Rumi. I think they've done a good job with it, but I don't really follow it. Yeah, I don't really follow it either. I got to episode, I think, three... uh the the children episode and I just got this weird vibe of little kids coming to Jesus without their parents and these <laughs> whittling things and I was like I got it I can't after the charter for the protection of children in Dallas I can't deal but I I've never we, um we, we we're also in a binary kind of time yeah, in society where we have so to dumb. love or hate something instead of being like I'd really like these elements of it you're not allowed to do that yeah. whose side are you on pick a side yeah so maybe don't That's fall into dumb. that trap yeah so dumb. I think we still have time. Uh, also, The Chosen is a television show about Christ and nothing captures the mystery of Jesus. Get your own image of Jesus by reading the Gospels. God bless you. How much time do we have left? 20 seconds. Okay, next one. Andrew Massey says, The proper way to evangelize charitably with someone aggressively against the church, whether atheist, incorrect views of the church teaching, or even a poorly catechized Catholic. Uh, probably to find out what they need prayer for and to be a witness to them, especially in their most... Um, painful needs if they don't express their painful needs to you then you need to invite them over and be a part of their life because no one gives a crap about you and Mm -hmm. your message if you don't give a crap about them jesus says they know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another if they don't know the love that you have for one another why would they believe your message that the god of the universe is the god of love especially confronted with their own personal suffering and pain so you need to overcome suffering and pain by suffering well and loving them in the midst of it. I think it was Pope Paul VI who said in his uh, encyclical, I think it was an encyclical on evangelization, that modern man listens more today to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it's because they're first witnesses. So Evangelii Nuziandi. Absolutely. Encyclical? Yeah. Yeah. So it's focusing on loving. I mean, like, we love. think that that's a cop out. Yeah. It's not. Loving people is harder than telling them about Christ. Uh, next one. 
But okay. you still got to reset. That was a minute. That's okay. We're just not allowed to go over two minutes. Mm-hmm. Deal. Mm-hmm. Patrick says the Catholic card game in capitals for some reason. <laughs> Both of your shows have featured cards in the expansion pack. I wonder what it is like cooking up those sweet one-liners, and more importantly, which ones were your favorite? I only ever got the first edition. I really enjoyed playing it. We actually we played, played it at my together. house. That was real fun. You, oh man, that was so funny. We played it together. I played it like twice with some friends of mine back in Houston. Then we went to Atlanta. Played it with you, and <laughs> there were so many because you didn't submit your own. Do you remember this? You didn't submit your own. You submit, and then so he created them based on your podcast. Uh-huh. And uh, and you were like, "Well, that's an Australian stereotype." And you were like, there was like an element within you that was a little offended <laughs> okay. at how Australian it was. Okay. And for me, I was like, "Oh, I'm loving this because I <laughs> the, the ADHD in me. I didn't submit. We submitted like a third of what we were supposed to." But some of them were uh, your shirt off in the confessional. Again, that was one of the cards. <laughs> that was my favorite part. That was my favorite part. I don't know how they're still making card games. Oh, what yeah. It's great. Th- that, that, th- those guys, I mean, they're, they're incredible. And one of my, they have a celebrity, <laughs> Catholic celebrity thing. And my face is like, I'm like, <laughs> the microphone, it's a cartoon. I'm like, <laughs> celebration of life. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the new one. <laughs> oh, the Lord has anointed this podcast. Next question. Are you like resetting the timer? Stephen Brown says, Goma! So sad. He moved on from St. Anthony's, but he's absolutely phenomenal. My wife and I attended a Theology of the Body talk with him, and we learned so much in the two hours from him. Not a question. Thank you, though. Next one. Uh, Emma on. asks... Go on. <laughs> you ready? What is leisure, and how do we correctly practice it? Yeah. I think in order to understand leisure, you have to differentiate it from dissociating. <laughs> Right, and so activities that actually restore you, as opposed to just distract you, I think yeah. that's the first step in understanding. Um, so I guess I would equate leisure with recreation, and so I can do something to distract me. I can do something to take my mind off something. I can do something to not exist for a while, as it were, because the time rushes past and I don't even notice it. But often, when I do these things and shut the laptop lid or whatever else, I don't actually feel restored. Yeah. So I think asking yourself, like, what is actually restoring you, and then to realize that leisure often takes work, whereas distraction doesn't. Yeah. And so, if you really want true leisure, true recreation, you kind of have to work for it, which is counterintuitive yeah leisure is the basis of culture don't know if you've read that yosa <laughs> peeper book it's a good one it is a good one but like things mm-hmm. like poetry and reading spiritual books and reading um great works like shakespeare which i become a fan of good man have you heard about my love of shakespeare you if, haven't if you've gotten into him i know that you are now oh it happened <laughs> I ended teaching up direct a helping course. assisting the directing of my kids plays oh my gosh much to do about awesome. nothing midsummer night's dream i fell in love oh my gosh i love shakespeare so much good and uh but but leisure is restorative in the sense of it takes effort but the effort is sweet it's not work. It's not built around the work a do uh, work a day world. It's not about how can I maximize this. This is this is my critique. This is why I quit. One of the reasons why I quit my job, because my leisure was also becoming my side hustle, mm. and thus it was no longer leisure but work. So yeah. don't do that. Read Tennyson. Liam Parker. So I don't know if we. Hit oh, him. I love you? Liam. <laughs> yeah. Mm, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Lessons learned from running Catholic podcasts. Uh, most Catholic podcasts are too formulaic. Most Catholic podcasts only last six to eight episodes. They never mm. get more than 120 uh, episodes or Is listeners right? per episode. Yeah. Most Catholic podcasts uh, are trying to regurgitate content that they already know. Most Catholic podcasts do not care about um, their own insufficiencies in what they don't know. They only want to postulate and deal with those areas that they do know, and uh, thus they are inadequate. What about you? Yeah, when people ask me, should I start a podcast? I think the two things, or two or three things that I've learned is one, if if I if I can have the freedom just to be who I am with all of my insufficiencies and and be okay with that, as opposed to trying trying to kind of. Uh, uh, sound like Scott Hahn or Jason Everett. If I can just be myself, if you can just be yourself, that's good. Uh, and second, is this something that I would do even if no more than 50 people ever listened to it yeah. in the history of the thing? Is it something I'd still want to do? I think that's that's a nice kind of... I would tell you, though, start a podcast. If you think you're called to it, 
or, or you just want to do it? Yeah, that's do it. better. That's let less us, pressure. No, just no, no, but, no, I, but like I love what you're saying because let a thousand flowers bloom, and if it doesn't last, I'll see you in eight episodes, and, you know, it's done. Okay. Great. You, you've tried it. You have no regrets. And then the other thing I've learned is it's far more helpful to listen and take advice from people like contemporaries and like people not contemporaries but people you trust and love like yourself Luke. Irma, or Luke as well Luke. like if Luke called me and said Matt I think you shouldn't have said that or this, you should have said this but you didn't I I need to take that seriously in yeah. a way that I wouldn't take a hundred comments from anonymous strangers right. and maybe and and when you're reading a hundred comments from anonymous strangers you, you don't feel that way it feels all important and i need to listen to these randos yeah with their burner accounts <laughs> criticizing a woman because she had pants on you next uh, question <laughs> well done Two Man, what, what is her name what was her name uh kim zemba kim yeah what a can we just talk Let's about just her talk about, here i'll come up with a question please what are your thoughts on kim zemba okay i'll tell you exactly what hit me about her talk more than anything else just so you know you're married and she's gay but good luck. But still love her. <laughs> still love still her. Love. Not gay. Same sex attracted. She is amazing. She's amazing. Like shockingly so. And then she loves Jesus. Can I can I tell you what what she uncoded for me was the sacrificial nature of the priesthood of the laity. She said, "I don't." Rep I, I I can't remember the exact word. She said, "I don't repress these thing these desires that I have. I offer them to Christ." Mm -hmm. About her same sex attraction. Offer is the language of the priesthood, right? Yeah, I, I want to recommend to everybody. It's, it's hard to do this because it sounds like shameless promotion, and it isn't. I, I do that as well. I'm okay doing it. This isn't <laughs> one of those times. Watch that podcast with Kim we did the other day, and then please share it on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you share your things. Sometimes I'll do a podcast. I'll have a conversation, and I think to myself, I can go home and sleep for the rest of the year. I've done my job. And by done my job just meant yeah. brought this Let beautiful her story. Voice be heard. Yeah, she was incredible. She what, what okay, say her name again. Kim Zemba. Kim for some reason I want to say Lisa. I'm saying it so much that now I'm afraid I'm i I've got it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Kim. Kim Zemba, right? Kim? Yes, Kim Zemba. Kim, Kim, listen, I'm talking to you now, Kim. Hey, hey, Thursday, you got the camera on me? Instead of on Matt, <laughs> unlike when she talked to the camera, <laughs> she didn't give me a warning. She was going to look know, at the camera. I know she didn't. She didn't. Kim, you, your that your testimony is incredible and has actually literally called this man here, husband, father, to level of of sanctity that I thought I already had but wasn't aware of. So I do want to say this. Can I say this? Yeah, I think I, don't know yet. I think same sex attracted Roman Catholics are actually going to lead the way in sanctity. Yeah. Because, I mean, number one, they've been so gaslighted by the church. Like, yeah, we want to welcome you, but just don't talk about you. <laughs> right? But number two, when they actually strive for holiness, Time. they're striving against a Time. desire. Time. Damn. Rules. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> we we got to stick to the two, two We minutes. do. It's artificial, uh, but whatever. Um, KR4121, <laughs> has he moved out of shot? I feel like he's moved over. Is he looking all right? Yeah, I'm coming to get him as soon as you finish the question. Rules regarding Catholics attending uh, weddings... Whether it be natural marriages, sacramental marriages, or interfaith marriages. I'll say something real quick. Okay, so you have to make a distinction between what is a valid marriage and what is a sacramental marriage. Two Protestant yeah. Christians who marry are, all things being equal, both validly married and sacramentally married. Because in order for a marriage to be sacramental, both parties need to be baptized. Yeah. If you are a Catholic, however, uh, just like the state... Uh, regulates the marriages of its citizens, whether it should or shouldn't isn't the point. The church has a right to regulate the marriages of its citizens. And so you have to, as a Catholic, maintain the form of marriage. And if you don't, let's say you choose to get married to a Protestant and or, or not even a Protestant, an atheist, disparity of cult, but you're not actually getting that, you're rather you're getting married on a beach somewhere, then this would be neither valid nor sacramental because it's in order Please for don't it to bang be on the table. Sorry, in order he for it to be, bangs on the table. In, in order for it to be um, sacramental, of course, it has to be cameras over there, Matt. Valid. Where are you going? So I would, I would say that if I love you so much, if it's not a valid marriage, then I wouldn't attend it. And and I, this is coming from somebody who has chosen not to attend a very close family member's marriage because it wasn't valid.
Yeah. And that was a very difficult decision. But I'm of the opinion that if I attend a marriage, especially in an official capacity, whether that be I'm singing or my children are the ring bearers or I'm a You're groom's a good or too. something. I don't think people know that. If I'm doing that, then I'm saying with my presence, I agree mm. that this thing is what you think it is. Yeah. And that seems to me to be bordering on bearing false witness. So I'd, I personally wouldn't attend a non-valid marriage. Yeah, you ought not to. Oh, Listen, right. Catholics, you ought not to attend an invalid, not a natural marriage, you can attend that, but not an invalid marriage. And it hurts because it's probably your family members. But Christ loves you. I'm Why, hallelujah, who's the best. Who? She, if you start a YouTube channel, she'll moderate your channel as well. This woman She is wanted on, me to tell Gomer, she wanted me to say that she loves you. And I uh, said, tisk tisk, parasocial. And she <laughs> persisted. So I'm telling her now. And she Wait, knows it's parasocial. What is her name? Haley Luya. Haley Luya. <laughs> Hey, Lelouia, this one's for you. I also love you, but I still want to see other people, <laughs> namely my wife and kids. <laughs> she says, why is Catholic Stuff You Should Know the best podcast? And why does Father John want to fight you? Oh, shoot. Go. Oh, okay. So this is the most misunderstood comment. And actually, I thought of it while we were talking. Okay. When the pre-sex abuse scandal was going on, and I read every document, of the you know the Pennsylvania grand jury report, all that stuff. Can we um, can we pause real quick? Please don't do that unless you what? have an incredibly strong stomach. Like for everyone else out there, probably don't. What read those documents? Oh yeah, oh. don't. Oh no, they're terrible. They're terrible, and they're from the fifties and sixties that haven't happened in 20, 30 years. Anyway, so um, I uh, Father John, I made a you. comment mm -hmm. that the one thing about celibacy that frightens me. Because so many priests are isolated. Yeah. Is you can't hide, and this is the comment that I was going to say earlier, you can't hide your faults from your wife. I mean, you can to a certain extent, but you live together, you bump up against each other, your, your lives are the same. It's very difficult to hide your failings from the one you love. So they constantly get brought up Bill Burr's line, why are we always working on me? Right. <laughs> the priest can hide. Because he has two parishes and he's in a rectory all by himself. So my statement was, this is the one. I never meant to negate chastity, celibacy, but it sounded like apparently that I was saying those who are chaste are more open to these kind of faults and failings. Never meant that because I don't believe that at all. In so any what way, did he form. say? Did he go off on so, his No, but or? at the Seat Conference where me and Luke had a joint podcast, that's where we hashed it out. So it's in one of those episodes there. Was it, but he threw it his heated? water ball at me. But um, he, In the podcast? Yeah, it was really fun. As a joke. As oh, a joke. Good, good. But um, my, my whole thing was his community of priests is the remedy that I would yeah. I, I would Im imply. And Sum that up, too, for people who don't know what that community is. Yeah, no, is. they live in community together as diocesan priests from seminary onward. I'm Catholic mm. Am uh, Armory. That's the, you've got to be faithful to the two minutes if this is going to work. Catholic Armory says the presence of pride and ego in being a public figure and how to combat those temptations. What? Good question. I just talked about that with my therapist yesterday. Yeah, oh. no, I think I'm the most important person who's ever lived mm -hmm. when I have a microphone. Uh, I am I am incredibly arrogant. Mm -hmm. I go to confession literally every three weeks. One of the things I confess is my pride and my vanity. Um, there was a something that happened recently. I can't remember what it was. It was a, a, a meeting of Catholic speakers, Catholic evangelists, Catholic podcasters. And not only was I not involved, I wasn't even like considered. Mm. And I remember being so hurt. And I said this to the priest in confession and I, and I'm confessing it because I'm a, a completely self-centered, self-absorbed a-hole. And he said to me, a completely self-absorbed person would never This goes see back the, to what we said earlier, right? A bad dad doesn't wonder yeah, whether he's a bad yeah, dad. Yeah, a prideful man doesn't say, well, I'm being too prideful. He thinks, no, this is my yeah. rights. So are we asking that question? Yeah. I asked Christopher West this. I said, how does being in the public light, like, how did you avoid like getting that messing you up? Yeah. I asked him this about 10 years ago or something, and before I had this had grown. And he said, oh, no, it will. It, it won't, it, it can't will. not. And so then what do you do with that? Yeah. I, I, I pray every day 
Um, I would okay. Let's be honest. I pray maybe once a week for Father Mike Schmitz. Yeah, because his popularity is so huge. Yeah, and let's make it about him. I think about him. <laughs> I I honestly think about him every time I see his Instagram photos. No, every time. I mean, the shower. My fear is, <laughs> fear <laughs> is that um, he would ever, and and I don't think he would, but he, but fame is a goddess that dominates our souls. Yeah. And my hope is he never like every can everyone can have a bad day. But man, that man is so good. It's easy to think about other people like Joe Biden. You think, gosh, if just go go fishing. Just go retire, go fishing, yeah. love your children <laughs> and repent and then die. LR Mike says, should American Catholics give up their second amendment rights as one bishop has recently indicated? No. I don't think so. No. I'm kind of on the of the opinion that American citizens should be able to own everything the U.S. government should own. If the ability... Like a howitzer? Yeah. Like a tank? Like a tank, yep, all of it. <laughs> Two I'm tanks. not there, but you should no. own a gun. Yeah, uh, I don't think your Second Amendment... Right, the, the vast, okay, yes, there are more guns owned by Americans than there are physical Americans, but the vast majority of people who own guns do not commit violent crime with them. Um, and... Guns are used more often in defensive instances yeah. than in crimes. Hey, thank you, Thursday, for interrupting. Uh, no, <laughs> just kidding. And I can tell you that the people I associate with in the gun community, because I bought a gun and I'm scared of it, uh, they are all in on helping you protect your family. Because if a gang of thugs come to your home, you're not going to punch them all. <laughs> <laughs> you could try. You could try and yeah. you'll be dead. Yeah, I would say... Saying you don't need a gun because you have the police is like saying you don't need a fire extinguisher because you have the the fire brigade. Yeah. Yeah. I love living in this country. Again, Do I don't think it's the same. Wait, in Australia, right. they confiscated, they confiscated, all, confiscated of your, all the guns. All of them. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. So when the Australian government was throwing indigenous people well, who they claim to love into concentration camps because of COVID, if they had guns, they probably wouldn't have done that. That happened, by the way. Yeah. That happened. All right. I don't know if it would have done that. And pe people say... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got a tech nine. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, pe people say, well, you have no chance against the government. Don't be... Don't kid yourself. You do until you don't. But have yet, you not you seen have Red Dawn with Patrick Swayze? You have more of a chance. Every time in the last century, a gorilla, a group of gorillas has gone to war with a major U with a major power. Here's what I want you to do. have won. I want you to reset that two minutes because I really want your opinion on this. I'm going to ask you the question. Ready, set... Thursday, should American Catholics give up the Second Amendment rights, as one bishop has recently indicated? I'm not American. I'm in Canada, and I think you would be crazy to give that up. No, uh, I'm not with Matt on you should be able to own everything the government can own, um, because the it, as the weapon becomes more dangerous, it becomes easier to be negligent with it and harm people. But um, the fact of the matter is that um, the the gun is an equalizer. The firearm is an equalizer. Firearms are the best way to protect yourself and your family and your loved ones. Um, and if you are in a dangerous area and you do not own a firearm, I'm, I'm not a father and I'm going to say this, and if, as you two as fathers can correct me, if you have a family and you live in a dangerous area and you don't have a firearm because you're scared of the firearm, you need to man up and get your crap together. Because if you're in a dangerous area, there is a high likelihood you will need to use it. And you should be able to use things to protect your family, tools to protect your family. As a man who was threatened by a man who said, now I see where you live and I'm going to kill you, bitch. Um, <laughs> and he's a man whose brother murdered a bunch of people and he himself has uh, is a part of a gang. Um, I will say that the only thing that brought m me a sense of security is the fact that I am trained in, in a weapon. Yes. Also, I will say that if you do own a firearm and you're not, confident with it and you're not taking training that is also an act of negligence and you should be trained yeah, with the absolutely. weapon and every minor and child and person in the home where a firearm is needs to know to not touch it or needs no. to be trained on how to safely use it if you have a child who you're not confident can safely use it they need to know that they should never under any circumstances ever touch it it might be good if they don't even know where it is honestly but what if they think it's like a water gun <laughs> that's a great caveat Thursday and it's a great answer yeah. thank you no, for that was great that was great um, Sybil of the, are you ready? Yeah. Sybil of the Rhyme says a few topic ideas. Hmm. Let's go with the Sybil of the Rhyme. That's probably not her real name. That's awesome. But here she says, why are so many young people so lonely? The internet. Next question. 
Yeah, no, no. There's a study, 1991 to uh, 2021. The average, uh, what is it, a 17 year old male has half the amount of friends that they previously did. In my neighborhood, that I, the, my first neighborhood that I moved to, moving to the Woodlands area. No talking to them. Oh, shoot. Yeah. I'm talking to you. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I keep talking to that camera. <laughs> right. Hey, Matt. Hey. God, you're so handsome. I'm running the timer, by the way. Go One on. day. No, um, lonely. We were told that th- this is a neighborhood full of kids. The only time I see them is on Halloween. Never see them. Move All the homeschool kids. Move to Steubenville. <laughs> All the homeschool kids yeah. are outside. Yeah. My kids. Totally. Okay. So there's there's none of that. Um, the current neighborhood that I live in, basically the same thing. What was the question again? About was, why are young people so lonely? We're lonely because not we have world. so... I'm, I mean, uh, I'm not lonely Speak at all. Yourself. We have so many distractions that we can consume individually on our own. Yeah. And then we're going to get the Apple AR headset. We're going to put the Apple Vision Pro on our head. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be beautiful. I'm going to look at Matt Frat as if I'm in the studio, <laughs> but Matt Frat actually doesn't know me. Mm-hmm. Consuming everything individually. That's dangerous. Gosh. Aaron says, how do we remain open to and cooperate with continual conversion? Two things I would say. Number one, take a regular retreat. I was just chatting with Father Ken Barker, who's the founder of the Missionaries of God's Love in Australia, and he told me that every month the first thing he puts on his calendar are two days away where he can be with the Lord and pray in silence. And I thought, you know, I I could actually do that. It's something I could do. And if I couldn't do it, I could at least do one day in a pustinia up the road, which we have here. So I think that would be one thing is to, to take a retreat. A uh, second thing I would say is to read good spiritual literature, either from the saints or if you feel like you can't stomach that right now. Like, say, Francis de Sales' Introduction to the Devout Life, I would 100% recommend anybody should be able to read. But if you can't read that, reading some more modern, faithful Catholic author. And the third thing, uh, consider finding yourself a spiritual father or mother or at least somebody more advanced in the spiritual life than you that you can meet with regularly to talk about your prayer life. What was the question again? How do we remain open to and cooperate with continual conversion? Uh, the other thing is the realization that as you step into different seasons of life, life changes. So mm. if you become, if you're single as a young adult and then you become married and then you become a father, th- that crap changes radically. And then your kids become older, that changes radically. And so the awareness of these different changes matters deeply. So your conversion means, um, this is what I've seen. So St. Anthony's, great parish, huge congregation, a lot of great people. Um, When men are faithful in their 50s and then they retire in their 60s with wealth, they often become unfaithful. Mm. Campbell in the eye of the needle. Well, not just that, but... uh, Life changed so dramatically that my support mechanisms, the ordering of my daily life is gone. And now I'm here with my wife, who's kind of a stranger, and I don't know how to deal. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is if you don't lean into a framework, you fail. Corey says, praise and worship music, general opinion on it. When is it appropriate? And when does it cross the line from useful to awful? So you've said some beautiful things, Goma, that I, I wish I was more sophisticated to kind of banter back and forth with, but I, 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 I can't help, help but love praise and worship music. And, yeah. and, and I'm always worried when people assure me how evil it is or how bad it is or how effeminate it is. I like listening to certain Hillsong songs. I'm sure I'd love listening to certain uh, Bethel songs. Um, I find that it helps me just really kind of almost get out of my head, which is so analytical and philosophical in its reflections upon things, just to tell the Lord who he is and who I am before him. If that's what the praise and worship music does. Most absolutely cutting edge praise and worship music doesn't tell the Lord who he is. It tells the Lord what I'm doing with the Lord. I will always be faithful. I will always be true. I will always love you. No, you won't. All You're right. a terrible human person, well, Matt. Let me, let me take one example and see. The comments are saying talk about Bethel. Okay, we'll, Bethel. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. That could be the next question. Okay. I'm but, drinking more but, alcohol. Okay, just go easy, though, because I'm afraid. <laughs> no, you said the whole the, thing. All right. 
All right, listen, I love this song, What a Beautiful Name by Hillsong. A beautiful name. Yes. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high, your hidden glory and creation mm. now revealed in you, our Christ. Mm. All right. How beautiful is that? You yeah. have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. It's a glorious song. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Those lyrics. Nothing. Use those in your prayer. Go to adoration. Sing them. Absolutely. That's right. awesome. But that seems to be a cutting edge song. It's one of the biggest okay, songs great, in praise and worship. Great, great, music. great, great. Awesome. Use those type of songs. Revelation song, Kari Job. Kari All right, Job. But, okay, so what's the worst worst Bethel song? I don't think know. Of? I don't All know right. off the top of my head. All right, so but, we'll do Bethel in a we'll second. We'll do that next. What's your, yeah, wrap it up. Yeah, no, my I I listen to praise You're and worship all the time. Stumble till the end here. I listen time. to praise and worship all the time. I love praise and worship. As music. we like pound whiskey. This isn't time. good optics. Okay, be, uh, next question. Bethel, tell me about Bethel. Bethel uh, belongs to a branch of Pentecostal Christianity, wherein various people believe too stringently in the five um, leadership roles in the church. Um, what is it? Prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Crap, I'm missing them all. But um, and the you know, they are starting to introduce doctrines that are antithetical to the Word of God. Don't do that. The best praise and worship music are praise and worship songs. Like like I was saying, Kari Jacob draws a Revelation song. You remember that? Sing it. <laughs> no, it's like the honor and the glory and the praise. You, you, you know it. You know. Yeah, as soon right. as you hear it, you'll be like, "Yeah, girl, that's my jam." <laughs> but all the, uh, don't not don't hate praise and worship because it's not Catholic hymnody. I had a friend of mine that said oh that. He's like, gosh. "So if we care about uh, if we care about the liturgy, should we not listen to praise and worship?" The answer is religious music is not liturgical music or sacred music. Sacred music is derived from and returns to the liturgy. Other music is totally good as long as it's true, good, and beautiful. Yeah. Draw from it. Use it. I do all the time. Somebody in the comments just said, if Hillsong is okay at Mass, then so is Lecrae. Oh, Lecrae is so good at Mass. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I love Lecrae. Harry Clune says, favorite fiction book. <gasps> you already know what mine is, so you go. What? No, no, no. What's your favorite fiction book? Probably The Brothers. D Dostoevsky. Probably. D Dostoevsky. <laughs> yeah. I got a picture of him in this other room. I love Dostoevsky. That's him there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. That was a great <laughs> shot. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, gosh. Favorite fiction book. There's a new book that um, Calvin Robinson told me to read. I started reading it and absolutely loved it. What is really? it? Come on, come on, man. Uh, Since come we're on, talking man. about fiction, while well, Matt thinks, Robert Hugh Benson's book, Lord of the World, if you I'm haven't read it. I'm in the middle of it. it. I'm on chapter six, Robert Hugh Benson, Lord of the World. If you haven't read it, you need to. Yeah, where, and, and you know who's, whose favorite book that novel. is? Whose? Favorite fiction book, Pope Francis. I think Francis. that's Pope Francis's, yeah. Pope Francis's yeah. favorite fiction book is Robert Hugh Benson. His father was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the Anglican Church. He converted to Catholicism. And his father disowned him. And his father disowned him. He wrote Lord of the World. He also wrote Friendship with Christ. Uh, best book ever written on that. Um, but in terms of fiction, I love military hard science fiction. Yeah. So uh, I got no room for y'all except for like shit like Columbus Day and, <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, the sorry. Galaxy's Edge series. Canticle of Leibowitz. Canticle of Leibowitz is so good. If you Although that's Canticle, a kind of anti-Catholic. Really? I, I keep People don't realize that. Canticle of Leibowitz is actually a criticism of Catholicism for preserving the very knowledge that destroys humanity. Because he, is that what it is? Yes, because he committed suicide after he, well, after he wrote the book, but he bombed Monte Cassino and he realized in World War II and he realized that Catholic, it wasn't a hatred of he Catholicism. He was one of the bombers? I knew it was based he on He was that. like a know. tail gunner that sighted it. Holy cow. Canticle for Leibowitz is incredible. It's either the greatest Catholic apologetic or not really a denunciation of Catholicism, but the because last, we embrace The last paragraph is insane. Yeah. It's, uh, no, don't I don't want to spoil it, because if you spoil it, but it's... it's Lucifer has fallen. No. Um, ah, why? No, that it's means uh, nothing. shake the dust from your feet. <gasps> I love <laughs> the The audiobook of it is perfect. Oh, the one? Yeah. Perfect. Read so well. All right, everybody go get Candy for Leave of It. Apparently it's great. All right, favorite guilty sitcom. Like a sitcom that you probably shouldn't admit that you like, but you can't help but like. Gosh, I love Cheers, Frasier, and Seinfeld. <laughs> Frasier is really good. Frasier's so good. The best episode, his brother Niles, right? Remember him? He goes, 
Um, I, uh, my name is Dr. Niles Crane, not Fraser. I'm his brother. I'm a Jungian, not a Freudian. So there will be no blaming mommy today. <laughs> I freaking lost it. I do. I, all I knew of Freudian psychology was about blaming mom and dad. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, one of my favorite new sitcoms that I've started watching is King of the Hill. Um, King of the, the Hill. Cartoon, oh, yeah. Not a sitcom. Oh, Get so it. perfect. The, one of the best, I saw this meme, it said the best moment, best <laughs> comedic moment in all of television history is when Hank cannot open the lid of a of a WD, what is it, what's that called? WD-40? WD-40. And then so he pulls out a smaller WD-40, <laughs> opens that, and loosens it. In order to- <laughs> he has a whole praise and worship episode. Did you know that? No. Yes. Huh? The yeah. one where he, the preacher heals him of well, he blindness? Goes, or- uh, the, this either ruins rock and roll or ruins Christianity, something like that. But you know, King <laughs> of the Hill, the rumor the is- The line is, uh, you're, you're making- <laughs> You're making rock and roll and Christianity worse, I think. Yeah, you're okay, making, you're yeah. Making, but I the, I Jeremy that. Barda, the rumor is yeah. that King of the Hill guy who came up with it, whatever his name is, um, lived around the corner really? from Jeremy Barda's dad. <laughs> and then his dad is Hank, I think. <laughs> That's I think he's, amazing. Because he's like, these four guys would just hang out. The, one of the best uh, lines I thought was they were driving to Mexico and who, what's the son's name? Bobby. Never Bobby, Bobby asks why there's such a Bobby. big wall. It's like, well, son, <laughs> m- millions of people want to come to this land of freedom, but but we've decided we don't need that many. <laughs> well, that was a good too. That's for real. Uh, King of the Hill is a great. Is a it's, it's phenomenal. It really is. Yeah, I, uh, one one show that I I know it's problematic as all these things are, but I just love is. Breaking Bad. I'm oh, I love Breaking Bad. Next question. But that's not a sitcom. That's true. What is a sitcom? Situation comedy. Uh, never what, knew what, uh, it stood for situation. You did? Not never knew until right now. Situation comedy. Yeah, you said uh, Bar- uh, whoa, Andy Griffith show. Mash is one the, of the best, best one. You guys missed Mash. Mash, Mash is fun. Oh, yeah, do you really but like Mash? Until, yes, until I, Alan Alda took you over. Do you want me to, to take like two it? minutes and talk about how I great Mash is? I want you Mash to take is? 20 no. seconds. Okay. Alan Alda <laughs> took over it and ruined it, but before that, awesome. Yeah, up to season like six. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, the, se- the series finale is the best thing to ever air on television. Fair enough. Wow. Um, this is I a agree. real fact. I've said this on the show before. The series finale is the most watched by by ratio relative to population of the time television event in American history. More than Dallas? Yes. <gasps> yeah. It's okay. 60% of American televisions were watching it. New York City sewer system flooded. Um, MASH because also so estab- many people were pooping? Yeah. <laughs> right at the... Well when, playing when, Angry Birds. No, when, they, when the show, when the credits rolled. Wow. Yeah. Uh, no, MASH established everything you think is great about a, a television today, all the, the things they use, it was originally done in MASH. Radar. Radar. Oh. Perfect. The end of season what a three. Character. The end of season three. Uh, Lieutenant Lieutenant Colonel Henry Bakes plane went down in the Sea of Japan. There weren't no survivors. Oh. Ryan G asks: Is the DRA do a Rames, I presume, or Knox Bible the better fancy translation for English speaking Catholics? I will just say that I wanted like the Douay Rames. There were times that I would buy the Douay Rames. Told myself I should like it. Tried really hard the way someone might try to like Mash, but couldn't. <laughs> And stop pretending. Yeah. If I'm after a fancy English version, I would read the King James version with the apocrypha. Yeah. Uh, but I prefer the ESV or the ESV RS, or the RSV second yeah. edition. But yeah, people. Knox, don't... I know you're a big fan of Knox, but what do you think first? Uh, yeah, Knox is more fancy. Um, the ESV is a part of an interpretive tradition that comes from the King James. The ESV is unique where. The New Testament quotations from the Old Testament, regardless if they quote it wrong, they put the Old Testament, whatever they translate in the Old Testament, they put that in the New Testament. So that's part of the uniqueness of the ESV and the RSV. Um, the ESV and the RSV, the standard, the S in standard, is the King James. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? Yes, I did. Yeah. So the Douay Rheims ex- exempts itself from that interpretive tradition. The Douay Rheims American version is 18, I think, 99. And it's good. It's fine. Um, but I prefer, uh, I mean, I love it. I love, I love both of those. Um, my go-to is the Ascension Press version of the RSV CE, 2CE. Um, I like Carl Keating's answer to the question, what's the best Bible? He says, the one you'll read. The one you'll read. Start there. Except for the NAB. 
<laughs> uh, okay, we have one more question from our local supporters, and then if y'all uh, in YouTube want to locals, man, send so a, good, send a question. Yeah, so super chat too. if you want to ask a question. <gasps> super chat. This oh yeah, I'm not above grifting. <laughs> if you super chat, I'll take off my shirt. He will not. It's not true. No, oh not true. <laughs> no, he no one needs yeah. that. No, he won't. Please no still super chat. No one needs the <laughs> ass that I shaved. The Superman ass that I shaved in my chest every morning because I want to be special. Go Kev on, Matt. Kevin, <laughs> go on, Matt. No, read it, Matt. Why are you uh, laughing? This is quite a long question, so don't start the timer until I've read it. Kevin says, "What is Gomez's take on media, TV, movie, music, etc. consumption based on last week's Pints live stream regarding the show Mrs. Davis?" I had a hard time making that take. Follow. When later in the Pints live stream, music by bands with, to put it nicely, very rough and or crude other songs were enjoyed freely. For quick example, Nickelback song Photograph is below their <laughs> other... <laughs> the Such a good song. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. No, it's brilliant. It's terrible. Also related... The, so, okay, so I, 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 I criticized... Ms. Davis. Yes, I just feel like... I don't know. Is that we, an we've Amazon been told movie? to keep I'm ourselves starting. unpolluted from the world. Starting. And, what? Start He's starting. Timer. He's starting the time. Yes, and 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 so there was a there was a prelate who suggested this is a great movie, and yet in this movie you've got this nun who has a relationship with Jesus, like actual Jesus, who lives in a store or something, and Jesus tells her to get back with her old boyfriend. Yep. It, and I'm like, why? No, no. So I just feel like we have become polluted by the world, and we yeah. try to watch these shows and we try to justify the fornication and the pornographic content and the gratuitous violence and do you remember the most hate i've ever experienced by pints of the Quinas yes audience? you were on my show justifying game of thrones and the hardcore pornography <laughs> <laughs> i remember well, what's this guy's name what's his name kevin kevin here's the deal this is what i've discerned through my 41 years of consuming media non-stop because i'm a chubby man who sits in front of a television you will never miss anything. Like the media. Like, oh, did you watch the last episode of Cheers? No, I didn't. Your life is not imppoverished. Did you? My wife is obsessed with NASCAR. Do you like NASCAR? <laughs> no, I don't no, like no. NASCAR. No one does. I'm open to liking it. No, I you're not. <laughs> Actually, my wife can get anyone to like NASCAR, <laughs> including this guy. Is she from Indy? Huh? Does she drink Bud she Light? Indy? No, she's from St. Louis. Oh, okay. Where the players play. Uh,. Here's the deal. You will never miss it. That that's the thing about pop culture, is it appeals yeah. to either right a, now. a point in time or a, a, a passion of your sensitive appetite. You're you're never gonna miss it, and that's the thing that most people don't understand. Oh, if I'm not queued in, keyed in, linked in, none of that matters. If you don't watch Breaking Bad like this weirdo watches, instead of Game of Thrones? Uh, no, no. <laughs> if, if you don't watch this stuff, your life is not impoverished. So go to the things like Exodus 90 says Time. that edify. Uh, Kyle Whittington just sent us $20 and said, take it off now. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. That man is you. <laughs> Wait, is what I wore on the airport. All right, so space that it. man is you, <laughs> but with my nipples. <laughs> I literally put that, 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 that pullover on because I'm nipping. But, <laughs> he said, but name? with my nipples. That man is you, but with your nipples. I, I hope we get up to this soon so we can both watch you take your shirt off. Right? Here, Here it we is. Can. <laughs> what is that, like this a, is a 12 so, second so delay? This is the, I, I don't know. How it's it brilliant. This is brilliant. There it is. <laughs> I gotta pull it down. All right, so give us another 20 bucks and the shirt will come off. <laughs> give us and another somebody, 20 somebody bucks. Oh, that. crap. Another 20 bucks. All right, here we go. Since you... The, <laughs> ZZZ, probably not their real name. I'm back. Says, since you guys are a happy bunch, I'd like <laughs> to ask you all how to deal with scrupulosity and, sec oh. and accept my misery with happiness. Okay. Let, can I, can yeah. I start? Okay. Scrupulosity... Okay, number one, you need to take that to a freaking medical health, a mental health professional because sometimes scrupulosity is actually not scrupulosity. It's disguised as OCD or a disguised as scrupulosity, but it is OCD. You need to understand the difference between a spiritual problem and a mental health or emotional health problem. Okay, that's number one. Number two, honestly, the sure guide of the church 
of what is and is not sin, what is and is not healthy, what is and is not building you up into goodness. That is what you need to lean into. Okay, well, keep. What was the question again? The, the, there was something at the end that triggered um, me. And accept my misery with happiness. Okay, said. bull crap. Do you think Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose from the dead so that you would be miserable but with happiness? You can accept suffering through the uniqueness of Jesus Christ and his grace that he gives you. So if you think about it, my physical suffering, my mental suffering, whatever, emotional suffering, it's part of the sensitive appetite. You can still have joy within them. But Jesus Christ does not uh, does not give you the grace towards happiness and union with him forever so that you can become quarantined within this understanding of, well, I'm, my life is just supposed to be terrible forever. That's not true. Woo. What I would encourage you to do is to seek after a honestly a solid spiritual director. Solid spiritual director who can help you navigate this because some of it some of the depression is caused by your own sin right have you ever committed sure. a sin and you felt like crap yeah okay some of it is because is because of your own recursive thoughts that you just need honestly like cognitive behavioral therapy to like go beyond these are my thoughts but my thoughts are not me some of them are because of your circumstances whatever it might be but uh, robert hughes benson the guy that we've been talking about he goes through and talks um, about these things specifically. John, sorry, no, you gotta shut up. Doesn't Don't ma- doesn't matter no, this person's no, depressed. your soul is in line. <laughs> <laughs> Christ does not want you to be left in <clears throat> cynicism. He doesn't. All right, he I, doesn't. Okay, now I'm sh- just scrolling into the questions here. Uh, this is all locals? No, now that was all locals. Oh, now it's paid. Now, now it's just the riffraff. You um, want to send, send us money? It was, and we'll do say you your think name. I should start an OnlyFans? No, depends what you're gonna do on it. I'm just gonna talk no. About it Christ. doesn't depend on what you're gonna do on <laughs> I'm it. I'm gonna talk about Christ. People will still have to go to the website. <gasps> yeah, I've never, I've never, I didn't even really know what it was, and then I was selling shirts on Teespring, and in the back end they enable you to kind of. Link your uh, link accounts. It. Yeah. And I couldn't, yeah. Man, it's bad. Uh, okay. You, we, Matt, uh, you would make a killing. <laughs> Matt, look at me. <laughs> look at look me. Look at me now. <laughs> okay. It was just disappointing, says Gangary. No, it's fine. That don't, that's not about this. I'm what? watching the chat. That what the is question about? is totally off. What is it about? Uh, uh, Father Mike Schmitz and uh, well, let me just read Tim, it. Tim. It was just disappointing vid in which Father Mike tried not to boldly teach the church's teaching about man being head of the household and woman owing obedience. Yes. Yeah, right can question. we talk about that? Let's do that. Gosh. It was. It and then Tim responded. What did he say? Oh, Tim's here. No. No. Oh, so he say? made a response video. I don't know. I'm watching the chat. They're arguing about it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not. I hey, have you ever things, have you ever so. disciplined your wife? Have you ever said, you don't submit to my authority, I'm going to discipline you? No. No. I had a woman who is one of the most faithful Catholics I've ever met said, a group of her men that are traditional Catholics, this is my problem, have told her that a man is the head of the house, the husband is the head of the house, and he can discipline his wife, discipline his wife, including locking her in a closet or room <laughs> until she submits. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to oh, her. I'm, got, I'm, I'm like, my so. jaw is getting lower and lower. She's like, what? And I was like, in a thousand years. She was locked in a closet by her husband? No, 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 no. This is no. But this guy, these guys, these young adults who have never been married or one's newly married, they're like, well, you know, like this is what it means to be a man. And I was like, no, no, no. In Ephesians chapter, chapter five, it says, uh, be subordinated or, or uh, what's, what's the phrase? Yeah, submissive. be subordinated, okay. submissive to one another as um, be subordinated, <laughs> submissive to one another. And then in the next verse, it says wives be and in the Greek, the verb is missing because it's referencing the previous verse, right? The previous verb to your husbands mm-hmm. as Christ is the Lord. Husbands love your wives. And we all know this. But she literally there. There are so many traditionalist communities where husbands gravitate to <coughs> not their uh, th- uh, leadership in charity, but domination mm-hmm. in Genesis 3 style. And she was telling me this, and I, and I thought it was a joke at first. Like, no one really thinks this way. And she's like, no. He literally said to me, husbands should discipline their wives until they come 
to reverence their husband as Christ. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy crap. But wouldn't you realize, obviously, that the abuse of something doesn't negate the proper use of something? And so we can look at terrible examples like this, and we can look at how men would misuse their power and their lusts to mistreat someone that they've been called to die for. Yeah. And that then makes us allergic to what's very clear Time. in Scripture that wives ought to submit to their husbands. Yeah, but most people who are justifying their own tyranny I'm gonna won't do that. I'm going to make this two, two minutes longer. Keep going. Yeah, but most people who want to justify their own tyranny, their own domination, won't do that. They'll say, well, this is how I love my wife. Right. So that, then, This is how I love my wife. Hey, no, 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 no. This is how the, I love my wife. But then, the, yeah. <laughs> Hundred percent, but then the problem isn't with the scripture or with what right. the saints have taught about why wives ought to be submissive. I would say that I've actually changed my opinion somewhat on this through listening to some of the things Tim has said. Tim Gordon. Gordon. Yeah, I, and his wife. Go ask your husband on Twitter. Yeah, yeah because I uh, these are difficult topics to discuss, and right. they're, they're difficult because. We live in a day and age where we actually don't know what a man is, what a woman is, right. Matt Walsh's documentary, what marriage is, or even really what sex is. When you've got that much out of whack, and then you try to understand what St. Paul must mean when he talks about these things, what's more likely, that our modern Christian sages have got it wrong, or that the saints of the church have got it wrong? And so I'm of the opinion that if the scriptures clearly teach that a woman ought to submit to her husband, and then you have that backed up by people like St. John Chrysostom, Thomas Aquinas, and you could go on and on, then what we ought to be doing is listening to them, even if it contra... I don't know what Father Mike Schmitz Luke has is said. is in the comments. Now I'm going to tell him to go away. Even if it contradicts what more modern Christian authors have said. What if... What modern Christian authors have said is a fruition of the thought of, like, we, we've, the, we've... The fruition can't contradict the root, though. Right, right, right. right. So, my wife is submissive <clears throat> to me, but my uh, leadership role is also in, in mutual submission, right? Which is verse 21 of chapter 5, right? So, Ephesians chapter I'm... 5, verse 21 is mutual submission... Then wives be submissive to your husbands as Christ is to the Lord, or as the church is to the Lord. I'm okay trying to understand that, so long as you're not trying to say that you are not the head of your household. Yeah, no, I'm the head of my household. Right, good. Because if you try to tell me that there's a mutual submission taking place in the way that that sounds to most people, it sounds like you're saying there are actually two heads on this body. Right, but the problem is most men are lever most traditionalist men are leveraging that verse to dominate. I don't know if that's true. I don't well, think Okay, okay. I'm let me let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase. There are some men in traditionalist circles mm-hmm. who are leveraging that and other verses to dominate women in in the sense of telling them what they should do, what they should wear, what they should everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm and, and when I was talking to this woman who was totally abused by her father, sexually, physically, verbally, all that stuff. And then on top of that, it's trying to feel like she earnestly desires, like, what does the Lord want for marriage? And then she's hearing these young men be like, yeah, man, a woman ought to do whatever uh, her husband yeah. says. She ought to submit to him. And, I, and so what I said to her is, yeah, as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. So his realm, his, his dominion of, of leadership is always Christological, which means in service of the good of the other. Mm-hmm. So he's not dominating her, which right. is a consequence of the fall right. that JP2 in theology of the body clearly yeah. distinguishes. Well, not just them, but go back to Chrysostom, who was, what, a fourth century monk and bishop? Yeah. He has the most beautiful things to say on Ephesians 5. Um, I haven't read them. Oh, it's so beautiful. Just give me one well, thing. Well, he'll say to a woman, like, do not stubbornly contradict your husband. Oh, and do yeah, not absolutely. seek to be the head of the household. Can I tell you the most beautiful but thing? Let, that, me, let yeah. me finish that. Oh, but, but we're going to put fingers up. <clears throat> we're going to finger. <laughs> but, then he says, but then he says to the husband, he says a great deal to the husband yeah. too. And maybe it's that both need to be held in unison. Yeah. If the husband was more interested in the verse that told him to love his bride, as Christ of the church, and the woman was more interested in learning to submit to her husband, then maybe you've got a, a yeah. good unity. But when you've got two selfish people yeah. pointing to what the other person ought to be doing you instead of fulfilling me. their own thing, then maybe yeah. that's where some of the problem arises. And one more thing. Chrysostom says uh, to the man, well, you say to me, he's talking to the man, you say to me, what if she abuses me? What if she disrespects me? And he says something to the effect of, 
Okay, never mind. Do your duty. Love her as Christ loves the church. And Christ did not uh, seek to dominate the bride, but sub- you know, to sacrifice himself to to bring her over. Okay. So I just think that I I want. Is there a difference between submit and obey? People are now. This is where the comments or have gone. Obey. Is there a difference between wives submit and wives obey? Submission is anything I has anything I've said right now caused you to think, oh, he's off. That's wrong. I disagree with no. that. Yeah. No, my. So here's we'll the get funny to thing. Submit, obey, and say, yeah. Think about your relationship practically with your wife. Mm-hmm. Everything with my wife. This is a conversation I have with this woman. There's there's only been one time in my entire relationship, maybe two, where me and my wife were at such loggerheads that I said, "No, this yeah. is what it has to be." That's one was when um, my wife was going out of town for the first time. She handed me a list of things to do for the kids, mm-hmm. and I took that list and I set it down. Number one, she makes lists, and that's beautiful. And I don't. And I said, "I'm their father. I know how to love them." And I put that down. And she said that was the most healing moment. Oh. One of the most healing moments in her maternity. Mm. Right. The other was when I said, we're going to my parents' house because this guy's going to freaking kill me <laughs> with the next door neighbor. Right. Yeah. And she's like, I don't want to go. No. But what she didn't know was the my, my neighbor, the wife, had said to me, he's not allowed to come by. And uh, seven times he drove by. Mm. And every time I heard a diesel truck, because I was the truck he drove, I heard a diesel I went, like, I'm, like, freaking out. So I told my wife, I was like, I need to get out of here with my kids to make sure he doesn't kill us all. Mm. And she's, she's like, no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Blah, blah, blah. Then we go to my parents' house, and my parents made it awful because the bed that two of my kids were going to sleep on had a pee stain. Whoopsie. My nephew <laughs> slept there and didn't tell anyone. And then it was, like, broken glass. It was awful. And my wife is like, see? But here's the deal. I slept that night. And they all slept that night, and no one was going to hurt my family, my mm-hmm. wife, my kids, me, right. anyone. Yeah. So the my, point is, you, yeah, rarely come to loggerheads when yeah, you've had to. Very do that, rarely, yeah. because I love her mm-hmm. as Christ loves the church. Yeah. There's not a single person on the uh, in this world. I think of all my best friends that I love. I don't love them the way that I love my wife. Mm-hmm. I mean, Shannon is, I remember when I broke up with Shannon and I, <laughs> I was thinking like, that was the dumbest thing I could have ever done before we got married. And I was like, she's perfect in every way for me. And I just, I, I yeah, there is nothing, there is nothing that I would ever do to interrupt <laughs> that. And she knows that. So her submission to me is because I love her. Her, the, this woman who was talking to me, her experience prior was her father wanted to dominate her mother. Yeah. And that that's a totally different worldview. Absolutely. I agree with you, of course. I think that... Uh, I think what happens is when you think of these, ex- not just extremes, maybe they're yeah. less extreme than I think, maybe they're more uh, numerous than I imagine. Um, we don't want that to then overshadow what's clearly taught in Scripture. And that's yeah. true of anything. Um like give to the poor. This give to anyone who begs of you, and then you can come up with a hundred reasons as to why this person might be using his money for this or that. It's like, yeah, but the scripture says this. So what am I going to do when this homeless person on Fourth Street here in Steubenville asks me for money? Am I going to rationalize that or say that I now know more or that I'm not now, you know? What do you do in there? What do, what I, do you do? What do I do? Yeah, or what should the guy I do? On Fourth Street. What do you do? Well, I'll give you one example. I just had a fellow the other day offer to sell me his sunglasses. I don't know if you've met this guy. Apparently, he's done this to multiple people. They're not good sunglasses. <laughs> Is it, uh, uh, gas station sunglasses. Give me, give me a description. Uh, balding, gray hair, somewhat tanned, surprisingly tanned. I think. Very skinny, older. <laughs> older, yep, skinny. And he, He's anyway. offered to sell me paintings before. Really? Did you buy them? That's not Gary, is it? Gary's the guy who no, always Gary's wants money. No, Gary's the painting f- guy. Okay. Yeah, sorry. But I offered to buy him a meal. I said, no, I don't want to buy you glasses, but no. I can I get you a meal. He's like, ah, no, that's okay. Like, All right, well. Because he doesn't want a meal. Yeah. So if, if I gave you money and said, hey, can I buy you drugs? <clears throat> that's horrible. I would yeah. never do that. So the idea, the, the thing that people need the most who are homeless is you. Your love, your presence. Mm-hmm. Right? So when they ask you for money, what they really need is you. Amen. I want to get back to the the wife submit thing again, just just real briefly, um, because I, I I I share your concern that 
saying something like that could lead an either an immature or a lustful man to yeah. abuse his wife, either emotionally or physically, yeah. which is disgusting and yeah. ought to be condemned fully. Yeah. 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 So I share that concern. Right. I share that concern as we all seek to try to. Okay, because it's like, it, I, I've used this example a bunch. This should be on the Pints with Aquinas bingo card. Once upon a time, I was in Houston. My wife was chatting with friends. I sat out the front and I was talking to a guy. And we chatted for about half an hour. And I gradually realized that he was completely pissed drunk. And that then caused me to rethink all the things yeah. he had said up yeah. until the time I realized he was drunk. And I find myself in a society that I finally have woken up to is yeah. like pissed drunk, has no idea what it's talking about, doesn't understand marriage, women, men, sex, right. God, any of it. And now I'm like, oh, God, then what thoughts and what ideas have I imbibed over the last 30 years that I now need to throw out? Um, so I think as we collectively as Christians try to get back to what the scriptures and the church fathers and the saints have said about the beautiful sacrament of marriage and the goodness of women and men, that there's going to be some awkwardness in that because we're going to try to maybe grasp things that we're wrong about, but we're yeah. very passionate about because everything else is chaotic and insane. But uh, yeah. So, okay. Proverbs 31, right? Which is uh, right. the only I know what you're saying, but let me look at the Bible so I have it in front of written me. by a woman written by the queen mother what makes a good wife real quickly someone just say go oh, to luke what happened that was me luke's in the comments i love luke, luke, luke just said <gasps> you're luke yeah what do you say when i my earlier luke. said don't that ever I, say oh, that. i got my canasta glasses on <laughs> I, what did earlier luke say? when i said luke's here i'm gonna tell him to go away yeah. that's what i was talking about yeah, yeah don't no, say either. that to luke luke like me has a sensitive heart and cannot bear go away man um oh. go away, man. so he said I'm not sure it's the modern craziness over gender that distorts and makes Ephesians 5 hard. I think it's how techne distorts it. Luke Which with is his techne. genius. Luke well, well That's played. amazing. No, okay, let's look at the techne, okay? Honestly, let's take 30 seconds to look and at the techne. And power, which is true, actually. And power. Before you do power, let me say, the way people view submission is distorted by the way people view government. Yeah. And the way the church has historically yeah, taught. Goes, what is he, a freaking libertarian? No, absolutely. That's <laughs> an insult. Kidding. I'm just kidding. Clearly, libertarianism is a far left <laughs> ideology. Uh, uh, You've been going for over four hours. Yeah, by the way. Four ish. Um, <laughs> um, the way people view submission is distorted by the way people view government and uh -huh. the, the government the church is historically. The way people view power. The way people view yeah. power and submission is distorted by the way the government they live in. And all of the governments we live in today. Are liberal in the way that is very much condemned in Quadragesimo Anno. Quadragesimo Anno. So, so let me say this about techne Go women. Ahead. Explain what is meant by that. As you techne meaning technology, um, practice, technique. You know all of those things that um, interrupt meaning for the sake of efficiency. Okay, here's the, here's the uniqueness, Matt. I want your eyes on me. <gasps> no, I want the glasses Submit. on you. I want the glasses on because you're so handsome. Uh, when women can compete with men outside the factory in the corporate office, mm. um, with power tools in the trades, right? So we've effectively doubled the, um, work, w the workforce. We've effectively doubled by adding women. Um, what happens to the male female relationship when women are more in college mm -hmm. and more in corporate positions. Mm -hmm. So yes, the techne has... What is meant by techne? Techne is a a te technological reality. Yeah. Okay. So uh, efficiency, you know, all, all the revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, ju just take that. Corporatization. All right. So a woman can be a lawyer every bit as much as a man. Mm -hmm. you, you don't need... Your balls to <laughs> to be a lawyer. Yeah, you don't need balls to be a, a, a CEO or anything like that. And so you have this this prominence within feminism of emphasizing, and this is what I got in trouble for. I was overemphasizing the corporate white collar work over the blue collar work, and that's what my, a friend of mine, fan of the show, uh, Rebecca, was saying. Hey, women are also being called on and need parity with the construction and and trades and stuff, but. Think about that, like women entering the workforce en masse. 
and how women earning the same as men, mm-hmm. how that affects the dynamic. A hundred percent, yes. Yeah. Of course. So, but but the, the thing is, when you look at Proverbs 31. That's what I wanted to go you to. Open your, yeah. Yeah. And this <clears throat> is what I responded to Timothy Gordon and his wife about maybe three years ago, <laughs> which is, oh, look, Proverbs 31 describes a woman at work <clears throat> Who sells stuff in the marketplace? What's the verse? Thirty-one. Proverbs, no, the whole Proverbs okay. thirty-one, because I don't know the verse. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's written by the Queen Mother. All right, and it's this is the you know, the women of proven worth, right? Uh, maybe s- skip down to verse twenty. <laughs> she opens her arms to the poor. That's not what keep you going. Wanted. No, keep going. But like, she... it's, it's the vibe of the thing. It's the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, like and extends feeling. her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household. For all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. You didn't mean twenty. Her husband is respected at the uh, city gate. Ah, uh, there's a lot of stuff there. You know what? No, she talks about like she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. What verse is that? That's twenty four. Yeah, and then it goes all. She many of the lo- women are proven worth, but you have excelled them all. all right, what's the problem? How is that? But here's the deal. Anyway, what, what is the woman doing? She's working in the home mm. and she's selling her goods in the marketplace. Okay. The vast majority of the human race, until the Industrial Revolution, were farmers right. or merchants right. who, whose home was above the shop. Yeah. And their whole family was involved in the work of the farm or the, or the mercantile operation. Right? And this is the thing. Even in ancient times, the woman, like, have you ever heard of a spinster, mm-hmm. the, the unmarried? Well, they literally spun. Yeah. They took the cloth from the, 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 the sheep, the sheared sheep, and they made different garments because garments mm-hmm. were very expensive. And here she is spinning these garments, making this homespun, selling it in the marketplace, blah, blah, blah. The question becomes, what is the role of the woman? What is the role of the man in the marketplace? And post-Industrial Revolution, that answer was men only. Because with the Industrial Revolution, it was men leaving their homes, Mm. journeying 5, 10, 15 miles to the factory and producing arduous goods, right? uh, Human capital intensive labor to produce these goods. And the women were at home managing the kids. That became the paradigm of uh, what we call traditional family. But before, like a farm, women, children, and husband right. all work the farm. Right. When you had, like, have you ever been to a CC? Yeah. But a long time ago, 2000. So right, I right. remember yeah. anything you're about to Mine's say. Mine's 2004. Right. Nice. But you remember walking through the streets, mm-hmm. there's the shops, and then above it is oh, yeah. where the family lives. Yeah. That's all medieval villages. Yeah. That, that's, you can trace that from Assisi to Beijing to Mesoamerica. Of course, before whenever, the automobile. Yeah. Wherever there's a urban environment, mm-hmm. there's there's two classifications. Suburban is a modern invention of the automobile. There's urban mm-hmm. and there's rural. Rural is the farm, which 98% of all human beings were a part of. 2% were part of urban. Urban was shop down bottom, family up top. The entire family was involved in the production of what was sold down bottom, right, in the shop right. area. The entire family was involved in the farm. You think women didn't milk cows or plow fields? or, or yes, d- no, Of course. Like, yeah. But who's saying they didn't? Like, right, who- but that's the problem when you say women aren't allowed to be in the workplace. You must have a, a, a man in the workplace and a woman who's at home. The man's workplace was the home right. for literally thousands of years until 1850. Right. So Hold for on. Timothy Gordon to absolutize the 1850s, 1890s, 1920s home but is you, an absurdity. All right, can, well, can we? Can we? Can I ask if there's a difference? It sounds like you're saying there's a difference in degree, and I'm not sure. It might be a difference in in, in quality, in kind. Sorry, I think it might be a difference in kind, honestly, because she's participating in his work, right? 
Like they're participating in work together. Well, 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 what do you not, think is happening when a like woman a, milks a cow at six o'clock in the morning and she's like, "Well, thank God my husband warmed up the teats." Like <laughs> she's they're all but they're, they're in the, warmed they're up the teats. You better put in that the, in the in the, <laughs> the individual link. They're they're cooperating yes, in they're the same cooperating work because the, the man's work. place is in the home. In the same yeah, the father's place is in the home too. Until right? the industrial revolution, where the Which, factory was man's right, place, and then you have structures of sin and John Paul II and Sent Testament. No, 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 no. But then you have corporations and structures of sin and John Paul II and right, right, but you have <laughs> so where do most men work downtown we live in the suburbs we commute downtown well then then post World War II or during World War II and then afterwards Rosie the Riveter and all that women started participating in the workforce women have always participated in the workforce it was different in modality because now we have a hyper factory oriented or corporate oriented system but prior to that, like when, when people say women shouldn't work, they, they, they yoke to the home and they should only take care of kids. They've never only taken care of kids in a traditional home. Okay. Honest Why am I yelling at you, Matt? I love you. I want to kiss your forehead. <laughs> honest question, though, but is anybody saying those things That's exactly that you're what saying? Timothy Corden is saying. I tweeted that at him. He, he I don't know is if not he would that say extreme. that. I don't know if he's that extreme currently. I have heard him say things that... Doesn't his wife help him were, run the podcast? That's work. Yeah. I don't, so she's I, on the show. How dare she? So I don't think he would say that. I don't know if he would say it that extreme. I, I think, think what, if, he, if he thinks that, I love that some of the things... He, <laughs> I think that if he doesn't understand that some of the things he said could be interpreted in that way, yeah. he's being purpose. He's being willfully naive, maybe. I don't want to say willfully because that in, implies culpability. I think it's naive of him. If what you just said isn't, if he doesn't acknowledge that what you just said is how people hear him sometimes, I think that's a little naive of him. Thursday, are we that. fighting right now? <laughs> no, I'm I'm trying to agree with you without making Tim mad because I learned the hard way recently that whatever I say on the show, whoever I say it about, gets a message of me saying it. Oh, you think? Yeah, I, well, had, let me to just say I this. had to apologize Women to Enoch right to personally. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? Do I you don't th think. T I don't know yeah. much about Tim. No, I don't he's watch so his channel, handsome. But I, right? I don't think he would disagree with anything you just said. So, but, but, uh, but maybe my I'm wrong. response maybe would. originally was to him and his wife. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is like three years ago when they started publishing their <laughs> book. Uh huh. Their book. <laughs> the book. Which apparently his wife published. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it was not at saying that time. Any, they published. No. There was a book. There was that, a book that was published. Okay. <laughs> what, I don't know what book was it. There was <laughs> allegations, but no, I'm not no, addressing no, 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 no. the allegations. I will tell you later. Okay. I, his for legal. brother wrote the book. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Please don't sue us, Tim. <laughs> yeah. No, I, but that's what I'm saying. Is there was this f uh, fervor at the don't time? Don't know anything about. Yeah. I will tell you later. There was a book. All right. <laughs> You're so beautiful and naive. <laughs> no, <laughs> but here's my deal. There's so many people doing so many things. There are so many controversies. All that matters I can't is keep up. And this goes back to your original question. Why are Catholics so divided? <laughs> <laughs> That's how we began the show. Yeah. Catholic Republic. Do you want to wrap up that thought or should we? You know what? Here's the thought. <laughs> I don't, I do know that there are women who desire to work. And that might be because of our modern world and its impositions on women and their formation. I know many women who love their children, love their families and desire to work still. And I don't think now my family's not that way. My wife desired to be at home with the kids. So my problem becomes when we absolutize one over the other, but I do think one is better than the other. Well, and I, what's the better? The better is the wife at home with the kids. Mm. Because this husband would be a piece of shit with his kids, <laughs> and they need the nurture rather than the asshole. Dear Lord, <laughs> help us. <laughs> um, is Luke still in the comments? Yeah, he's still here. I just want to say, Luke, you're Luke, one of my favorite people. I don't he's know so Luke that well. You like Luke more than me. You say that. You no, can say that. No, that's not true at all. It's kind of true. No, it's not true. I'm not lying. It's not true. It's just that I feel like whenever Luke speaks, I'm like, ah, oh, I get that. Yeah. Like, I feel yeah. more. Yeah. Whenever Luke speaks, I don't get it. Yeah. Whenever I edit the podcast, I'm like, shit, he's kind of right. Yeah. Shit. I, I don't know what emotional intelligence means, and it might be completely BS, but like, 
if it means anything, I think Luke has it because yeah. Luke oh, is incredibly 100%. insightful 100%. and intelligent, but doesn't necessarily speak and think in the way you do. I, I had a friend who said Luke <laughs> is the most intuitive man I've ever met. He gropes in the darkness <laughs> and finds the truth more than and gropes other people. And I just hope I'm one of them. But Luke gropes in the darkness and finds the <laughs> truth intuitively. Other people, and I hope not. <laughs> Are we still on Locals? Hi, Locals! (laughs) No, we are live to everyone. Oh, this is also YouTube. I hope my wife is still watching. Hi, Shannon. Uh, Can I... Did you ever tell our fans what's happening at my house? No, go for it. We had... (laughs) You had a Is this how your neighbors are going to find out? More intense than a hurricane, we had winds that hit my house (laughs) within the span of 10 minutes. And took down the biggest tree, which was five stories tall. <laughs> the biggest tree in my backyard. Why am I laughing? I'm sorry. That's terrible. Because you're a monster. <laughs> and it fell on my elderly neighbor's house. Do you feel like a piece of shit now? <laughs> who fixed their roof two weeks ago. Whose oh, husband no. died. Whose husband died a month ago. Oh. And it cru- And my wife, I'd, we, I didn't know until I was on the plane today. It crushed half of their house. Hmm. My tree. This isn't the same woman who's... Ex-husband tried to kill her, is it? No, totally different. Yes. I moved out of that neighborhood. Oh, did you? Closer You're to not presentation. That same place no, where I used to visit. April, you. Uh, Don't tell Holy, people where you live. He wasn't going Thur- to. I'm not. I'm not. Holy Thursday of last year. That's what we'll call him when he's a saint. 2022. <laughs> I moved closer to the, in the middle of between presentation and Saint Anthony's. Okay. And now I'm an ordinary boy. Oh, so you're closer to Houston. You're in Houston. No. Uh, in oh, Walsingham sorry. was the first church. No, you, <laughs> you know, okay. you Be weren't following along. <laughs> Walsingham was the first church, but then they opened a second church up in the Woodlands area. Okay. You still Montgomery. love the Woodlands? Yeah. So how does someone like you who hates the suburbs so much, sees what's desperately wrong with how they're all laid out, etc., remain there? Because I invite people to my home. Because that's where the majority of human flesh is. I invite them to my home. Do they I come? love them. Yeah. Do they come? Uh, yeah. Here, here's the deal. The suburbs are alienating because they are no longer dense enough for human beings to interact. And so I find all, thanks be to God for the parish, I find them at the parish mm-hmm. and I invite them to my house. I'm telling you, every Roman Catholic who takes their faith seriously needs to start inviting people to their home. We, hey, dude, we do that. I know. Stoobs. I know. Stooby boobs, as I like to call it. Yeah. Stooby, oh. stooby boobs. Dude. <laughs> Wrong too. Still oh. do it. Beautiful. All right, come on, Thursdays. You just got one more here. Please don't. No, I don't know, dude. I, don't know. I love you, which is why I think. <laughs> I don't care what it is. It's empty. It just needs to be liquid. It's just liquid. Bob Levznevsky built this table he for did. you. You want someone to? Yeah. Okay. But the table is buckling. Can I tell you why? Yeah, why? Because yeah, right here, got in this, the woodwork a while ago. Yeah, uh, wrote a book uh, on it. Still in. Uh, this is called the breadboard. Okay, that's called the breadboard. Okay, the uh, horizontal pieces that uh, butt up. There's humidity that mm-hmm. affects organic material, and that and these areas of dips and 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 bumps are because he didn't create a place for expansion. Because Bob's fault. I think he did Bob's some of it on purpose. No, Bob's a monster. <laughs> no, he did something. He made it look rough on purpose, but that he obviously wouldn't want to happen. Next question. <laughs> I don't built, know if there's any more questions. If you want to see I another cool Phil. podcast table, I built the podcast table, the new quality podcast on actually. You did? Yeah. Have did you, you put that an table? expansion board? Yeah, it's got a it's a it's it's a black walnut. Hey, do you feel like Thursday is trying to take over Pints of the Quinas? Catching Fox has just said, do not engage him about woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> I did a, it was black walnut from Rough Sawn Boards, and I uh, glued them up. I do think so, yeah. And then I put cherry on the ends. Cherry? Yeah. Not black walnut? No, it's a nice accent. It's offensive. Piece. It's offensive. Moses would be so pissed that you mixed lumber. Well, my friends, this has been just a delight, Goma. It's nice. You know what's nice? It's nice to have conversations that are actually conversations. Hey, were you sad yeah. that I didn't preach anything? How good is that? How good is that face? <laughs> oh, my God. Long? You are so handsome. Yeah. Do you understand how handsome you are? I don't. My you wife should. keeps trying to tell me you every should. morning. You should. Um, Gosh. You imagine so waking up next to Matt Brad. <laughs> <laughs> so she saw a letter out of the closet. <laughs> you know? Say it again. Mean it this time. And then <laughs> Say I'll, it with feeling. I'll let her out. Oh, Bless your heart. But no, this has been fun. This is hey, a can I ask you, when are you going to talk about Aquinas again? 
Um, come on. I don't know if I will. Can, can you tell uh, your audience when who was the person you talked to? Oh, let's do it. Let's who do was it the person right you now. talked to? This is how when you started, were at Holy everybody. Apostles. <laughs> And you said, how do I start a podcast? Who did you call? Let's do that again. Because I love it. It's a great way. It's like, if if uh, if you want to, sp- if I'm interrupting you and you want me to listen to you, you just, the words go louder. What? So, so ask me that again. I'll interrupt and you go louder. Ready? <laughs> Matt, let me ask you a question. Oh, yeah. I know Matt, you Matt, you don't understand. <laughs> exactly like that. What is the question? <laughs> when did you decide to start Pints of the Quinas and who did you call? I was inspired by catching foxes. 100%. You... 100%. Were you really? I think so. No, Look, I know at, so. When I started Pints with Aquinas, there was I could probably name five Catholic podcasts. Maybe not even Let's that. Let's go. Here we go. Catching foxes. Okay. Yeah, that's it. No. Yeah. Uh, Catholic stuff you should know. Ooh. Mark Hart's Sunday, Sunday, Sunday podcast. That was so good. Right? He's so good. He's so He's handsome. He's so good. But I don't know what he, else I could talk about. What else? Three. Catholic answer stuff? Yeah. Was that a podcast Cy? at the time? What is Cy's last Cy name? Cy it? Was Cy? It, that was Patrick Coffin when hey, you would have started. Really, no, no, don't don't yeah. mention him. Cy <laughs> is the nicest person on the face of the He's earth. He's probably fine. But okay, so those are the three that I could think of. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to do a podcast. So I called you. You did. And I said, what equipment do I need? You take over the conversation. And now. it's St. Louis at my wife's <laughs> parents' house <laughs> in the middle of snow on the ground. I paced for 30 minutes outside <laughs> on their driveway. Okay. Now, I know the Heil PR40 is really good, but it's yeah, expensive. True. But you know what? Maybe you should start with that. And you're like, I don't know, but maybe the show, mate. And I was like, okay, but the, I use the shore beta and we talked through the whole thing and then in one month in one month you had earned more than catching foxes had ever that's done. not true oh yes because pints of the quinus resonated with human persons uh, did i tell you I, I called my friend todd i was trying to think of a name i've told you this already yep. i'm like what name should i think of i'm thinking something about aquinas I want to cut because he's got so much, you know, you can always draw from him. And he said, what about the Aquinas return? Like it was a really good idea. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's just like in tennis. You hit a ball to him and Aquinas returns it. So I hung up on him and I've never spoken to him since. (laughs) It's the worst (laughs) name I've ever thought of. I went to his house and I beat him up in the middle of the night. But what I've always liked is that Latin phrase in vino veritas, where there is wine, there is truth. Yeah. Drunkenness, clearly a sin. But chatting with people at pubs. Who want to tell you, who want to ask you, why doesn't my daughter talk to me anymore? Or what should I do with my life? Or why, why does my wife hate read me? Read the Summa. And then you That's just, but then you get in. So the idea originally was just to bring the, uh, yeah. there's no way people are still watching this show. People are watching. There's no, okay, here's people a true watching. question. And don't lie, because lying is a sin. Is there anybody watching this right now who has watched from the beginning? I don't think that's possible. Haley. Haley, that, does that woman have a life? Haley, I don't know if you Jesus, have a life. Is she at home locked in a closet? <laughs> she has Wi-Fi in the closet. <laughs> There's bless her. He forgot to take her phone away before he put her in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta stop joking about this. Don't do it. It's wrong. Um, but yeah, I'm so grateful for you doing that for helping me with that. That was such a fun time, eh? Hey, 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 bro. <laughs> Will you talk an American accent for me? Hey, bro. Yeah, pints of the. But what was funny is I was working doing anti porn. Just the question. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk an American accent. I heard him, and I'm not going to do it. Um, this is what I have to deal with. <laughs> is it, I'm, a, I'm an elite podcaster. And this is what I have to deal with. You ready for this? Yeah, though. No. I help him start up this multi million dollar empire. He made more money in three months on Patreon than I had made in all of Catching Fox <laughs> because he fulfilled what the patrons actually asked, and Speaking I never did. Speaking of that. We're about to buy a building. I Thursday you know was telling me you're buying a building. Buying a building. And we're gonna create some studio spaces. Are you gonna and, move this over there? Yeah, we're gonna have to. I can't keep paying for this and buy a friggin' building. I know you don't want all the poop in the uh, <laughs> stalls for the, all the female guests. It's very important. <laughs> it's very pe- f- uh, this is what I know about women. I don't know much, but this is what I know. <laughs> Women hate <laughs> men's poop in their toilets floating like I saw today. It's it's shameful. It's gregarious. And you need to buy an entire building in order to make it happen. I'm crying. We actually should have a female toilet. We sh- we, you or I never go into Thursday. I was joking. It's such a lavish building. 
And even though I hire other people around the country, Thursday is the only one who lives here. And so we joked about turning this whole section into like a Google type space. So he comes in in the morning, breakfast is served. He's got like Fruit Loop stands and hot bean bags. It's just a cornhole board and like like foosball and everything. There's nobody else for me to play with because I'm the only one who works. Because you're all alone. Because you're all alone. It's just somebody walks in and they feel like fights is this huge operation. Where does your assistant live? She lives in Arizona. She's, she's not an best. assistant. She's, she's a amazing. business manager. She is not, dude. She's the manager. She runs this show. I yeah, we work, she's for, amazing. we work for we her. We absolutely. Melanie? No, she's unreal. Melanie? Yeah, we work for Melanie. She's a oh. good person. All right, this has been Pints with Aquinas. Dude, it's four hours and 29 minutes. You can go we to Pints with well Aquinas, www.pintsofaquinas.org. Can can go. You can go. Just put it on whatever, both of us, while you pee. Just mind the nuggets. You're not hungry. Have you heard any good jokes lately? Yes. Knock, knock. Who's there? I'm like, wait, wait, no, I screwed up already. <laughs> <laughs> you screwed that up. No, 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 here we go. Hey. Hey. Hey, Matt. Hey. Oh, shit. I'm forgetting it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> did you hear what happened? Did you hear what happened to the cross-eyed circumcision? Oh, did he stop it? To the cross-eyed circumciser. Oh my god! Did you hear what happened to the cross-eyed circumciser? I don't know. He got sacked. <laughs> <laughs> you know why you should love that? Have you ever heard of, oh gosh, what is it called? All the Chocolates? Love the Chocolates? No. There's an Australian YouTube channel mm -hmm. where they do nothing but dad jokes. Oh really? Yeah, and it is hysterical, wildly inappropriate, but that's where I heard that. Oh, I gotta hear that. Australian jokes are great. Did you hear that did that Jew joke I told Dennis Prager? I did. That was a good joke. It was a good joke. Can I tell offensive? you the Jerry Seinfeld Jew joke? Yes, I know it, it but tell one it to of me the anyway. great. You know it? I think I do because I've heard him tell the joke and On then Norm Macdonald. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then say to the the guy who should have known because yeah, he was also yeah, a Jew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. He said, uh, so a uh, Gentile uh, goes up to the Jew and he or two Gentiles talking. And he said, "How's your business?" He goes, "Oh, it's going well." It's going well. That's it. And that's it. Because if two Jews had it, they'd be like, oh, my God, it's not going well. Everything's falling apart. Yeah, that's the joke. All right, that's the joke. I got two Jew jokes to tell you. But oh my before gosh. I tell you, we're going to cut the stream. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Who God you bless to? you. That Please one? subscribe. Please like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> Please follow Catching Foxes. Go check oh, no, them out. Every new Shabao. No, forget that Luke's not a part of that. He's not. Thank no. God. Dave Van Vickle is. <laughs> you should totally have on your show. I'd love to get to know him. Everyone I know who knows him says he's remarkable. He's the most incredible. Uh, honestly, Dave Van Vickle. Real is talk. The most, real talk. Real talk. He's the most incredible man I've ever met in my life. Wow. Most incredible man, including you, you yeah. piece of shit. He's the most incredible <laughs> man I've ever met in my life. It, exception of Thursday. Except on Fridays. Most incredible man. Yeah. He evangelizes. Like, uh, he couldn't breathe without speaking Christ and his holy name. Praise God. Last question. Have you seen the new Flash? I have not. Do you want to? I do. What are you doing I'm tomorrow at 3.40? <gasps> Three, can you do it earlier? I can't. I've already booked Damn it. I got the Sumo <laughs> Youth Conference at 3.30. Ah. I will absolutely come. What excuse could you give that hey, you think Hey, I'm dying accept? of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead. Please let me. <laughs> Dude, did you hear about the um, that submarine thing? Was wild. Oh huh? my gosh! Praying for those people. No, they're dead. No they're need. dead. Yeah, I thought they had forty eight hours. Yeah, but then they found the they found the ruins. Huh? Oh. The U.S. Navy detected. Uh, let's see, detected the moment when the Titan sub submersible imploded. Submersible. Thank you. That's what do you call it? Submissible? Submissible. The sub-disciple. I'm not going to lie. That wasn't a screw-up. I've actually been saying it that way all day. <laughs> so I want to thank you for correcting me. I'm here with the you. The submersible imploded oh, earlier this week after it lost communication with its host ship. The Wall Street Journal reported that the Navy immediately began listening to the Titan once it learned that it had gone dark. The Navy detected an implosion a short time later near where officials later discovered debris on the ocean floor about 1,600 <laughs> feet from the bow of the Titanic. That's terrible. That is terrible. Did you hear the quote from the guy who put it out about diversity? What are you talking about? The guy diversity? who put out the Titan thing. 
About diversity? Yes. Why does everything have to be political? When I started on? the business, one of the things you'll find, there are other sub-operators out there, but they typically have uh, gentlemen who are ex-military submariners, and they you'll see a whole bunch of 50-year-old white guys. Oh, wow. I wanted our team to be younger, to be inspirational. I'm not going to inspire a 16-year-old to go pursue marine technology, but a 25-year-old uh, you know, who's a sub-pilot or a platform operator or one of our techs can be inspirational. So he purposefully did not hire ex-military experienced really? people now to you be you want to bring back those 50-year-old white dudes, I think, to make the next one. Although I don't know how many people are going to be paying $250,000 to go look at the wreck of the Titanic at this point. If I win the lottery... No. no. <laughs> Can I pray? Can Let's I close? Let's close in a prayer. A prayer. How about you close with your best weird Anglican prayer, <gasps> and then I'll close with my best weird Orthodox prayer. What if they're the same? Did you know? Then did you know the church that the Serum liturgy is uh, overwhelmingly informed by John Chrysostom? Praise the Lord. Go for it. I believe, O Lord, and I confess that Thou art. Truly, Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the first. I believe also that this is thine own immaculate body, and that this thine own precious blood. Therefore, I pray thee, have mercy upon me. Mm. Forgive my offenses, both voluntary and involuntary, of word and of deed, committed in knowledge or in ignorance. And make me worthy to partake without condemnation of thine immaculate mysteries under the forgiveness of my sins and life everlasting. Amen. Of thy mystical supper. This is, this is the most powerful this, part right before I receive Holy Communion. This is what we pray in the East. Every single Byzantine liturgy prays this prayer before we go up and receive. Of, my, of thy mystical supper, O Son of God, accept me today as a communicant. For I will not speak of thy mystery to thine enemies, n neither, like Judas, will I give thee a kiss. Mm. But like the thief, I, I will confess thee. You. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. Amen. Every Sunday, every day, you, when I go to the yeah. the ordinariate, that's the prayer prayer. So I'm not trying to impress you or one-up you, but do you know that in the Byzantine liturgy, yeah. every single time, yeah, that's what we pray? Well? Yeah, because wow. this is, uh, so much of the Serum liturgy is informed by the Augustinian tradition and which is informed by the Eastern tradition. Mm. Well, let's see what we got here. A little prayer here. Um, just a prayer to give yourself to Jesus Christ. So I would like to invite anybody who has not yet ever done that in their life who's watching right now, or those of you who have to do it with me again. Open, O oh doors and bolts of my heart that Christ, the King of glory may enter, enter, O oh my light and enlighten my darkness. Enter, O my life, and resurrect my deadness. Enter, O my physician, and heal my wounds. Enter, O divine fire, and burn up the thorns of my sins. Ignite my inward parts and my heart with the flame of your love. Enter, O my king, and destroy in me the kingdom of sin. Sit on the throne of my heart and alone reign in me. O you, my king and lord, amen. And then I think to bring this all together, let's just Pray to our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the yes. Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise God.